Welcome everyone to this symposium, Multiple Futures for Art and Technology. Um, I'm Charles Merriweather and uh, speaking on behalf of the Osage Art Foundation uh, who organized uh, this symposium. Um, and uh, I am the general moderator uh, for the morning, se uh, two sessions of the morning. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Yukui, uh, who will um, introduce the, the, the morning session. Thank you very much for coming and welcome. Right, um, so, so uh, good morning everyone. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, for coming. I was a little bit to answer the message. I think I can not put it mask a little bit in order to make it more audible. Uh, right, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an introduction of for the whole day uh, because uh, um, I think this is important to, to frame uh, um, uh, the symposium and also try to unfold the questions that we want to, to ask in this symposium. So yeah, so thank you again for coming to this event organized by the Osage Foundation. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the symposium this morning. Um, this symposium originated from Edna's Lin, who everyone knows, idea to introduce philosophy to the already ambitious program of Hong Kong Act and make it into Hong Kong Pact, uh, that, uh, which is not, sh not shown. But she also has a more, even more ambi amb um, ambitious project is to uh, develop a Hong Kong Pact with an S at the end, adding signs. Um, but also her affection for Asia, which prompts her to ask what might be the contribution of non-Western thought to the thinking of arts and technology. Uh, thus, when, when she asked me for the title of the symposium, I suggested multiple futures of art and technology, which she kindly adopted. And according to her, it is also the first Hong Kong act uh, which has a title. Um, Ernest, as we all know, is an important figure behind the art tech scenes in Hong Kong. Her vision of arts and technology is illuminating as it is self-evident in the various projects that she has initiated and realized and most of us have participated. It is also reflected in the aims of the symposium and her efforts to bring together speakers with diverse geographical cultural backgrounds uh, not only through intellectual insights, but also with amicability and hospitality. So thank you, Ernest, for uh, all this effort. So what consists in this quest for multiple futures of arts and technology? Didn't the current discourse on arts and technology already present us a future, one that we can see in the immersive, the immersive technologies of AR and VR, and choirs consisting of AIs and robots. Of what multiple futures we ask for if the future is not already announced in the policy address of the government and its funding schemes? Or maybe we should first go to the two terms arts and technology as we know that both share the same roots in Greek, namely techne. And that technology became a thematic question for us since the end of the 19th century after the appearance of photography and cinema, especially among the artists of the avant-garde. Um, and uh, I noticed that uh, there was um, on, on, on Facebook that uh, our friend Maurice uh, Benayoun has replied to, uh, to, uh, to uh, um, a post of Edna's by saying that Edna's has started the, the new avant-garde in Hong Kong. So uh, I think it's also important for us to go back to the theme of the avant-garde in order to uh, it might be productive to go back to the question of the avant-garde to evaluate the current situation uh, and vice versa. Uh, of course, we are talking about here about uh, Bauhaus, but as well as uh, the, um, 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 uh, the Futimas in, in, in the, US, in the uh, Soviet Union. And I would like to single out a statement of the Russian painter um, Kasimir Malevich. Uh, towards the end of his uh, introduction to the theory of the additional elements in painting, Malevich addressed the question of technology and its relation to the art. Written in 1909 by Avant-Garde, he refers to Futurism and Cubism, 
which could be read as a product due to the technological acceleration. If supermatism was possible, it is because it's technological, because it attempts to incorporate technology, as Malevich said, I quote, I called the additional elements of supermatism the supermatist straight line, dynamic in character. The, envi the environment corresponding to this new culture has been produced by the latest achievements of technologies, and especially of aviation, so that one could also refer to su supermatism as aeronautical." And unquote. However, we know that this supermatist straight line is not purely technological, because for Malevich, the technological activity as a form of creativity only possesses a relative transitory value, while it is only in us that one finds the absolute and lasting value. Us aims to respond to, but at the same time, turning the contingency of technology into something enduring and absolute. Us was in the trifurcated uh, crossroad in the beginning of the 20th century, according to the observation of Malevich. So Jesus was talking about three paths. What are these three paths? One path is to go back to the countryside, just like Cezanne has done. By going back to Ethel Provence, where he, we know, he painted the famous Montanus uh, Saint Victoire. This path of returning to countryside belongs to a nostalgia of nature. The other path goes into the heart of the city, and it is driven by the technological transformation of the city, like futurism emerged by opposing itself to traditions and rituals. There is also a third path, which is, he called, the degeneration to industrial art or applied art. Malevich uses the word degenerate with full negative meaning on which he declares, I quote, there is no place for painting and architecture in the utilitarian productions of industry. It is only through a misunderstanding that applied art, the job of which is to create useful forms, could have come into existence, end of quote. Now, even though a hundred years later, the urban and rural difference is no longer the most urgent geographical problem, but rather that of the planetary. We are in the planetary condition. But still we ask ourselves, it's a Malavich question that shares with many others of his generation couldn't be transposed to our time because we are confronting a similar situation, a repetition with a new historical context. We have heard a lot about the avocation of returning to nature or returning to a primordial multi-species relations, like in the discourse of Donna Haraway. Uh, it is it's a primordial because all species entangle with each other. We also have the proposal of converging or industries via te uh, digital technologies because digital becomes the general condition of the survival of the individuals enterprises and the nation state. It calls for accelerating technology to overcome all the obst obstacles, to transcend all ideologies in order to arrive at a technological singularity, like what, uh, what Marinetti once claimed in his Futurist Manifesto, I quote, why should we look back when what we want is to break down the mysterious doors of the impossible? Question mark. The futurists today find the doubles in the accelerationists who believe that by accelerating automation, there will be liberation of human beings and the overcoming of alienation in the sense of Karl Marx. Technological singularity means the moment when the computer is able to reflect on itself, that's to say, to acquire a sort of consciousness or intellect. One day the production of machine intelligence will outdo that of human beings on the individual level. The, left, uh, the leftist accelerationists suggest it will be possible to attempt true automation, meaning all human labor could be replaced by machines and human could become what Karl Marx uh, had called in the German ideology the free man. On the level of governments, the right wing 
accelerationists believe that by then it is possible to use machines to perform all forms of planning, social, economical, and political planning. Uh, since, after all, the human beings are the source of error, we are the source of mistake, and on the planetary level, one has the optimism that you will be able to, do op to optimize the organization of the Earth, or even with the capacity to reproduce another Earth. Transhumanism seems to, to be rather flexible with adapting both these process from the accelerationist by placing the human under the lens of enhancements and the world under the lens of terraforming. However, this technological optimism echoes an eschatology where the technological singularity designates the apocalypse. This is probably why today we see equally in this optimism a technological dis dis dystopia. We created a situation in which we no longer distinguish science fiction and reality, dreams and nightmare. And which we can see in the recent collapse of the FTX, I mean, if you, some of you do trading, and the bankruptcy of the effective altruism movement associated with it. If, like Malevich has analyzed, that there were three paths in thinking arts and technology, we will have to reflect on other possible paths, possibly a fourth or even a fifth in such a position to, in such a position to Malavish analysis. These additional paths are neither return to romantic nature, nor a technological optimism like that of the transhumanist. The question is open. And in my own work, I developed the concept of technodiversity as a response, namely the possibility to enforce new imaginations and developments of technology by looking into different cultural, geographical, and historical resources. And I think it's uh, today, uh, some of the, uh, the, the speech of uh, Ronaldo Lemons, but also of uh, Scott, will cover uh, some of these questions. Uh, however, it is not my intention to make this introduction to, uh, as a presentation of my own work, but rather to unfold the inquiry present in the title of the symposium. And I'm sure that we are going to hear many insightful responses from our guests today. So. Uh, I will uh, stop here, um, the introduction here, and to open the floor to, uh, the, uh, to the speakers and also to the moderation of Charles. Thank you. Hi, greetings. Um, well, hearing this very exciting introduction, full of intellectual references, you know, from Marx to Malevich and beyond, I only wish I was with you guys in person uh, but unfortunately, you know, my whole semester hasn't ended yet in New York and to fly 13 hours and then in a few days to fly back, it was, it would be just too much. Um, so my talk maybe would be a bit unusual, uh, maybe not what you expect, uh, because um, after kind of 30 years of focusing on, um, you know, trying to theorize new media in digital culture, and uh, often writing about the work of others, uh, and maybe only devoting something like 20% to my own artwork. Uh, I decided that while well, I felt the spring, the need you know, to change this balance, uh, because for a few years now I felt that I can't, I don't want to simply respond to the, you know, what I feel, what I experience in the contemporary world, right, for theoretical writing, but I want to you know, allow myself uh, to be artist because that's how I started. And in fact, most of my art, I was teaching digital art. I was studying studio art. So that's why the talk will be a bit unusual. You know, I will start in my childhood. I will show you some of my early analog works. And then uh, I will show you my recent attempts to um, kind of come back to similar subjects and aesthetics as a starting point using a uh, recently emerging uh, AI image synthesis technology, uh, and web services such as DALI-E, uh, Midjourney, and uh, open source models such as Table Diffusion. So I will make a you know, few theoretical points uh, about this uh, important right, technology. In fact, I do think that by living through a true 
uh, revolution in visual culture. Uh, uh, but as opposed to just kind of making this programmatic point when illustrating of the slides you know, drawn from elsewhere, I will use my own work. So let me share the screen. Perfect. So I was born uh, in Moscow in 1960. Uh, my mother was a you know, humanities person. Uh, she was I think, extremely, extremely wonderfully talented poet. But as a Jew, and when I say Jew in the context of Soviet Union, you know, none of us were religious, but you had a passport. And the first part, the first page of the passport, you know, you had the uh, item which was your nationality, you know, Russian, Ukrainian, you know, Uzbek, Jew, right? And, uh, you know, the career prospects for Jews uh, became quite limited at the end of the 1940s. So there was a kind of official and unofficial anti-Semitism in Soviet Union. Um, so, you know, she could never have a literary career. She couldn't even teach at the university. So she was teaching in a kind of a two-year college, uh, Russian literature, French, and uh, Latin to future uh, medical workers. And my father was a scientist uh, and a doctor, right? He was a physician. He was a leading authority in the Soviet Union for encephalitis and also polio. I may remind you, right, that polio was the major uh, disease over the 50s and 60s. And um, I mean, right, and eventually it was almost completely, right, taken care of. So my father, uh, in fact, as I realized only later, played a key role in this. And I'm, you know, I'm, talking, I'm talking about this, I'm thinking about it because there are obviously parallels to uh, what we just been through, uh, which is you know, COVID-19. So my father uh, was responsible for organizing, right, testing of a new uh, right, anti-polio vaccine in Russia, even administering this vaccine to all the Russian population in the early 60s. You know? uh, and I wish you know, I had the opportunity to ask him more about it when he was still alive. So when I was 10, right, I, did, I finally realized that I'm living in a surrealistic, absurd theater in a performance place called late communist society. You know? So it's a society where everybody pretended and you couldn't really say how many people believed. I read the newspapers. Yes. Uh, we, cannot we cannot see your see slides. slides. Sorry. Sorry. You can't see my slides? Yeah, we, okay. we only see black. Okay. Well, how about now? Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. So, okay. How about, aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, how about, sorry about it. Okay. How about, how about now? You see slides? Do you see slides? No, yes. 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 Yes, you see slides. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So at page of 10, I realized that, you know, all the propaganda around me was a lie. Um, and at the age of 12, I started to study art. And then, uh, you know, I, I reached a certain, you know, academic Wait, mastery. Your browser. browser. Is that, that what you? No, no, it's not what. Okay. Okay. Let's try again. So something strange about. Uh, the zoom. Okay, okay, here we go. Okay, now it should be okay. Okay, how about now? You see some drawings, right? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's, it's like, I don't know what's happening. Uh, sometimes I start zoom, and I can just select desktop, and then I can put any screen. And I noticed recently a couple of times, when I start sharing screen, I can only select particular window. Uh, I don't, so, right, so I wasn't able to select the desktop, so I'm sorry about it. Anyway, so this is a portrait of my mother, which I drew at the age of 17, uh, age 18, you know, pen and paper. Uh, so, so here are some maybe close-ups uh, of this. Uh, right. So this was kind of my, my you know, academic artistic background. And then um, I started to uh, right, make up drawings but I couldn't make anything which would directly speak to this condition of an late communist absurd theater because, uh, you know, it was, I mean, I wouldn't be able to show them, but more importantly, once we decided to immigrate, I wouldn't be able to take them out of the country, right? Because in fact, when the 
you know, preparing to immigrate to Russia, so we left when New York in 1981. I had to bring, you know, whatever 35 works I selected, right? Uh, I had to bring them to a special office, probably was part of Ministry of Culture, you know, very, very well dressed young art historian, right? Carefully examined uh, my drawings and, uh, and my paintings and, you know, and whatever works I, you know, I was allowed to take, she would put a step. There were a couple of landscapes, which didn't, there was one landscape and one you know, city view. There was nothing uh, ideological or uh, anti-Soviet, but we simply were too pessimistic. So she said, no, you can't take, you can't take this work out of Russia. We don't present, you know, uh, Soviet Union and our communist state, you know, right, in the in the in the right light. Uh, so, so this is how I learned that, you know, you don't need to deal with social or political topics to be political. In fact, to a melancholic landscape or a melancholic or sad city view can become very political, or at least seen as very dangerous by uh, communism. So only when we immigrated in 1981. I was able to start reflecting, right, on this Russia, which I left, right, and I started making various drawings, paintings, work on paper, where, inev where inevitably, right, maybe I wanted it or not, this representation of life as a kind of theater, as a stage, started to appear, right? So you can see with the buildings are kind of two-dimensional, and you see there's a kind of curtain in the back, right? Uh, one example, uh, Right, here's another example. So this is all works from the 1980s, right? From my 20s. Uh, we don't have dates. So it can be anywhere from 1981 to 1988, right? So another drawing from a period. Uh, again, right? Uh, the texture suggests that this is reality because of course, late Soviet Union was slowly decaying. So there was lots of texture, right? Lots of construction work. Uh, everything was gray with a few shots of red. Uh, but it's also a closed space, right? So there's no escape. There's no place where the actors can go and rehearse. You're born and you're already on a stage because you're already being indoctrinated since the age of five. You know, you join a particular group and then you become, you know, Komsomol, et etc. et cetera. Um, So this was maybe first time when I used my art as a kind of memory machine, right? Or as a way to, sort of, as a way to deal with my past, right? Uh, so here's another example, right? A kind of series of stages, uh, right? And then something like this. Uh, and then uh, I, I started to, I went to New York University. I started to study etchings. So this is a close up with the very first etching I've done. And uh, right, again, somewhat of a similar perspective. So there's this world and people who live, right? In this kind of flat world, they don't realize that this is a reality world, right? So for them, it's only reality we know, but when they step outside, we can see what in fact, it's a, you know, it's a world, it's like an island, right? Suspended somewhere and uh, the corner, right? Can be wrapped. And in fact, the whole, you know, the whole thing is a kind of stage and held by strings, you know, and rope, okay? Uh, so just some close-ups, okay? So let's now jump to, let's now jump to uh, today. Okay, uh, so the summer, actually, actually, I'm sorry, before we jump to today, just let me go back, just my, one moment. Okay, one, one little second. Okay, here we go, I think here it is, yeah. So um, last time I actually was drawing, right, and on paper or doing anything like manual uh, was 92. So um, exactly 30 years later, I said, maybe it's time for me now digital, right? As, as we heard in the introduction, digital is everywhere. It's a condition for existence. You can't get a job. You can't you know, withdraw money if you're not know, digital. So I thought it's no longer avant-garde, right? It's no longer uh, something evolutionary. It's a condition of our life, right? Like television, like advertising, right? Like roads, like electricity. So maybe I should go back and uh, to something which I can do which probably would be a bit different from what everybody's doing. So I started drawing again. And so this was the first drawing I did in Berlin, again, ink on paper. This was the second drawing I did. Uh, and I wanted to continue. And then in mid of July, uh, we kind of mid-journey exploded. And um, I'm still hoping to continue back to drawing. But since that moment, like everybody else I know, <laughs> I've been spending endless days uh, playing with software 
and generating literally six or eight thousand images. Uh, and uh, one of the things, of course, I discovered is that the amazing things about AI image synthesis, right, is that you can kind of try a few ideas every day, right? So I would never be able to try so many ideas in one day when I was uh, doing work for traditional media. So it would take me a year to explore. Now I can explore in a few days. Okay? Um, so now I will, I will show you what I've been doing, right? Um, so before, before, actually, yeah, okay. Um, okay. Um, so I wanted to, uh, again, it didn't happen as I planned, right? I didn't plan it, but it happened intuitively, right? So I started to explore this latest technology, right? With, because image synthesis, of course, is not a new thing. I mean, with 3D computer graphics, it's also a form of image synthesis. So that begins in the 60s, even we get photorealism in the 80s. And then in the 2010s, we had guns, right, where you start, uh, you kind of train, uh, you train the network on a database of, let's say, artworks, and then it will generate images which will be similar, but unique to what is the database. And we had uh, sort of like lots of other things. So now we have image to, uh, text to image, right, where you type a text prompt, and then you get images. And I was going to show to you those of you who haven't seen me journey screens, but now it turns out like if I leave if I leave this particular window, you'll not be able to see anything. Um, you know, and we also have image to image, right? So you can give a network an image, and then it will generate something similar but something different. Now, but I also develop it now where uh, you can type a prompt, and the system will try to create a three-dimensional model, or it will try to create a video. And people think that within maybe a couple of next couple of years, maybe less, maybe more, you know, you'll be able just to type, right, a paragraph describing some kind of movie, and you will get more or less realistic, right, more or, or cartoony kind of movie, right? But uh, as I discovered, uh, with networks, right, even though we're trained on billions of image and text pairs, uh, we have kind of biases or uh, I would actually say, because word bias is overused, right? So I don't like to use it. Uh, where creators of the systems, such as we see of Midjourney, has announced that we built in particular preferences, right? So if I type a sky with the Midjourney, I will get not like a normal photograph of the sky, I will get something very, very spectacular, right? Something more spectacular than a Hollywood film, or more spectacular than a video game, right? Or um, And I was doing these experiments, I wanted to, to show them to you, but now I can't switch a window, like I type a sphere, and I didn't just get a simple sphere, right? I got like a whole phantasmagoria, right, of content uh, and styles. So, um, so I have to spend quite a bit of time, right, to try to work the grain, to try to work against the bias or the preferences of the systems, to try them to get something different, right? So one of the things, so one of the series I've done was uh, trying to test, right, to what extent these machines can be can work as machines of memory. So uh, my prompt would be something like Rus Russian students in the 10th grade of high school in Moscow in 1976, right? Because I was in 10th grade in 1976. Um, and uh, this is the earlier version of mid journey. And I would get, you know, something like this, right? Or something like this, or something like this, right? And here, you know, we encounter another fascinating thing about this. Uh, about this paradigm, right? The way image synthesis. So sometimes, right, it will basically populate two images with exactly the same face, right? So it creates this strange, uncanny effect where everybody looks the same. And sometimes it, you know, it can also create different faces and also everybody has a different hairstyle. So one of the things the systems can do, which is kind of difficult for even professional artists, is to generate incredible variety. So somewhere between too much repetition, too much predictability, an incredible variety and affect uh, our lack of ability to obviously create what you want, right? If I put a prompt, which I used a week ago, I'm not going to get the same thing, lies interesting aesthetics of the system, right? So this was one attempt, right, to, uh, uh, to imagine kind of in a way my past. And of course, uh, I don't know, right, how my classmates looked because, you know, photo culture was much less spread out in Soviet Union. Uh, not many people had cameras, uh, and uh, it wasn't like Kodak in America. And um, 
I don't have a single photo. I don't have a single photograph of my classmates with me, right? I think we took one. And we had great. And in fact, you know, if you go to to internet, you know, you'll find uh, like New York in 1981 way better represented in photography than Moscow 1981. What you're going to find for Moscow is mostly by official images of you know happy workers, uh, Red Square, and so on, or the same images of Red Square or Russian churches by by foreign journalists, right? So, uh, which means that this training data, right, which has been used to train the system, is very unevenly distributed. Some periods, right, some ethnicities, uh, some situations, some periods are represented much better. I was represented, you know, a much more poorly. And I think in years to come, the designers of the systems need to get pressure from us, right? Uh, to try to figure out how to create more balanced training sets. Okay? So back to my images. Uh, so this was one attempt. And then uh, I was using a different software stable diffusion. Um, and I on purpose, right, put this kind of fog. Uh, and again, uh, I'm fascinated, right, by the interplay between faces which are sometimes all different, sometimes all unique. Um, and uh, what I do is I edit my images in Lightroom. Uh, just to kind of put focus on, you know, particular faces more. Uh, let's see, there's more where, yeah, there's more, but I don't have to show all of you. Okay, so here's some examples. Okay, something like this. Uh, and even though, you know, these faces were like sometimes anatomically incorrect, I wouldn't notice that because to me, there was something about atmosphere, about the mood, about the feeling, which really, even though it didn't look like probably what I was experiencing in Russia as a teenager, even though know, it doesn't look like what I was drawing, it sort of, I was able to craft a prompt where the network would uh, synthesize something which really resonated with me and felt like, you know, the reality in which I grew up. Uh, but as I said, right, um, the system changed from version to version. So for example, the founder of Midjourney said that his goal every month to release a new model and not to support early models, uh, and uh, there's a kind of, there's another aesthetic bias going on besides, you know, what is present or not present in the training sets. Uh, you know, they monitor, right, what people are doing with me journey of stable diffusion and so on. You know, and if we see what people asking for uh, particular features or particular style, right, they will do it. So last week we released, you know, version four. And while it increased realism, uh, suddenly it generates things which are in a way more generic, more beautiful, right? A bit more cliche. So I would use exactly the same prompt, right? Which I used, you know, a couple of months ago to generate these images. But now what I got was something very different, right? What I got was strange, right? Ideal, idealized portraits. Um, it's not clear what period it is. It does look maybe like 20th century. Uh, but... Uh, it's never painting, no photography, right? Uh, it's basically something like you took a photo and you like, you like don't know how to use Photoshop, so you did it too much. And the faces I think are with, like, with, you know, the system is capturing something about maybe like some Russian stereotypes, but they're also all very beautiful, right? So basically my prompt was again, Russian high school students in uh, 1976, uh, but we don't look like high school students, but we look like young models, right? So suddenly, um, as the users probably pressure the system, right, to give a more realistic uh, images, which we can directly use in a video game, right, for video game design, uh, film design, uh, illustrations, and so on, right? It's basically affecting everybody, right? So using exactly the same prompt, what I got is something very, very different. Uh, now, what about, what about simulating my drawings, right? So I spent quite a bit of time simply trying to get the journey to create something which would look like you know, a drawing, maybe ink on paper or pencil on paper, and would somehow capture something, right, from maybe a texture or my old drawings. Like this is the best I was able to get. Uh, and uh, you know, it's not at all like my drawings, but I think it's not bad. Uh, but of course, if you look, right, if you look at what I was actually drawing, it is actually very, very different. Right. So what you can also do is you can actually, uh, I don't know if I have it here. You can actually use, yeah, you can actually use, uh, you can actually use, right, your image as an input, right? Uh, and then uh, you can kind of guide the system. 
But even when I did this with stable diffusion, right, that's my original drawing, this is what I got, right? So you can see it's more generic, it's more repetitive. Suddenly there is no precision of line, no precision of detail. So superficially it does look my drawing, but in reality is something very different. But then uh, what I've done is I raised, right? I raised in you know, a background and I put something and I typed something like clouds, uh, like drawings of clouds by Rembrandt. So now it actually looks a bit better, right? But again, you can obviously see difference in style. Um, okay. Um, so I was also trying to see if I can use the systems uh, to react to right, the terrible war, which Russia started in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and um, I started to imagine, like, you know, right now, like, you know, Russia is bombing, right, and sending rockets to Ukraine. And I was able to take out a big part of Ukrainian uh, you know, infrastructure, right, you know, electric stations, so on. But what will happen if a war will continue? And then, you know, war actually, uh, go, war actually takes place over Russia. Uh, and I started to create this kind of imaginary landscapes, uh, or like, Russia after a long war, right? Russia in uh, 1932, and on purpose, I used a particular parameter in stable diffusion to get right to, to get away from this very clean, very you know, <laughs> idealized look, right? To try to get something yeah, which is a bit more yeah, defined, yeah, right? Uh, something like this, right? Uh, okay. Uh, in our in our in our type of response, right, which emerged in me. This events, like especially in February, I'm hearing I'm hearing somebody else talking. Is that what I'm supposed to hear? No? Hearing somebody else talking loudly. Yeah, so it's hard for me to talk. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, yeah. So another uh, feeling which I had, especially in February, March, April. Now we kind of, to some extent, got used to this awful reality of war, and it's the same feeling many of my friends and colleagues had in Russia. People felt frozen. Right, even though it was clear for years, you know that uh, Putin uh, is kind of driving Russia to uh, politically something very similar, or in fact something more extreme than the communist state in which I grew up, uh, because at least in the 1970s Russia, you know, the decisions will be taken not by Brezhnev but a collective. But now, right, uh, you know, Putin in one day. Right, uh, deleted everything which was amazing, everything which was growing in Russia in the last 30 years, by amazing avant-garde arts culture of 2010s, and people felt frozen, right? So I wanted to create this feeling of this kind of frozen rooms, chaotic rooms, so that was another type of response, and I was happy to discover that while I can't make a particular idiosyncratic, surrealistic, absurd world of my drawing, you know, the, the systems turned out to be very good in uh, creating particular atmospheres, but of course you have to spend time uh, and experiment a lot to tell them what to do. Um, so one more, right? Um, so thinking about, again, the history of Russia, you know, uh, the awful uh, fortunes of thousands of uh, creators, artists, composers, uh, painters, who either were killed, right, during communist era or forced into exile, like Yosef Brodsky, or simply, right, would uh, never, never imagine that their works would be published. Um, I started to create this series of images where my prompt would be a handwritten manuscript, which is partially erased, right? So I was thinking about you know, maybe both a creative process and you know, how much struggle it is writing and rewriting, but also thinking specifically kind of the heritage of my country and uh, you know, maybe somebody writes a manuscript and erasing it. And uh, in Russia, we have this expression, writing to the table, the idea is that you'll never be able to publish your manuscript, you'll never be able to show it to anybody. You can write it just for you and your close friends. Um, so this is the series of images, uh, with right, partly erased manuscripts. And we can see that the system is actually writing something, but it's no particular language, but maybe one day we'll be able to decipher, maybe it's actually something meaningful. Um, okay, um, let me see, um, give this one. So to continue this topic, right, of trying to create this idea of like the war now is taking place in Russian territory, maybe this is how Russia is going to look in 1932, right? I noticed that whenever I would type something which involved Russia, the journey would immediately place at least churches 
or sometimes Kremlin. Okay? So, and of course it can make sense, right? Because when you start typing Russia, for example, in a Google image search, you will get lots of images of churches, lots of Kremlin. Um, so these images obviously are very common. So, uh, so definitely at this point, the systems are good at stereotyping things, right? And um, instead of fighting it, right, I wanted to leave it. I said, okay, if the AI thinks that Russia is all about churches, okay, I will show you what happens, you know, when Russia lost the war and the churches were destroyed. And there are some buildings which look like Moscow University. And this is all has been when uh, I basically create this VI, when I edit with Lightroom and Photoshop uh, to change the contrast, uh, but I don't change any geometry or any content. Um, and um, I think, yeah, if so, maybe just a couple of more, more things. So what also happens, of course, when you use this particular method, uh, just as any artistic media, there are happy accidents. And the happy accidents uh, with this AI image generation is that you, you're trying to explain something to the computer and the computer doesn't understand you. So here my prompt was the pages of a book floating from a room, right? And I think it read floating in the room and it imagined that I meant clouds. So instead of pages of a book floating from the room, the journey has produced a kind of photo book with beautiful pseudo photographs of clouds and um, I like it, right? So lots of people are trying to, you know, um, type very long prompts, they're really trying to control the system. But I find often that you know, my best my best results, my best images you know, happens when I can let the computer create something out of its network unconscious. So finally, uh, I'll show you something else, which is uh, actually maybe my most successful image series. And in general, this work has been very successful since I started doing it in July and putting it online. I already participated in three group exhibitions. The work has been written in three different articles. And exactly six weeks after I started you know, pasting this online, I was invited to have a big uh, you know, personal exhibition uh, in uh, Portugal next year. Uh, so now I'm wondering how I'm going to feel you know, 1,300 square meters. Um, and the response of kind of fellow artists was like, Lev, go, go, you have a talent. No, yeah, you can't just simply continue doing theory. Now there are other people who do theory, do more. And uh, I said, okay. And when um, one image series, I can allow the system a bit to take over, right? I allowed the system to create its uh, spectacular images. Uh, but here again, you know, with my Russian background shows up along the way, which is not obvious, the prompt for the series was Russian uh, cybernetic city uh, designed in 1965 as drawn by you know uh, by bosch right you know the dutch you know 15th century artist on a large wood panel and nobody could figure out exactly what artists are used actually somebody thought i used malevich but in fact uh, if around these modern elements became uh, from part of a prompt which specifies the kind of modern city a kind of futuristic city and in fact there was lots of futuristic cybernetic design happening in russia in the 1960s just as it was happening in other places um so, you know, the Russian architects participated in the architectural Biennale in Venice and, uh, you know, and um, we're friends with people from Archeogram and Super Studio. Uh, so this is maybe the last thing I will show. So I'm probably, right, I'm probably right at the boundary of my time. This was, this actually, this was large, this was large airport, large airport in Siberia. Again, it's painted by Bosch. Uh, and this, of course, was a Tower of Babel. Uh, and here's something else. And uh, this is, I started to make these panels. So I think I um, kind of showed you uh, more or less what I wanted to show. Of course, you know, I have lots of other things, uh, but uh, I think that's probably, probably has been 30 minutes. So I'm um, sorry about this confusion with, uh, with Zoom, uh, but here I am. Uh, and uh, I think that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much, Lev. Uh, we'll now have uh, Ronaldo Lemos on Zoom uh, as our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, it's great to be here with you. Uh, I'm speaking from Sao Paulo, Brazil. It was great to follow Lev Manovich's presentation. I think the last time we met in person was more than 10 years ago. So it's really good to catch up uh, regarding what you're doing. 
And uh, just for a little bit of context, I have a short presentation. And I'm a lawyer specialized uh, in technology policy. I have been working from Brazil as an academic uh, and also someone involved in building institutions regarding technology policy. So what I would like to share with you today, it's a little bit uh, about these topics and especially in the look for something that I, I think is really valuable in the world of today, which is techno diversity and actually very much influenced by the work of Professor Yu Kui. And um, I think Brazil is an interesting perspective to look for uh, techno diversity. So for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to move directly into the presentation by saying that uh, one project that I have been developing in the last six years is a TV show produced in Brazil called Expresso Futuro, in which uh, I travel to different places to look for alternatives regarding the use of technology and innovations that can be useful to show fruitful paths for the development of technology. So this TV show, it has six seasons. The first two were uh, filmed in the United States. The third one was filmed in China. The next two were filmed in Brazil. And the latest one, which was just released, was filmed in Africa. So just for the sake of uh, showing a little bit about it, uh, the show basically explores uh, possibilities in terms of how technology is playing out in terms of geopolitics and also perspectives for innovation. So you can see me here in the city of Shenzhen, uh, basically walking in the streets with David Lee uh, from the Shenzhen uh, Open Innovation Lab. Uh, I basically for the show visited a number of uh, places in China in 2019, trying to understand how China as a developing country uh, has basically very successfully uh, implemented a, a technology uh, policy that has uh, led to interesting developments. And uh, this is one of my key areas of interest is like how technology and the developing world can basically uh, generate new perspectives that can be even sometimes more innovative or at least desirable from what we've been seeing uh, in other contexts. So uh, in this particular season of China, uh, I think it was interesting because I was looking into what is it that is different in terms of how China uses technology uh, from, for instance, the United States, Europe, or even Brazil and India. And I think there were one or two interesting findings. Of course, as we all know, technology has become very uniform in the world we live today. So the, to find uh, techno diversity is not something obvious and it's not something easy to find. But I think there were a couple of things that were lessons, especially in how uh, China understands technology as infrastructure that are useful lessons for other countries, including Brazil. Uh, the latest season, as I mentioned to you, was uh, filmed in Africa and was actually completed uh, two months ago. So it's pretty recent. And uh, I traveled uh, in six different African countries, including Kenya, Mozambique, Tanzania, and others in order to look for uh, perspectives and ideas from uh, these countries in terms of how technology is being played out there. And of course, uh, some interesting things. This is a picture of me uh, in the Kibera uh, area of Nairobi. It's a, it's a poor area of Nairobi. And it's interesting to see uh, that you find Wi-Fi 6 and also um, uh, 5G antennas in the, the, the landscape. And I even tested the speed of the network there, and it's pretty good. It's sometimes even better than uh, cities like Sao Paulo and others in Brazil. Uh, Africa has a long trajectory uh, regarding mobile money. 
So M-Pesa uh, was created in, in Kenya in actually 2007, the same year the, the iPhone was invented. And it was a way of sending money through SMS, which I think it's interesting. It must be recorded as a, an important innovation uh, of the year of 2007 and onwards. Uh, that was a, an important contribution, especially uh, about how the people in the developing world actually get access to mobile payments. And actually, even if you don't have a bank account, which is something uh, very common in the developing world, you can actually use your cell phone to store money and to send money to other people in different locations, most of the cases for free. And this is a development that was also created in Africa. Uh, MIPESA is basically everywhere in the country. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details here, but if you guys are interested in learning more, uh, the series is also on YouTube. It's subtitled, and you can also find English subtitles that are uh, auto-generated by YouTube as well. But th there are interesting developments even in terms of hardware design. So one of the things that called my attention was uh, the cell phone that was designed in Africa and manufactured in Shenzhen, uh, which was designed to take better pictures of people with dark skin. So quickly it became a, a commercial hit in the continent and also an opposition to the fact that most cell phones, especially in the Western world, until very recently, were calibrated to take pictures better of people um, of white skin. So I think this is an interesting thing in terms of, so of the design of technology and hardware, and also a valuable thing to, to look into. And of course, if you walk uh, in regions like the Maasai areas, you also see some interesting developments, even like in traditional ways of life, like the fact that solar panels are getting uh, more and more widespread and connectivity has arrived first. And one of the challenges in many areas, for instance, in Tanzania, is not to get your cell phone connected to the network, but actually where to find a place where you can charge your cell phone. So there are no outlets, there is no electricity in most areas, there is connectivity. So this is one of the points that, that I also find interesting in how technology is developing. So maybe solar panels in some areas of Africa will get there before uh, a typical electricity grid be implemented. So jumping from a situation in which there is no grid to a situation in which you can even have self-generation and mini grids that are built uh, locally. So uh, again, if you're interested, the, 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 the series is online. It's all about looking for tech di diversity. But I would like to, to give you some specific and other modest possibilities that I have bumped uh, into uh, across my work journey uh, so far. So uh, I would like to offer some perspectives about what can uh, techno diversity look like uh, from the perspective of development and the developing world. And some of the examples include, for instance, uh, the time in which Brazil had as a minister of culture, uh, Gilberto Gil, who is a, a, a well-known musician. And Gil was a, an interesting minister because his idea was very much focused in technology and he wanted to promote an alternative idea about technology coming from Brazil. So if you are not familiar with uh, our former Minister of Culture, this is him uh, actually opening the United Nations uh, General Assembly in 2004 with Kofi Annan, in which he had this interesting opportunity to actually perform uh, inside the building of the United Nations. So he was there not only as a minister, but also as a musician, and he performed uh, at the United Nations. I don't know if that, that, that has ever happened again, but uh, it speaks a little bit about a diverse uh, way of understanding and seeing 
the world as well that is actually embedded in his policies. And interestingly, one of the, the key elements that Gilberto Gil used to speak when he was a minister in Brazil comes actually from a, a Chinese idea. He, he always used to say that Brazil had to practice during his tenure as a minister uh, a form of uh, anthropological Tao Yin, uh, which is a, a concept that comes from Taoism, a form of self-massage in which he, he thought that technology could be used as a form of, as a, an anthropological Tao Yin, in which you would deploy certain technology tools to certain communities, some of them might be even deprived of, um, you know, uh, conditions and so on. And out of this uh, Dao Yin, you would have uh, a lot of things emerging in terms of empowerment, in terms of autonomy, in terms of diversity and so on. So uh, his idea of an anthropological Dao Yin uh, were actually uh, a applied to interesting fields. For instance, intellectual property. He, he was very strong in debating alternatives to intellectual property. Also for institutional imagination, different kinds of policies, and also for a, an idea of a global internet governance that would speak also to the interests of the developing world. So uh, it's a very interesting moment to follow in Brazil and certainly speaks to this idea of a, a techno-diversity. Second example is the formation in Brazil of Brazil's internet law, which is uh, usually called as the, the Marco Civil in 2014. It was a very long process of seven years in which I, I participated directly as one of the co-authors of the Brazilian internet law, which is actually still in force. And it's a very singular law because it worked as a form of a digital constitutionalism effort. So the law was actually written by a public consultation that started in 2007. And this public consultation became a nationwide effort that lasted for at least four years in which basically all the stakeholders uh, in the Brazilian society had the chance to basically participate. So it was an important effort in a very early moment before even uh, Facebook was a force uh, in which you actually were able to use technology and um, collaboration tools like wikis and WordPress and others in order to build a very sophisticated law, which is actually still very singular. Brazil created an alternative law um, when you compare it to other jurisdictions, uh, and it's still a very good law, at least in my personal perspective. It's a pretty good one that was influential also over other processes in other countries, like in Italy, and it, which went in the way of digital constitutionalism as well, and Mexico, and even France. So it, it's an interesting thing how to see how this Brazilian law became a sort of an influential process and also an influential text of law regarding other countries. So uh, the third example also derives from the the, the, the time in which Gilberto Gil was the Minister of Culture, which was the, the, the approval in the World Intellectual Property Organization of the so-called development agenda. So if you're not familiar with the development agenda, it's a set of 45 recommendations and principles that were finally approved in 2007 that basically established that intellectual property should not be an end in itself, but it should be a means for the development of the peoples and the nations of the world. And it's interesting because it was proposed in 2004 by Brazil and Argentina, so it came from the developing world, and it's probably one of the most uh, interesting and noticeable efforts at the world um, level to build something that is in terms of institutions, 
approaching what we can call techno diversity. So the, the development agenda, I, I dare to say, uh, for its time, it's one of the most daring and uh, why cutting edge, if we can say that, documents that actually propose an alternative view of one of the pillars of the technology we have today in the world, which is uh, basically intellectual property. So I think that was a huge success for uh, techno diversity. It's a pity that it didn't follow uh, through uh, very vigorously in terms of implementation, but the document is still there. It's still valid. It's still a guideline for the work of the World Intellectual Property Organization. And other countries might have the opportunity to basically work with it in the present and in the future. Fourth example, and I'm almost finishing, I promise, it's uh, developments that happen in Brazil, for instance, the, the build of this uh, application called Mudamos, which basically allows uh, the use of the blockchain in order to introduce views of law in the Brazilian Congress. So if you gather uh, the signatures online on the blockchain uh, of 1% of the Brazilian voters, you can actually introduce a law in Congress. Of course, Congress members will have to vote to approve or disapprove that law, but that gives citizens the possibility of mobilizing themselves in order to propose laws um, for the Congress. So it was a pretty interesting development, one that speaks to the idea of participation and democracy, and one that uses blockchain technologies for other things that are not cryptocurrencies, but uh, for rebuilding and reimagining institutions, something that I, I really like in my academic career. Um, five, fifth and last example I, I have here uh, for you, it's just a, a, an interesting one of South-South collaboration, which is something that you might know or not, which is the fact that Brazil and China have a, a long time space cooperation in which the two countries have basically committed and developed uh, six satellites together. And the latest one actually being used to monitor uh, the Amazon and deforestation and other uh, relevant data for the environment. And finally, <laughs> sorry, I said I, I had five, but I actually have six and I go quickly uh, in the last one, is the experiments that have been run in Brazil uh, some of them by, by a team connected uh, to my work about implementing the so-called quadratic voting in terms of decision-making in legislative houses in Brazil. If you're not familiar with quadratic voting, I encourage you to take a look, but it's a new possibility of making collective decisions. And interestingly, the, the work we've been doing in Brazil Kept, was captured the attention of the the Economist magazine, in which uh, they basically published a, a recent article about this what they call a new mathematical uh, formula that can uh, lead to better decisions. And actually, in Brazil, we did an experiment in the city of Gramado, uh, in the southern part of the country, in which the city council started using. Uh, quadratic voting to prioritize uh, topics that were of interest of the local population. Gramado is a, a very beautiful city of uh, German inspired because of the German colonization in the area. But it's it's an interesting thing uh, to see these possibilities uh, of applying these experiments to actually seek for new forms of participation. Uh, collaboration and decision making that I think can be very promising, especially if you connect them uh, with technology. So let me conclude by saying that uh, Brazil has interestingly acted as an experimentation lab on technology and policy diversity. We have a long experience with that from Creative Commons licenses that I know that Lev Manovich knows pretty well, 
but it has gone much beyond that. Uh, so Brazil has been doing interesting things. It created, for instance, the idea of participatory budgeting, which now became something used in so many different capitals and cities in the world, including New York City. And it's still going on like that. So, uh, of course, for the past six years, Brazil was pretty much dormant in regards to these uh, policies because we had our own internal problems, including uh, a president for whom these types of uh, issues were not uh, part of his concern. But the, the interesting thing is now we have a new old president. Uh, the fact that uh, President Lula, who, who was the president of Brazil between 2003 and 2008, was just re-elected and will serve uh, his term from 2023 to 2027, it's a very interesting perspective for the fact that Brazil might be back in the field of experimentation in terms of technology policy. And as a matter of fact, President Lula just announced this week that his idea of internet governance will be one of the key elements of his government. He's going to look into internet regulation and governance as one of the key elements for his government. So that's probably something that will be interesting to follow for you. So just to finish, if you're interested in technology diversity, please feel free to reach out to me and to our institute in Brazil, which is the Institute for Technology and Society. And shoot me an email. It's uh, rlemos at itsrio.org, which is also the website for our uh, research institute. We are always seeking to cooperate in terms of technology diversity and finding new examples of that, because I think that those are very important for the world as we go forward. So thank you very much. Let me conclude here by stop sharing my screen. And I look forward uh, to the Q&A session uh, in a couple of minutes. Thank you so much. So we can open the discussion for the next 30 minutes before the next two speakers, the next session. So, um, would anyone like to begin with a question to either of the first two speakers? So it's quite challenging because the, your presentation were very different. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are not converging somewhere. And uh, of course, I would be interested in, uh, in uh, having you, both of you, uh, saying where do you see the convergence. But of course, that looks like a trap. So I will... <laughs> I may try to help a little bit. Um, I, I think w what is interesting is that Lev has been talking mostly in relation of technologies also with his past, his own story, and, uh, and the situation which is also the political international situation in the world. Uh, when, uh, Ronaldo, you have been addressing uh, some uh, some uh, key uh, points uh, in the relation between technology, society, and, uh, and, and different level of implication. So, um, what I would say, what would you ask to each other? I can start, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, considering you are working uh, AI, one of the things that uh, concerned me is precisely the role of AI for the development perspective. So one of the concerns that I have is what will be the role of uh, AI for the developing world? Are we going to be sources of raw data, maybe, that is going to be processed by the winners of the AI game? And is that all that we can do? And I would just compliment mm -hmm. this question for you as like a... What other anomalous AI types can we produce, to use an expression by Kealado, McDowell, and others, that can have different models uh, in terms of how we think about AI? So, for instance, an mm -hmm. AI sure. 
with an, an Amazonic perspective, uh, an AI yeah. with a perspective from the, the indigenous populations of the Amazon or an AI uh, with the perspective of uh, some immaterial or uh, other ideas and other possibilities. Uh, I would love to sure. see how, how you think about these issues, Len. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And by the way, was the uh, presentation was very, very exciting. And I feel like a bit, um, I should apologize, but I probably surprised everybody, including myself. But uh, instead of usual kind of theory presentation, I wanted to make something personal. But, you know, I wanted to talk about something which I'm kind of doing now, and that's what I'm passionate about. And I can make some theoretical points, maybe in this period, uh, but I wanted to explain that, you know, whatever I think about is grounded in my own personal experience. I only write about, I only, you know, all my life, I only wrote about things which I use, right? So I use Photoshop. I wrote a chapter about Photoshop. I use After Effects. People said, Le, why are you never write about Windows? I said, because I don't use them. <laughs> so, um, so it's very important. Okay, so to answer your question, um, so developing world, right? Um, so, um, so, you know, so as we know, um, this uh, division, right? The developed world, developing world, et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, I think it's, I forgot if it's 50s to 60s, but it's very old. In fact, in the last, uh, the last 20, 30 years, no social scientists use it anymore uh, because we realize it's problematic. And here's one example why, right? You talked about China, you went there, I think, 2009, you said developing country. How's the China developing? It's the most technologically advanced country in the world, right? And, uh, you know, it's the second economy after, right? After America, and as you, as you said yourself, right, in terms of Chinese use technology, it's like decades ahead of Europe or America. So, you know, so that, and that's why I think why, I mean, China, of course, is an extreme example, right? But Brazil is also, right? Brazil has, you guys are going to have internet governments. So, um, so to me, right, to me, like it's, the term itself becomes a bit problematic um, because it maybe reflects reality of 1960s and 1970s, but maybe not necessarily today. So that's uh, kind of like one, one thing, but not, not to criticize you, but just to problematize, right? Problematize, because I think when you ask these questions, right? Can we have Amazonian AI, right? Can we have I know, Russian AI? Can we have, you know, Japanese AI? Uh, well, uh, my answer is this, right? So we want, we want world to be culturally diverse. That's for sure, right? We want to have linguistic diversity. We want to preserve languages. And I also think that we want to have aesthetic diversity, right? And uh, imagination diversity and so on, right? And uh, I think that lots of diversity or subtlety, but also subtlety and nuance has been lost, right? You know, if you look at how normal people I mean, the case were writing in 100 years ago, like any engineer was writing much better than any humanities professor today, right? Uh, when you think about descriptions of feelings or love or other emotions, let's say, in European literature, for example, right, in 17th, 18th century, what we have now is extremely primitive stuff, right? Um, and um, so, um, so we lost lots of the diversity. But when it comes to technology, so I want to maybe say a provocative thing, right, and then maybe you respond. Um, in the 1970s, right, um, like there was this magazine, for example, called Screen, which was this leftist magazine about film studies, right? You know, people were developing arguments that particular cultural forms or particular technological forms by itself carry a particular ideology, right? So that was a time where experimental filmmaking, right, was very important. And people were saying that, you know, normal linear narrative is ideological, it carries particular messages, ta, ta, ta. And I thought, well, you know, it kind of depends, right? You know, uh, you can use narratives in a different way, right? So you can make, you know, Tarkovsky can make a movie and, you know, Tarantino can make a movie. And uh, what will create is very different, right? Uh, people also later, people made this very emancipatory claims about interactivity, right? Interactive literature, hypertext. And I think that uh, these kind of claims, in a way, they very Marxist, uh, to be, meaning that they put too much faith in technology, right? We almost say that technological forms dictate like how it can be, how it can be used. Uh, and I think this is just completely wrong, right? 
So if you want to, so, so, so my provocative, so I'm finishing, my provocative response would be, right? What does it mean to uh, ask about Amazonian, right? Uh, AI or Global South AI or whatever, because uh, with diversity come from a fact that we'll have technology which is built differently, it has a different logic, I'm not sure. I think, I think I can make, right, very, very different images, as you saw, right, with technology, because I grew up in Russia, I was educated in the 70s, I spent 50 years teaching art, and my mental database has all kinds of stuff, right? So I can use the same technology as everybody else, right? Photoshop, AI, it makes something very different. And, uh, you know, many, many people commented on Facebook, Lev, the kind of images you're doing with AI, We've never seen anybody do it with AI, right? I'm not saying it's great art or not, but we're different. So, um, so the question becomes, right, uh, to what extent uh, changing technology itself can lead more diversity, or is it really about educating people, uh, you know, right? So uh, uh, as opposed to giving them some kind of tool, uh, which by itself would kind of force them, right, to create something different. But then, in a way, we'll be complaining that this tool is very ideological. Okay, anyway, I hope, I hope my response makes some sense to you. you know? So, sorry to be provocative, but you know, that's what I do, right? <laughs> Thank you. No, that's, that's really yeah. appreciated. And do you have a response? Do you have a response, right, uh, to my question? Well, I yeah, mean, what do you think, like, what do you uh, think about this, right? What do you think about this, yeah? Absolutely, Lev. I, I think you have, like, some very important points. Uh, about the, the use of like uh, developing world, my specific role as a pro practitioner and not only an, uh, an academic, it's a very functional one. So uh, I, I definitely agree with you. It's a very poor description for the world we have today. So it's a definition that has a lot of flaws in it, but it's one that allows us to have uh, conversations about uh, the, these specific topics mm -hmm. across different uh, cultures and perspectives. And actually, the term AI in itself is a very faulty one, if we think about it, because first, AI doesn't refer to one singular thing, right? Inside of the term AI, you have so many different uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm like uh, natural language processing, computational vision. You have, uh, for instance, neuromorphic networks, things that are completely different from each other sometimes and have completely different fields. And we use the term AI as a sort of, a, a, basically a, a bag in which you put all these things and you try to talk about them. And even the, the word intelligence, actually is a very problematic one. Like, uh, what, what do we mean when we talk about intelligence? But uh, I think like uh, the AI term, it deserves to be more analyzed in a sense. Uh, if we approach it from a more analytical perspective, it allows us to basically understand it better. And, and there's a second degree of analysis for the term AI, because AI is not something that happens uh, spontaneously, right? AI always depends on a stack of so many different things that are put one on top of each other. And each of these things have a very different form of governance, right? So you need like a server farms that are located in certain locations in the world with different jurisdictions and laws. And then you have like uh, cables and you have radio frequencies that are licensed by different regulators. And then you have uh, protocols that are used in different areas and data laws that basically govern how can you use the data and so on. And then you have copyright and you have like uh, intellectual property and patents and so on. So th this stack is very high. And so when we yes. talk about AI, I, I like to bring that complexity too into yeah. the table. So would love to hear from you about yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Well, I can see maybe you've been reading Benjamin Bratton. Yeah, I know the stack, you know, the original version of his book, you know, like, uh, because I was the one who hired him at UCSD when he was going for the original version was like 1,600 pages. I said, Benjamin, but you keep writing the same thing over and over. Anyway, but the stack is good. Well, um, 
So uh, you're absolutely right. And I actually written two books about cultural AI already. One was 2018, AI aesthetics, one I'm writing now, and I agree. But I want to, here's what I want to say, right? So I want to come back, if you don't mind, to this very important question, right? How do we, which is a question of symposium, right? So how do I assure multiple futures of art, right? And technologies. Um, so let's face it, right? For the last 30 years, the world has been driven by forces of globalization, right? Economic globalization, social globalization, cultural globalization. Now, right, you know, with, you know like there's a rift between China, right? And the West, China, America, and Russia. And right, you know, now like seems like economically, uh, many companies, right, the governments are going to try to reverse it, right, and to bring production home because we realize like how dangerous it is to depend on China or, or it's, or for example, right, like now, right, uh, some African countries are getting their grains from Ukraine, and now, right, I mean, like Putin is going to play with games, like let let you export it, not let export you, but I don't see, right, I don't see any so far, right, I don't see any any. So any manifesto about reversing or limiting cultural globalization. And that's what I want to say, right? Uh, so as long as everybody looking at Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is, right? As long as, right, all the cultural producers, all the creators are looking at the same thing, uh, how do you measure diversity? That's a separate question, right? So in my lab, we have been trying to figure out measures of cultural diversity for years. But from a theoretical point of view, as long as everybody participating, right, looking at each other, we'll have less diversity. So it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if you have Amazonian internet or Amazonian <laughs> Photoshop, I think, right? You're looking at how people create, you'll be creating the same thing, right? Uh, and here's why, you know, because I was, I was trying to figure out, right, for, for years, because I thought when we have this cultural globalization in the 90s, it should lead to more diversity, right? But in reality, often we feel, right, there is a bit less. And, I, and I, you know, literally this year, I found argument from evolutionary biology. So what evolutionary biologists say, that, you know, there is a reason why you find incredible diversity in place, place like Galapagos, right? Ga, ga, Galapagos, wait, this island, Galapa, Galapa, no, Galapagos. 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 Yeah, exactly. So what we say is that, you know, when you have like a ecological, right, the ecological system, right, you know, you have certain diversity. But if you have one diversity, you want to have this kind of, kind of separate, right, separate niches, separate platforms. And uh, I will say something, you know, uh, half jokingly, half seriously, almost radical. We almost have to kill the internet, right? So if you want people, in, you know, let's say in Amazon, right, or Brazil produce something different, Right? You can't have them look on the Instagram. Right? And people, let's say, in Russia, et cetera, et cetera, right? which, of course, was also a terrible idea. But as long as the whole world culture, as well as the digital culture, is a single, right, single ecological platform, a single forest, we are not, I don't think we can expect lots of diversity to emerge. So if you want to assure, right, you know, the art world is a global place, right? You know, YouTube is a global place. So, again, I don't know how to approach it, right? Because we don't want to say, okay, 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 you can't look at internet in America because it will make you less diverse. But I think that I'm not sure there's any other way to assure multiple, right, multiple futures of art, of, 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 of let's say, of creativity. I don't like the word art, right? Because as long as everybody looking at everybody else, as long as we only have one forest, uh, the diversity will probably continue to decrease. Uh, so... Uh, so again, it's not a question of tools, I think, right? It's a question of what are people exposed to? And everybody exposed to the same things, uh, you know, certain things will become popular because we get more likes, and then everybody will be doing the same things, you know? So anyway, it's, it's kind of my, sorry for being a bit long, but, you know, I feel very passionate about it, right? And, I, you know, you provoke me with idea of Amazon, right? So we have, to, we have to put like a wall against Amazon and kind of say, so you, you guys can't look at internet in other countries, but of course it would be a terrible idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know, you travel a lot, so what do you think about it, right? What do you think about it? If you create Amazon AI, will it by itself lead to more diversity or do you think we need to somehow um, have people look at other examples? Uh, that's a difficult one because the probability of a country like Brazil creating an AI that is functional um, is first very hard uh, because as we know AI depends a lot on capital but second thing is about the data 
that in one thing that I find important is, is, is also about what not only about the data that we have, but the data that we don't have, right? So there are so many data blind spots that we fail yeah, sometimes sure. to realize. And that would actually make the creation of an Amazonic um, AI uh, a task that would be almost impossible, right? Because, of course, you have a lot of data about people that are on Facebook or that are on TikTok or Instagram, yeah. but you, you don't have data about what, what's really going on in, in the Amazon. And one of the reasons for that is because there is no connectivity uh, in yes. the absolute uh -huh. majority, majority of Amazon. So it's a, it's a, the data gaps, they're important from a, a geographical perspective, from a sure, social sure. perspective. There are segments of the population who basically also have uh, less data in terms of like a, what can be uh, generated out, out of that population in terms of potential and so on. So yeah. it, it's really hard because, again, uh, the, the reason that I mentioned this tech, it's not about the, the visual of the, the, that, that was yeah. formed about it, but it's about the governance of each of the okay. layers, which I find extremely mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to, to yeah. divorce or separate art uh, or even AI or technology from the governance structures that are basically uh, intertwined with the whole thing. And my side yeah. of the question is the governance side, right? So that's why I'm interested in, in these issues. But yeah. uh, of course, I, I think you, you raise very important points and uh, would love to hear more about them too. Well, 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 maybe I just want to add something briefly. So about, okay, so if you want to have Amazonian AI, we can have it tomorrow. If you want to have your own AI, because look, uh, most companies, right, because we realize that if we make software open source, it will develop, right, faster. So we don't have like open source Google engine because otherwise people will kind of play it. But stability, right, stability AI, we develop, put lots of money, we develop a stability diffusion model and we released it. And now there are dozens and dozens of free versions. And also you can take with already pre-trained models even give it like, you know, 100, 500, five your own images so you can fine tune them to your own content. I haven't tried it yet. Now you can say, left, it's not completely a solution because this kind of visual function of a network is going to remain. And I can't tell uh, how well or how what until because I have to tell right myself, right? So, uh, so, so I think what, so, so to be very, to be very practical. I think we should encourage our companies, right, to, to make their models open source. Uh, the second thing we need to do is we need to, yeah, I know, to kind of encourage, encourage to push these companies to audit, right, uh, their data, because, uh, okay, you grab 6 billion image and test pairs, right, from all over. And of course, there's going to be all kinds of biases and emissions. Uh, but I think right now the companies are just happy to make it work, uh, you know, because there has been so much pressure on technology companies in 2016, you know, so I think we will start kind of auditing the data. And what we want to do, we want to create multiple networks trained on lots of different, lots of different data sets, right? So Amazonian, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as opposed to one, right? Because I think uh, what I see now is that with uh, AI machine physics, you know, would be another tool to decrease diversity because everybody using this model, which is trained in a single data set, right? So as soon as we're, so it's not, so I think one way to create, a, create your Amazonian AI, Brazilian AI, whatever, et cetera, yeah, it's just, it's not necessarily about changing a model, but it's about training these models on different data sets where we know exactly what's inside. Uh, and also uh, I think eventually it will come uh, where more users with less technological knowledge will be, be able to, uh, train these networks themselves. Uh, right now, right, it does require a certain technical knowledge. So for me to do it, I probably have to spend a few weeks to learn it. Um, so, so I think, so I think the future, you know, I think the future would be. So I think we see some good developments. Maybe it's going to be enough. Probably not. Uh, but you know, as you know, right, Brazil was such a pioneer in open source right movement. It's, I mean, it did things nobody else did. So in fact, we ho so I'm hoping that Brazil will also show us a way. Um, and uh, as I said, creating these data sets, yes, it's expensive, but it's slowly becoming less expensive, right? 
and, and the data sets you need slowly, it will be not 8 billion, but much less. So some things definitely can happen if you kind of push for these things. Sounds very good. And yeah, I think, uh, how are we with time? Uh, probably our time is over, I guess. Time is up, yes, yes. I got already yeah. two messages. Uh, wrap it up, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, it was great. And I'm um, just sorry I'm not in person, but it was exciting enough. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. So we'll move on now uh, to uh, Jeff Shaw. Uh, who has flown from Europe this morning, I believe, to speak with us. I'm sure he'll do something else in Hong Kong. But it's a great pleasure to have Jeff back and have him speak to us this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to see you. and You decided to come on a Monday morning. Uh, some of my students... Uh, find that very difficult, very challenging, usually. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I was hesitating um, of uh, providing another title. And this title uh, would be Let There Be Light. Because according to the Bible, it is clearly the first prompt uh, that could have generated anything that was not expected. But of course, for that, we, uh, we need to know what is uh, there. So where we are and uh, what can be modified or created out of uh, quite nothing or out of chaos. And actually, this is uh, one of the topics. I, um, I decided to make a... Uh, let's say, a pretty new presentation for me. So uh, I try it with you. I don't know exactly what, how it will appear. But I'm in a specific situation because I have the show next door. And so um, I think it wouldn't be fair to show my work here. So I won't show any image. Uh, I, I won't show any... I won't present any sound, which is not me speaking or... The Anybody of you, any of you that would like to say something, ask questions or whatever. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, I have something. Normally, I have something to go to the slide, but I, I don't see it. Yeah, but I have to ask for the slide. Yeah. Yeah. May I have um, the thing that I'm supposed to use? Because usually, I have my computer and I can do. Thank you. The middle one. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, no image. Uh, where, where, uh, where am I supposed to point it? <laughs> the top. Yeah, but the computer is not here. Yeah. So the question is where? <laughs> yeah, this is what I tried, but uh, it doesn't go. Hmm? Ah, OK. So I wanted to present on my computer. I will do that next time. <laughs> I should <laughs> always <laughs> refuse to use another technology than the one I can control. So this, you see it. Next, you see it also? Oh. Yes. Great. And so uh, I, I decided, I started to work on the idea uh, that um, uh, the path uh, that leads uh, uh, people, artists, to go from one thing to another to decide to do something or not to do it is something that is determined by a kind of a conceptual uh, investigation that uh, the artist is trying to do. And so uh, I will present some of the concepts that um, are uh, in a way related to what I 
uh, I've been doing, but also related to uh, many uh, practices, many artists, uh, uh, what artist has been doing during the last 40 years, something like that. So um, the, first, uh, the first thing that I started with computer graphics, the first thing was the question of uh, uh, what happens when the image is not the result of uh, uh, representing the world, uh, reflecting the light of the sun or the light or the artificial light. Uh, actually, I don't know how I got that. So you see, I, I mean, uh, I added a fancy effect so you're not tired and you this refresh the cones and the roads and your retina. Uh, and so you, you feel comfortable with the fact to have only text in black and white or white on, on black. So uh, what I call infrarealism is uh, uh, a form of realism that is not based on how the world reflects the light. And uh, I came up with this concept when I was working on, on, uh, co with computer graphics in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, this is, this is a, uh, I think, a, a powerful concept uh, because this is, why, uh, this is how we understand why some artists now are producing generative art uh, made uh, based on uh, physical laws and uh, particles, uh, animation, or uh, all these kind of things, you know. Uh, this is uh, when you, instead of representing the surface of things, you represent, you represent the laws that control how things appear. And uh, this is what I call infrarealism, to say it's uh, under uh, what the reality uh, is actually uh, representing. So we could go further with this concept of infrarealism, and instead of uh, representing politicians, for example, we could represent the politics that are, they are actually developing. Instead of uh, uh, pretending uh, uh, working on uh, ethic, uh, we uh, apply the ethic to the practice. Virtuality is a very strong concept, uh, and um, when I say it's very strong, it's because for me it modified totally my way to uh, uh, to work and to practice. So the uh, virtuality is a required condition of the real. Uh, of course, for that we have to admit and to uh, understand that this is a capacity of the world to change continuously according to the forces or whatever uh, that could have an impact on it. So if there is no virtuality, the world is stopped before the Big, blank, the big Bang. And there is no reason the Big Bang happened because virtually it's not here. So, um, but what happened when you apply virtuality to art? That's the question, you know, we are used to have paintings that uh, the, virtual, the virtuality of the painting is only uh, how it stimulates thinking uh, thoughts in the mind of the, uh, of the onlooker. But um, the, uh, the most interesting part of uh, virtuality when you apply it to produce image or to produce sound is the fact that you uh, develop uh, the possibility of revealing content because uh, thanks to the experience. I still don't understand how this works uh, because I didn't push the button. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so it's coming anyway. Uh, so it's about the experience of things. Our experience of the world is a permanent immersion into virtuality. Our experience our experience of artworks using virtuality. Uh, I have, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm going back now. Ah, okay. It's just playing the, it's playing the slides without. Ah, you're doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next, please. <laughs> okay, I understand now. I was not in control. That's a, a permanent illusion for the artist to be in control <laughs> and for the public to say, why I can't control it, you know? 
<laughs> because it's an artwork. <laughs> okay, next, please. So you, you have seen that. Uh, so the actually, of course, uh, opposite of virtual is actual. Everybody knows that. So we are not developing that. But experiential potentiality, it's something interesting because this is how the artwork comes closer to the physical world. Uh, because it gives the opportunity of a new experience and, uh, and also of an evolution in this experience uh, that the potentiality side. Yes, please, next slide. Uh, Okay, uh, I don't know what it was next, <laughs> please. Uh, uh, next, please. So uh, that's something, uh, recently I've been asked something uh, interesting in a talk. The question was, yeah, but uh, you seem to be very interested in the process, uh, more than uh, in the artwork. The problem is the process is the artwork. We are in process. The world is in permanent process, and the world is the world. So we are not expecting something to decide that the moment the world has to be the world. And artworks are just becoming a bit like the world. Next. One of the important dis distinctions uh, we may um, uh, we may make is between the art object. You know, we are used to that. Uh, art is a, a painting is art, a sculpture is art. So that's a very, very convenient because uh, we know how to uh, sell them. And uh, now we have artworks that have a, a certain perception of the world. Uh, we have artworks that uh, may have a certain understanding of the world with a certain level of cognition. We have artworks that may ha have, uh, uh, let's say, artificial emotion. And they may also have reactions. And they can enter in a dialogue with the people. So in a way, the artwork has become closer and closer to what we call a subject. And uh, so can we see what is after it? This will help me. So first, it's dynamic. It's not necessarily static. Next. And uh, it's, not, it's not only to be seen, which is exactly what happened with an uh, art object, but more to be experienced. Next. And uh, of course, uh, the first one, uh, the art object is easier to collect. And the art subject is probably more about, uh, about knowledge, about experience, about emotion, about dialogue. Next. So for that, uh, the artist has to start doing something he, he was not used to, is to design the behavior of this subject, design the behavior of the artwork. Next. So I think it's clear. Next. <laughs> And so for that, uh, the artwork uh, may have to analyze the behavior of the public, not only to see and to acknowledge the existence of the public, but also to understand the public, to try to anticipate this. So I've been, uh, I've been creating many, many artworks, and let's say from the, when I started with interactive art and VR in uh, 92, 90, 93, 94, uh, I started working on the idea that the, uh, the public would have an impact. And I think Jeffrey will probably uh, go in that direction as well. Uh, so the interpretation, inter to interpret the behavior of the other, this is a starting point of the dialogue. And the dialogue is probably the most advanced form of interaction. Uh, when I say dialogue, I'm not only talking about, about words, but I consider that to make love or to make war is also a form of dialogue. Next. Uh, so we know how to simulate uh, many things uh, regarding, uh, regarding uh, 
converting the artwork in a subject. But uh, what is very important is not only to have a behavior or to have a reaction, but it's also to have intentions. Because this is where the meaning resides. So in the intention of the artwork. And actually the artwork is just reflecting the intention of the artist. And as we know that artificial means human made, in the specific case of an artwork, uh, that means artist made intentions. Next. Okay, this is what I said. Next. <laughs> now, because I cannot see, it, it would be very convenient if I could see it here. <laughs> okay, uh, the artwork as a society of agent. Uh, I, I have to say, in a way, I understood that quite early, but uh, it was revealed by uh, Agnes Lean, who one day told me uh, that what I was, uh, I had the feeling I was uh, uh, starting innovating in the most recent works. She said, but you already did that in the tunnel. And, and, and so that means, uh, as soon as I started working with interactive, uh, interactivity in art, I I consider it would be interesting not to have one entity interacting, but to have different entities that would uh, have different mission and different function that would act together in order to make the, the work meaningful. And this is where I talk about society of agents, because it, this is a, like a group of people. You have a composer, you have a, you have a designer, you have a librarian, you have a... Uh, you, you have a... Um, I don't know, a psychologist, uh, and uh, all, all these people work together and make the artwork. Transactional aesthetics. So that, that's, uh, of course, uh, a, a key point, and, uh, and the key point of the show uh, next door. Next, please. Oh, OK. Uh, it comes after. <laughs> so uh, next, please. So the transactional aesthetics uh, is uh, the fact to consider that the transaction, the fact that you don't, you give something and you receive something in exchange or not, uh, this, is, this is the basis of, of the dialogue and this can be the basis of the artwork itself. So, of course, I could mention Marcel Mauss and uh, all that, but uh, it's not necessary. So uh, I... I I call. Uh, I was very happy to to find that this H to H because it's so close to uh, what I consider the objective of the interaction in an artwork. It's not. It's not somebody talking with a machine. It's somebody talking to the people through the machine. So H to H. I think you're all familiar with this terminology. Uh, which is B2B, business to business, and B2C, business to consumer. Just imagine there are people that consider that you are consumers, that we are consumers. We may even think that it may be logical, but actually we, we are not consumers, we are people. We cannot define ourselves just by what we buy or what we may buy. And there are people who see only that. What do you do? I do B2C. Yeah, what do you do B2C? So tell me your name first. So H2H -H is, of course, human to human. And we consider, of course, that this is... Uh, this is uh, and the important part of the thing is how these dialogues through the machine or through the artwork can become meaningful. So transactional art, let's go. Yeah, so in, in a way, this is uh, uh, the, the ambiguity between transaction and translation is very important. So uh, when uh, I, I will develop later, uh, the idea that actually uh, the first transaction were the first translations. So uh, this is easy to demonstrate. Uh, if uh, if uh, you uh, 
want to give me three chicken for a goat, I have to remember that this is three chicken. So I put three stones in a bag and I put a sign on it. So to make the transaction possible, I have to translate it. I have to translate the thing. And then I remember that I will do, will do this even if I don't see the animal yet. And so uh, in art, uh, we are practicing kind of sim something similar. Uh, and one of the first reasons, of course, is why we use metaphors and uh, also ways to express things. We don't do the thing, we represent the thing, and the thing is not necessarily something visual. Next. So the, uh, that's uh, important also is to, uh, to understand why some artists uh, use uh, the blockchain. I'm not, I'm not gonna make a, a talk about blockchain. Next. Of course, uh, Ethereum blockchain presents an advantage which is to have the smart contract. So that means the Related is not like uh, um, a banknote. Uh, you have a financial process. You have a description in a smart contract of what will happen with the transaction. And this is like starting uh, a mechanical uh, process in a way that is automatically executed according to the score, to the financial score, which is the smart contract. Next. Oh, okay. I'm done soon. <laughs> so, uh, next, please. Uh, no, I wanted to see the previous one. <laughs> next. It's supposed to stay, it's not supposed to go. No, uh, next. <laughs> Okay, that's the same. Okay, next. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm in a very bad position to read. <laughs> you, you, you're lucky compared to me. So, uh, okay, so the blockchain as a medium, oh, but it's not the same. So, uh, <laughs> no, but it's not. <laughs> okay, the blockchain as a medium. So suddenly, where artists were more or less excluded from the world of finance, and uh, if transaction can be go through smart contracts, that means we can create processes that are related to finance, and so we cannot we can create financial processes, and so they can have a symbolic value and uh, uh, a specific meaning. And this is why suddenly it becomes a medium. Next. So, uh, of course, plenty of people consider that the, the blockchain is just, uh, thanks to the NFT, uh, it is just a white cube, virtual white cube, where uh, we can sell uh, images. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, we can do more than that. And, uh, we can escape in a way the art market and to try to have a, a pervasive artistic practice. So pervasive, I mean invading other fields uh, and these fields may be finance, politics, economics, uh, ethics, and so on. Next. The meiotic engine. So that's uh, something, uh, that's something for me which is a key in understanding many things happening in the field of AI and uh, in the field of uh, different works I've been doing during the last uh, 25 years. So the idea is that the artwork doesn't come with the truth. The artwork come uh, with the possibility to give birth to the truth which is in you. And you know this, is com this comes from Socrates uh, and Plato. And uh, it's about the midwife, uh, midlife, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> midwife uh, practice.
that to give birth in Greek, meiotic. And so uh, I've been working on, a, on different projects with a meiotic engine, so then uh, something that tried to find, help you to find something which is in you. Next. Okay, next. And, and oh, okay. Yeah, so that the, the principle for me, the meiotic engine, is to find the, the, the line of a higher slope, of a faster slope. And so this is the inclination, and uh, is uh, the way to find what you're looking for without asking. Next. Next. Next, I just say that. So the uh, conceptual uh, ecosystem is uh, where uh, things, ideas, attractions, and values exist, that is a human brain. Next. So uh, abstractions and ideas, of course, evolve, uh, evolve, evolve in time, sorry. <laughs> evolve in time, and so they can become, they can become <coughs> more sophisticated, so the, uh, I think it's better here. Next. And so the concept of neurodesign is not based on the idea of controlling something, it is based on the model of the ecosystem, of the nature ecosystem. So the natural ecosystem is very simple. Nature is not designing the world. Nature is assessing the world. So when uh, an animal comes with five legs, nature just uh, watch how it works, and usually not very well. So this thing vanished, vanishes. Next. So in a way, uh, what we forget, because we forget that uh, artificial uh, intelligence, artificial means human-made, it's too human. And we have a problem with that. Uh, we have a problem with that because then uh, we, have to, uh, we have to consider that this is not only a machine. This is a kind of concentrate of humanity, uh, which is there. And uh, when we use it to produce images or content or text, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to tame the, the crazy horse. Next. So it's not anymore about designing, about giving shape uh, uh, by controlling the shape. Next. It's something that is closer to the role of the curator. So like this uh, nature ecosystem, uh, the curator is confronted to uh, uh, to uh, things, images, artworks, and decide what is good, what is not. Maybe talk with the artist saying, okay, that's a good idea, but uh, no, don't do that, doesn't fit uh, what I want to do. And uh, uh, so the artist is actually next. The artist, uh, certainly with AI uh, based on prompts, for example, uh, practice uh, a shift in the, in the artistic practice, which is iterative curatorship. If you take Midjourney, you have four images, you select uh, one of them, and then it gives you a new path, a new way of coming closer to what you want. So this, is, this dialogue with the machine is a very... Uh, it, it new, and at the same time, we know it very well. It's about assessing, and this is why the result, uh, and uh, we can see with uh, Lev and uh, many other artists using, using AI, uh, they do very different works if they spend the time for that. So, next. We are close to the end. So, uh, we have been talking before in the debate uh, that precedes. Uh, we were talking uh, about cultural diversity. Um, we are talking about how cultural diversity can be integrated uh, into AI system. And uh, what I suggest is that uh, the 
intentional bias, the bias created by the artist in the way to, to fine tune the prompt is uh, a way to make art. It's usually a way to mean something. So in a work, if I say the image is created by an artist and the text is created by, by a hard seller uh, uh, in marketing, that's intentional and this is this confrontation that is supposed to be meaningful. Next. So machine don't have to be neutral and the artist is never neutral. Next. So augmented serendipity, another concept very convenient. You know serendipity is next. Uh, serendipity is the fact that uh, is uh, the state you are in when you find something. And here is exactly what artists do when they use AI. They find things and they find, and they find things faster. They find more things than what they expect and they discover things that are closer to what they really expect. Next. The two last concepts uh, I want to explain, next. Sublimation, for me, that's a starting point of uh, my, uh, let's say, the last uh, eight years. In chemistry, sublimation is uh, the uh, transition of a substance directly from the solid to the gas state. Uh, without passing through the liquid state. Next. But what becomes interesting is uh, if we try to trace the thing to track what happened since the origin of writing, the origin of language, we discover that sublimation is a way to convert the world uh, into uh, discrete units, uh, convert the world into something that can be treated uh, computed by the human brain or the artificial brain. Next. Next. Okay, that's... F oh, n next. It's coming. I will never do that again. <laughs> so, uh, sublimation is what we do when we convert the world into data. Next. But of course, sublimation is balanced by another intention. Next. Reification. Reification, next. Because then it will be written and I will go faster. Next. So uh, it's a concept introduced by Marx and then that, that had been developed by uh, Lukács and uh, Guy Debord. Uh, the idea uh, that uh, everything should be converted or would be converted into object because then they enter the market. Then they can become, uh, they can become uh, we can make transactions with them and we can build factory and we can produce them. Next. So it's part of the alienation process. Critical fusion, that's the last one. Uh, I developed this concept uh, as, um, as a, a way to describe, you know, playing with the word critical and fusion that uh, related to nuclear physics may be uh, problematic. Um, and that's, that's the fact that instead of uh, producing, you can go to the next, instead of producing entertainment and cosmetics for the cities and for the world, artists should start or could start uh, trying to introduce, next please, trying to introduce uh, questions and the possibility of um, and, and the possibility of uh, understand the world and its complexity. So now just next, 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 and I will talk just uh, on it. So you just uh, go uh, as fast as you can because I'm not sure you can go very fast. Yeah. So that, that the timeline you will see in the show uh, where I present the, the line of work I've done during the 40 years. Next. So you see the detail. Next. Next. And of course, what is interesting is not that. Next. It's uh, this one where you see the concept, how the concepts are connected uh, to the artwork. So I didn't decide to make artworks because of the technology. 
I decided to use the technology because I wanted to explore this concept that I've been listing now. Sorry to be long. Thank you very much, Boris. Thank you. So we'll have our last speaker for the morning, uh, Jeffrey Shaw, who, ne who needs no introduction. Welcome, Jeffrey. Okay, thank you, Osage. Thank you, Asia Society, for inviting me to join this most excellent symposium. Next. Can you do the next? Okay. Next. The shape of art is always changing. The value of art is always changing. The history of art is always changing. Consumption. Narrative. Utilization. Purpose. Interpretation. Meaning. Perception. Society. Art is always changing. Next. Next. A history of decay. Next. A history of decline. A history of deterioration. Corrosion. Replenishment, recovery, experimentation, originality, imagination, ingenuity, novelty, loss, misadventure, rupture, Bungling, defeat, collapse, disorientation, commotion, turbulence, befuddlement, fluster, puzzlement, anxiety. Apprehension, disquiet, doubt, dread, distress, expectancy, presentiment, premonition, preconception, prescience, Impatience, outlook, promise of high hopes of art. Next. So this chapter is some case studies. Next. No thing. Next. This was a monumental sculpture that I proposed in 1970 for the Schauburg Plain in Rotterdam. It was to be constructed out of massive steel letters forming the words no thing. The Greek philosopher Parmenides wrote, everything is of the nature of no thing. From the point of view of my art practice in the late 60s, the work presents itself as a paradoxical endpoint of the art object, so as to open the door to a bounteous future for art's potential immaterialities. Next. 
an imaginary museum of revolutions. Next. In 1989, the French government announced an international competition for projects to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. Next. Initiated by the Dutch artist Cheba van Teyen, we together proposed an ambitious installation that would celebrate 200 revolutions since the French Revolution, from 1789 to 1989. In the following slides, I will largely quote from the original text that we wrote for this proposal. Next. An installation that brings together replicas of 200 revolutionary monuments, at the center of which there are vending machines beside entrances to a group of interactive video disc terminals. Next. 200 monuments, statues that are conveyors of information about 200 revolutions over the last two centuries from throughout the world, now assembled in one place, all reproduced on a slightly larger than human scale by means of new digital modeling and manufacturing techniques. Next. Lofty monuments made intimate, which can be touched, and then their respective revolutionary songs can be listened to to rediscover their forgotten meanings. Next. Adjoined by miniature versions of these monuments sold in vending machines which can be held and moved like chess pieces on the board of history. Next. After choosing and purchasing a particular revolutionary monument, the visitor uses that monument as an icon and key code to enter the multimedia database which is presented on the video disc stations. In this way, visitors begin their exploration via the revolution that they have chosen. Next. A game in space and time played on interactive video disc stations. These video disc stations are located at the center of the entire installation. Next. From a computing architecture point of view, in 1989, the implementation of our interactive multimedia database was still dependent on video disc technology, together with a then cutting edge one gigabyte optical hard disk. Next. Sounds and images of revolutions from countless archives, libraries and museums brought together on video disc, their meanings heightened by electronic processes and forged into a new oneness. Using an essentially graphical user uh, uh, interface, the database is structured on two levels. Firstly, in terms of space, time and ideology, and then in the next layer, in terms of actions, what actually happened, of actors, the protagonist institutions and persons, and of motives, what were the narratives that drove these events. Next, protagonists, next, motives, next, we described the project as a conjunction of library, museum, and amusement arcade. Looking back, attaching an amusement value to art and politics was, of course, prescient. We were disappointed, but not surprised, that our project was not selected, given its extrapolation of the French Revolution to contemporary politically sensitive events. But we were invited to present prototypes of the installation in Paris at La Villette and then later in Linz. Next. 
Having invested almost a year in developing this project, we were left with 200 digital collages that we had made to represent each of the 200 revolutionary events. So I made an installation titled Revolution that incorporates all these images. Next. In this interactive laser disc work, the viewer pushes a steel bar to rotate a video screen. Turning the monitor anti-clockwise, the viewer rotates a virtual millstone and grinds grain into flour. This requires some physical effort from the viewer. By pushing it clockwise, the viewer interactively rifles through the imaginary museum's 200 images. 200 revolutions which pass in rapid succession during one single revolution of the monitor. Next. Disappearance. Disappearance is a kinetic, augmented reality sculpture that evokes and apprises the faded memory of the little ballerinas that pirouette on top of music boxes. A figure that could be described as a first-generation robot. The artwork undertakes her virtual reconstruction to the point where the forklift truck and its machineries of reproduction themselves incarnate her pirouettes. The movement of a very large CRT video monitor mounted on an industrial forklift truck creates a virtual representation of a larger than life-size pirouetting ballerina. Visible inside the motor compartment of the forklift truck is the small rotating ballerina figure in front of which a video camera moves up and down. This mechanism is electronically synchronized with the movement of the forklift itself and provides the closed circuit source for the video image of the ballerina that is seen on the monitor screen. As the forklift shifts the monitor up and down, the ballerina is presented from head to toe and when the forklift rotates, the ballerina also appears to turn. In this way, the monitor functions as a window that gradually reveals the virtual presence of the ballerina who is twirling in the same axis as the rotating forklift truck. Next. In the artwork Fall Again, Fall Better that was presented at the Shanghai Biennale in 2012, a group of computer-modeled human figures is presented on a large screen and when the viewer pulls a subway train handle, it causes these people to fall. Next. 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 In a more recent version of this work, here shown at Osage, the triggering mechanism is done by standing onto a pad on the floor. Each of these synthetic human figures is constructed according to the physiology of a push puppet. A computational model of this toy causes a characteristic disjointed behavior in their acts of falling and the resulting disorder of their bodies and limbs. This real-time algorithm causes the figures to fall differently each time so that every derangement of fallen bodies is singular and never repeats. The title of this work references Samuel Beckett's bleakly uplifting quote, Ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fall again, fail again, fail better. Failure and falling are synonyms in a language of anxiety 
that has always haunted the global consciousness. It is a discourse that travels from the metaphysics of the fall and life's mortal span via history's natural disasters and man-made calamities to include the Buster Keaton tragic comedy of our everyday mishaps. The latest iteration of this work in Germany projection mapped a long row of 20 groups of these figures on a vast industrial surface. Next. Next. These groups fell like dominoes, one after the other, into individual heaps of bodies, then rise up again together, and endlessly repeat the sequence of falling again and falling better. Next. Next. This is a first-generation augmented reality artwork that I made in Amsterdam in 1979. By rotating and tilting its CRT monitor, the viewer could find virtual objects floating about in the room. One of these objects was the word future with a question mark. Next. In my 2019 remake of this work at Osage, the question of the future remains with us today, here being presented in a panorama of Hong Kong. Next. Being in time, out of time, ahead of time, Behind the times, on time, with time, against time, beyond time, all the time, in no time, outside time, untimely, timeless before time, after time, sometime. Next. Purpose versus promulgate. Next. An art that is driven by purpose has purpose. An art that promulgates is merely driven. Next. Art and technology. Next. Originating purposes. Next. Change the relationship between the viewer and the artwork from one of passive spectatorship into one of active participant. Next. Enable the act of creation to be shared between the artist and her public. Next. Give the artwork a state of permanent impermanence via transformative interactivity. Next. Make the artistic personal a platform, a context, and an incitement for every person's embodied experience. Next. Unsubscribe the prescribed programs of consumer technology and reinscribe them in aesthetic that is, humanistically qualitative terms. Next. Redefine and reify the technological realm as the appropriate playground of Homo Ludens. Next. Lay claim. Lay claim to the technological realm 
as an appropriate space and place for the art to come. Next. Next. Decaying promulgations. Next. Representative selfies taking the place of the re-present self. Next. Immersive enchantments displacing the space of embodied experience. Next. Pandering to an attention deficit public with a surfeit of peripheral distraction. Next. Scaling up and multiplication as its compulsive strategy of distraction. Next. Machine culture going out on the town with a bang that's a whimper. Effervescent, effervescent, senescent. Next. Just give me a moment to catch up. For this atmospheric installation and performance that I made in the UK in 1969, a row of industrial smoke canisters was placed along the entire frontage of Swansea University. Next. Next. Once they were lit, these smoke canisters generated an immense thick curtain of smoke, behind which the university building completely disappeared. Next. Next. The smoke was sectioned in three different colors, white, yellow, and black. Next. Next. In conclusion, I'd like to bring this somewhat hyperbolic and volatile diversion on art history into the present with a project I'm currently working on at Baptist University together with City University and EPFL in Lausanne. Next. One component is the construction at BU of a 360-degree 3D LED visualization platform, possibly the first of its kind. Next. The project, which is funded by the Hong Kong Innovation Technology Commission, sets out to create new paradigms for the future of an immersive interactive cinema. In 2000, I wrote the following in my introduction to the Future Cinema exhibition that I conceived and curated together with Peter Weibel at the ZKM in Germany. The traditional cinema's compulsive spectacle-spectator relationship will be transformed as the growing spectrum of input-output technologies and algorithmic production techniques are applied to the digitally expanded cinema. The new cinematic platform we are creating at BU is to some extent a channeling of Bankmister Fuller's dictum. If you want to teach people a new way of thinking, give them a tool the use of which will lead to a new way of thinking. In our research, in our search for new knowledge, the Chilean filmmaker Raul Ruiz, in his book Poetics of Cinema, provided this fundamental insight. In the cinema, it is the type of image produced that determines the narrative, not the reverse. No one will miss the implication that the system of film production 
invention and realization must be radically modified. It also means that a new kind of cinema and a new poetics of cinema are still possible. Next. With that, thank you again. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, you both talked about uh, reification. Um, I'm wondering if you could expand and talk more about what that means in your practices. Maurice, you are the philosopher. You are the philosopher of reification. Uh, I'm just playing with I, words. I, I know. <laughs> you, you know, um, uh, res res in, in Latin is a thing. And reification is converting into a thing, something that is not a thing. And so um, uh, I think when Marx uh, introduced this, uh, Karl Marx introduced this concept, he wanted to say uh, that uh, the fact to commodify everything, including things that are not material at the beginning, is part of the process of uh, capitalism. Uh, to give a very simple example, uh, if uh, I talk about love, love may be something fantastic that uh, determines the relation between people. But if I tell you that real love has to be demonstrated with a diamond, and if I tell you this diamond has to represent two months of your salary, I'm quite clear about the process of reification with the consequence in terms of economy and uh, social concerns. And so everything becomes like that. So you, you convert into something and then you have to work to um, demonstrate your love and you don't see the loved one. And uh, so that reification is very interesting because this is what the artist is doing all the time giving shape to ideas, making objects out of that. This is what we have been using. This is what we have done until now. Uh, we have made sculptures, we have made uh, paintings, and, and we have reified our thoughts. And then it became a good way to communicate with other people and also to market our work. So that's, that's something uh, that we have to... Um, and that we have to consider. Jeffrey, would you like to add something? <laughs> no, it's perfectly fine, perfectly clear. Can you speak up? Speak up, loud. Can you give an example? Can, can we have a mic for that? Um, can you give an example of, of that process in your own work? Maybe Jeffrey, where you've reified something, an idea. What was that process like? How is it accomplished in practice? Um, I mean, I just basically will follow in the in uh, Maurice's thread of thought, and as he points out, uh, in his sort of definition is argument basically the artistic process of what is one of reification of um, feelings thoughts ideas giving giving form giving shape yeah and um, I think that um, it's especially pertinent in the context of uh, Maurice's current exhibition here at um, the Asia Society because he's Next literally <laughs> literally going from thoughts from brain to to object to image yeah so he's making that that um, that translation or that conversion uh, very very explicit uh, so maybe I, I can follow up this a uh, very interesting question of the of the reification because the reification that the, the term Marx uses is uh, the distinction is to make something a thing so not only object but also a thing but Jeffrey start with no thing. You start your 
presentation with Meon, with Parmenides Meon, the no thing, or sometimes translated uh, as nothing. But you also, uh, at the end, you also make, um, towards the end, uh, you also show your work at the uh, uh, Schwanze with smoke, with something that we cannot really see. It is uh, uh, really defined, its shape, its, um, its form, and so on. So it's also more than a thing, or less than a thing. So you start from, let's say, you start from no thing, and you move towards things, and then finally move to more than a thing or less than a thing. So I'm, I'm wondering how you, you know, you, 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 you apparently have a quite different uh, uh, understanding of uh, reification in the term, in the way that Maurice uh, thinks. So I'm wondering if you can, you can say. Okay, so, well, if I, t I'll try and pick up that th the thread of thought. Um, Look, I, don't, I just I don't want it to sound too. Uh, uh, it, I, I want to. I don't want it to sound sort of um, uh, exaggerated. But um, I was always touched by um, that moment in history when Malevich painted the black square, because in a way he was basically saying this is the end of painting but that the of course what is so uh, significant about that g gesture is that at that moment painting can start again by bringing something to an end you can basically relaunch painting and actually painting has a, a very um, let's say uh, prolific history after it's after Malevich brought it to conclusion and um, to some extent you, that work, that installation, and in, in uh, well, I, I just, in retrospect, look at that work that I proposed f in Rotterdam, as an as exactly a point where I decided to stop trying to paint or make objects in a in a in a, that were for me at that time. I mean, just talking about my own art practice, just simply based on precedent. Yeah. And uh, from that moment on, it was the possibility of going, well, actually it opening a new direction. Well, the new direction were, were all the air, the pneumatic structures, uh, all the inflatable structures, which uh, were then, let's say, this um, research into a new immateriality of what the object could be. So it's still remaking things. And uh, for me, the two things that go very well together are this massive, let's say, potentially potential sculpture, steel sculpture, nothing, and then the water walk, which is this balloon, which has no life in itself as an object, unless somebody is in it and walking in it on water. So transforming the object into something which is then a performative um, a performative, um, let's say, uh, allowance, yeah? Uh, as the words I used then was creating situation of opportunity. An opportunity for someone to have to exploit the artwork as a means of walking on water, right? It just opened a big door. Okay. Yeah, I think you, you. I just w would like to add, uh, add something. Uh, I think you create uh, the possibility mm -hmm. of experiencing something that is uh, different from just uh, enjoying an object from outside, and it's also immersive as well. <laughs> as well. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sure. Scott wanted yeah. to. Say yeah. Um, I don't want to inject a moment of, pr of pessimism into this boundless optimism that we've had for the last. Uh, couple hours or three, but I'm wondering, and maybe I'm thinking about, uh, well, you have future, but it was at the time of punk. You had this future with a question mark at the moment of punk in, in England, which is about no future, if you remember, yeah. And the, um, the array of fied object is also the killing of the use value in the exchange value, yeah. And I thought the Lev's Lev's uh, presentation 
was was incredible at the beginning, because there were these these deathscapes, you know, of the cities, in uh, Ukraine, and Russia, and even his own his own evocation of his past, was of a bit of a uh, a landscape, you know, a, 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 a landscape that was a um, uh, an end of the world type landscape, and which made me also think of Chao Fei's art, Chao Fei who I was meant to present it just before, uh, before lockdown at the Serpentine. And um, there's something, a, an evocation of technology, right, in Tiao Fei, which is also a lifelessness, yet there's a wonder <laughs> at the same time. I, wouldn't miss, I don't know if it's a rebirth. So you know, I think that you guys in some ways are saying this kind of stuff, you know, that there are kind of dead objects or post objects, you know, that come to life in a different way. But I think it's really the idea of future, no future. Both hang into it. I don't know, just a little bit of speculation about the, um, the life and death that come into this. Um, death drive, life drive at the same time. And maybe it is always a cycle, as, as Maurice was saying, in a way, that the life drive incorporates the death drive. I remember a conversation with Bernard Stegler, who was saying that. So um, I wonder if you guys could go, go into that a little bit. Um, the, 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 you know, reifications, the killing of use value and exchange value. And then, and then the kind of end of the object. And then the kind of wonder, you know, in a very positive sense, that can also come out of that. I think what what uh, I react to that. Uh, what you say about uh, the use value and the exchange value is also related to this question of reification, because we uh, directly, um, as we see now with the NFT thing, uh, we are in a situation where people uh, can distribute, sell, uh, resell uh, artworks. Uh, to people with a, that get a certificate, which is a certificate of ownership. That means you have a certificate that you own a certificate. Or the use, you can say that you own the ownership, but you cannot say that you have the thing. So there is no specific use associated related to that. And, and the, you, you, you know the people's work uh, that has been sold, 69 million. Uh, U.S. dollars. I have it on my computer. You can have it tomorrow, today. Just download it. And so there is no re direct relation between the use of an object that we would have in hands and uh, actually the, the ownership of this object. So for, for me, a good image to represent that is... Uh, uh, what is his name? Uh, Lichtenberg a knife. You know, the, uh, he developed this concept, I think, in the 18th century, Lichtenberg. And, and uh, Lichtenberg knife is a knife without blade uh, where the handle is missing. So this is sublimation. Because the concept can stay in your mind, and even if you describe it, it says it doesn't exist. That was my. <laughs> I loved a Lichtenberg knife. <laughs> it's not something new that has been created for the NFTs. You know, it's three centuries ago. A left has a has a question online. So you both have been working with uh, technological media for a very long time. In my case, a bit shorter, and uh, right to me. Uh, one of the key question, one of the key problems, right? The questions when you work with technological media, especially if it involves representation, right? Realism, level of detail, uh, is that you know what looks amazing one day, right? Looks a bit almost sometimes embarrassing the next day. Yes, the concept remains, uh, but uh, kind of visual level of detail or you know audio, it continues to advance. And uh, at some point, like this year, 
I said, you know, I want to maybe do something which will still look good in 50 years, 100 years. So my drawings, which I made in my 20s with pen on paper, we don't age, right? With technology, it doesn't age. But everything else I've done with computers right? and many other people, we can't even look at these works, right? So that's why I chose this very conservative path of making images with AI, which more or less would look like my drawings. Um, and I see Jeffrey can be doing his earlier works. Um, but obviously, you know, you both are amazing examples of artists who were taking new, new technologies. And I think somehow, <laughs> um, but do you have some, I mean, so what is your relationship? I mean, what is your personal relationship to this issue of technological evolution and technological obsolescence uh, since the work of all of us in digital art field so much depends on this media, which continue to change? Sorry, it was a long question. But, uh, and Levy, you also yes. talking about the difference between um, works on paper, which have uh, a level of permanence, and works that are mediated, which are impermanent. Is that what you're t talking about? Well, not, not permanence in terms of material, but permanence in terms of resolution, right? You know, the drawings of Rembrandt or, you know, or paintings by Bosch, Right? We look as beautiful today as we look at the 15th century, but the computer graphics from 90s don't look so amazing, right? Um, so there's something about technological media where new developments uh, make old look right not as amazing. Um, yeah. So one right one solution is to remake one one one's works over and over. But I wonder what our what you know what I wonder what your own personal relationships to this. Okay. I have to say that it, it, the question is a bit of a Pandora's box because it, it opens up many, many questions. Um, and one of the questions is, is the Rembrandt, the original Rembrandt, as it was when it was painted, the same Rembrandt that we are looking at today? Yeah. Um, in other words, has it survived? Uh, you know, because one can also argue that the Rembrandt we are looking at today, even though it appears to be the same painting, and is the same painting at a certain level, it's not the painting, it's not the way, it's not the painting that was seen at the time it was painted. Um, in terms of media art, right, it's true that a work made in the, let's say, in the 80s or 90s may look dated today, unless you are, let's say, an art historian who understands the context in which that work was made and can appreciate it uh, in the context of, that, of the technology of that time. I mean, the, the, the Imaginary Museum of Revolutions looks quite crude now because it was built around a video, te video disc technology and, cert and certain significant limitations in the graphics. But I don't believe that that in any way uh, compromises its, um, its viability uh, as uh, something that can be appreciated. And um, it would be a misunderstanding to look at that work and say that it's not up to date. Uh, in terms of its that, that it's not somehow s s sufficiently satisfying um, in terms of its uh, appearance. Um, um, I hope I'm making myself clear. I just spent the whole night flying from Europe, so I'm a little jet lagged. So, um, but still. Yeah, may, may I? Oh, sorry. But it's it's really. I think it's 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 uh, it's especially because. Um, the evolution of these technologies is so quick and uh, indeed um, a work like well let's see if I take one work like Points of View from 1983 which was made with an Apple II computer and which uh, maxed out at a hundred straight lines in black and white uh, ref you know refreshing at 15 frames per second I mean, it's true, you, to be able to appreciate that, you'd need to be able to relocate yourself in time to some extent. Um, 
But it can still be appreciated now as long as you're not in a way jaded by the um, by the noise of the stuff that's going on at the moment. Um, I think it's still possible to be a minimal painter and it's still possible to be a minimal media artist. <laughs> uh, I would like to, to, to add a few things uh, because for me there are two questions in your question. So each one being a Pandora box, as you say. Uh, wh one is how do we receive aging, uh, uh, let's say, computer or technology-aided uh, uh, artworks? Uh, so that, that question, we can reply to it. It's very difficult to answer for, because we have to relocate ourselves. But uh, it's interesting to see how people are excited uh, by, uh, I, I'm thinking about the young people, exciting excited by seeing the very early computer graphics with eight colors. Uh, and, and they start working again with that, with very low resolution and so on. And it's become trendy and there's this kind of nostalgia for a time they haven't done and so on. But, uh, uh, however, I would like to um, uh, answer to the second question, uh, which is, uh, that is totally related, is how the technology evolving very fast modify or alter our practice. And uh, I think it's a very important point. This is why I've been focusing on the concept because I thought, okay, uh, they go through the technology. What you want to do sometime is something you would like to do, but uh, the technology is not ready or <laughs> the technology doesn't exist anymore. And, and, but it doesn't mean that your intention is very different. And I think it's a very important thing because in a way you can say that the technology is not, in, is not ahead of us, but behind us. And it's just reflecting what we would expect. And, and, and we know that people, for example, creating fictions, science fiction, are actually designing our world. They design our future because uh, all people developing technologies just try to do, they just try to make real what they've seen in a movie, read in a book. Uh, and so this, uh, th this is a kind of uh, reverted uh, process, reverse engineering. Uh, and and uh, we, uh, I think it happened to you as it happened to us. We have been asking for more. Uh, from uh, the tool we have been using. We wanted to do something that we're not able to do. And when I was doing the Quarks, which is an animated computer graphics series, I was dreaming of the real time. I wanted it in a VR. But the VR was not ready for that. <laughs> and, and so uh, everything, and then it, it arrived and I had to think about something else because the content w was different, but the intention behind, the intention, and the concept I was trying to explore and to develop, uh, this didn't change so much. My references now are the same that I had uh, 40 years ago, very often. I'm just also trying to understand uh, the impact of technologies on society, which is the present. Oh, I just want to add one other uh, aspect uh, to that question, and that is that um, I think as artists working with these technologies, uh, you you immediately encounter their, uh, their limitations. Um, and two things happen at that point. One is you, by encountering the limitations, you already know where it's going. You, it's, already be it's already clear that these limitations are temporary. And that uh, that it's moving in the direction where these where one day these limitations will disappear. So in a way, you are starting to model uh, a future, um, but at the same time, uh, your let's say obligation as an artist is to make work in the present that is relevant to the present, which means at the same time you need to accept these limitations and transform those limitations into something which is aesthetically viable. 
okay? And um, if I look back at the history of, of media art uh, uh, and look at works done by, by the community of media artists, the, only, the thing that really counts for me is the extent to which at any moment in time an artist has been able to forge a totally successful, aesthetically successful, conceptually successful work, irrespective of what the technological uh, constraints were. And even, you could say the other way around, the victory of the work is its victory in relation to those constraints, taking on those constraints. Yeah, uh, again, taking on the constraint in 1983, of making a work with a hundred straight lines in black and white at 15 frames per second. I mean, what can you do with that? <laughs> you, can make, you can still make a work with that. Thank you both for wonderful answers, which provide different perspectives. Um, and I think your work will always remain relevant because you had such strong concepts that you know, the concepts I think would make it you know relevant you know for decades to come thank you both so much for engaging with this, i think challenging questions for all of us can i add a little anecdote uh lev because when i was listening to your uh, talk i was suddenly remembering something which you may be familiar with too it was i think somewhere in the early 80s that uh, nicholas negroponte wrote an essay which was titled The Return of the Sunday Painter. Did you ever come across this mm -hmm. essay? Yes, yes, I remember. And I, I mean, I found it interesting because exactly at that moment I was making some artworks using the first paint box systems. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that first generation of paint box where you could basically draw with computers and, uh, I mean, they were very crude systems. But um, there was a moment in history when indeed uh, Negroponte and others imagined that this would open the door to everybody becoming a painter, right? And, uh, and indeed it was kind of, uh, I mean, it was like everybody can be an artist finally, but the computer lets you do it. But actually the paint box wasn't yet the, uh, the, the platform that really liberated everybody to be an artist. But... I have the feeling or the, the suspicion that possibly these more recent um, AI-driven um, strategies may indeed finally let everybody become artists. What do you think? Uh, I think uh, Lev made a, a good demonstration that uh, you can do something very personal with an AI. Of course. Uh, and this is what I, I try to express with the concept uh, of myotic and so on, something coming from you. And uh, what is interesting is, yes, everybody can take a pencil and make a drawing. Everybody can use AI and make prompts. And, and, and will generate images more and more sophisticated. Yes, it's true. But when you see the artists who made, like Lev, thousands of pictures uh, on these tools in a very short period of time, that means during the last month, two months, three months, four months, that's it. Don't imagine that this, is started, this kind of thing started one year ago, two years ago, ten years ago. No, it's now. It's now. And, and you, there are people you can immediately recognize this is their work. You can immediately say, oh, this one is done by this guy, this one is done by this guy, this one is done by this guy. As soon as you can say that, yeah. you, can, you can do exactly what we do with uh, curating artworks, painting, drawings, everything. Everybody can make drawings if you are considered as artist's work. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, Jeffrey, I, I have just a historical question about Namjoon Park, uh, because his work, um, I'm thinking of, he did a work in 67 called Etude, um, in which he <coughs> makes a very clear distinction between, um, between you know, the idea of the code, the concept, the artistic concept, and, and, and the code uh, in terms of 
um, what's referred to um, as being um, well the the use of the the use of the code um, which he was using um, computational media because he was working at Bell Lab, mm -hmm. and I just wondered whether you had seen Andrew Park's work. I mean, from that time, and what your response to his work was, or is. I'm trying to place the work. I don't. Yeah. I don't recognize it just from the from the title. Right. And but he's talking about c computer code. Is that yeah. right? Computer yeah. code. Computer yeah. code. Yeah. I and mean, he's making a very clear distinction between the artistic concept and the computer code. Yeah, but I think it's not just black and white because I think all of yeah. us as as media artists there is code and code. There's code which we which is just given to us, so industrial code, just tools which you're taking on. So I mean what is it? Could be Photoshop, could be Unity or or whatever. These are just the code sort of in code that is gener is sort of industrial available. And then there's code which is custom developed that is tailored to the work you're making. In that respect, that code is actually, you know, Im embedded in the artwork, belongs to the artwork, and as much is as much part of the artwork mm -hmm. as whatever whatever other features it's got. So one can't just say code is this and artwork is that. It depends. The code is either industrial code, yeah, or it's code that you've you've or it's custom code which you've developed yourself that is specific to that work. Because i got to say that um, if there's, I mean, Namjoon Pike is amazing, as, as you know. And um, I was about to ask the same question in a different way. Uh, in terms of, of media art that lasts forever and ever and ever, you have to say Namjoon Pike, right? Among maybe one or two others. And the, um, it's funny because when I first learned about me, media art, 23, 24 years ago, Rotterdam, um, I kept asking the question for a while, is it media or is it art? But now I can see that it's art, <laughs> but it's also media. But um, Nabjun Pike does his early kind of hardware art and its connection to um, Cage and the kind of music coming out of Germany mm -hmm. at the time is bloody incredible. Um, and it lasts forever, somehow. I mean, the Pike show at the Tate, I did a piece on UNM um, that's appearing finally, um, that um, was hardware art largely, I, I reading in certain ways. And I'm wondering um, <clears throat> how, um, th and there are some cases of that. Um, and Because uh, it is art, and it should last. And somehow Lev's, there, there's a sadness to some of Lev's stuff that came through. I thought your revolutions piece um, and, and some of your others are um, I'm, I'm the kind of things that um, we're asking these kind of questions. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, I think there is. It, it is art, first of all. Finally answered, you know. And secondly, uh, as, as this thing from just an experiment in media, same for you, Maurice, completely. Um, and that's right. Um, and um, it is hard to make. It is hard to, for us to um, have a discourse of, um, you know, what is in it. Maybe you're, you're asking the right kind of questions about the personalization. Um, somehow that that, that two hundred revolutions piece was that in your in your Osaj show as well? I don't think it was. Was it? No, yeah, I think so. The two hundred revolutions, which is pretty mind blowing stuff. Um, it's got to last forever in a certain way. Um, I just wondered if you could. Um, if you guys could just elaborate on that a little bit. And maybe, you know, Pike is, again, the perfect example, isn't he? Although a lot of his hardware, he put, you know, it's the hardware in, in this kind of nature settings. You know, and the, and, and the uh, cellist and the pianist, topless pianist, reminds you of Valley Export, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, I just wonder, there, there's something there that um, you know, maybe comes out of that original synthesis, too, for Peter Weibel and you and some others. That will always be. Sorry, I hate, I'm going on and on. But uh, and I'll stop. But I, I just wondered if, if you, uh, if the two of you guys could elaborate a little bit more. Maybe even Lev come back on um, on 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 the on, on the stuff that's uh, the the art of media art, as it were. Um, and uh, I think the Pike example is a good one. But I think there's something in both of your work. Maybe Lev's.
maybe. Yes, definitely love's work. Uh, it's not just saying that it's love. It's saying that it's, it's evocative in a certain way. Because um, love can be superficial and it can be evocative. Uh, sorry. Not that you guys can ever be superficial. Carry on. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm thinking about di different things in, in parallel. You follow your, <laughs> your, your thread. Uh, we, we, can, we can do that. Uh, there, sometimes students uh, ask me uh, how I recognize how I recognize uh, a good artwork, and um, I have a standard answer for that. I say it's very simple. I immediately have the feeling that I will remember it in ten years. That's simple answer. I have this feeling. Then after, I can explore why. <laughs> I can wonder why. So in, uh, with Namjoon Peik, you can see that you cannot say that all the works uh, are, uh, remain strongly, except visually at the retinal level. But the most conceptual one are probably the one we will remember. Mm -hmm. After, it's more industry and business. And so you, you can notice that, you know, a very simple thing it did at the beginning with magnets, with Buddha, with a camera and close, uh, closed circuits system and so on. So that, that always, there are things that you know you will remember them mm. because they are definitely strong. And, uh, and there are other things, okay. So it's not directly related to the technology, it's related to uh, the, the fact that you have constantly to renew yourself, um, just not to be bored. So exactly, exactly in that line, I, was, uh, I would go in the direction of saying, well, how do I recognize an artwork? Or uh, well, recognize a contemporary artwork? I would say, well, if you want to make something that uh, well the first criteria would be I need to be surprised and not just superficially surprised I need to be to look at something which I never expected would be an artwork in other words it basically offers me something which does not belong to the history of art in a sense in other words it's not predicted though in retrospect of course you can see how it is predicted because it's almost impossible not to make something that isn't anchored in the past but still at a certain moment you can offer something which you never thought was art before and suddenly it becomes art it becomes part of the history of art and this is i mean if i think of all the superstars of uh, of art making that's what they did they they created something which took art in a new direction in an unexpected direction yeah. um so that for me if, if i would say well, what does a student need to do to make a, a work of art they would have to surprise me now surprising me is not that easy because I mean, surprising any professional is not that easy because you immediately see how it, everything is connected to everything. Yeah, but every now and then um, we can be surprised. Yeah, of <laughs> course. This happened. Okay. Well, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Uh, thank the four uh, speakers this morning, and thank you very much for coming and participating. And look forward Bye, to your presence this afternoon. So, thank you very much for this presentation. And I'm very glad to uh, be here in, in Hong Kong for the past time. And uh, I'm uh, very impressed by the so vividness of uh, conversation that we started uh, today. So I will so, uh, pass to my presentation. <coughs> So, uh, because my English is very poor, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm French-speaking people, so <laughs> I'm not very sure of my, my English uh, so language. So I uh, wrote my text in left side of uh, the, the slide, and so you can, you can read the slide to uh, follow my, my talk. And I will ex explain the why the illustration 
my 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 topic. <coughs> so, um, in so and uh, in uh, as as title, I so I titled that as a slide, so you can you can follow the topics of my my talk. <coughs> So I will I will uh, start my my talk. Uh, um, but first of all, uh, the division nature uh, versus society, well, nature versus culture. This is not uh, evident now. So we never have been uh, modern. Said uh, Bruno Latour, uh, who died last month, and uh, my talk uh, is a little bit. Uh, 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 modest, my modest uh, uh, tribute to his work. We have never been modern. It's a paradoxical and uh, complex statement that I will try to discuss in a moment. But right now, I'd like to raise a question. Today, are we not suffocating in the bubble I mean a greenhouse effect of the Anthropocene, like that bird trapped in the uh, glass bowl of the air pump, uh, whose, uh, oh, whose uh, so experiment by Boyle marked a starting point for Latour's reflection on techno-scientific constitution of the modern modern world in its dichotomy of nature and society, or nature and culture. Now we are so harassed, harassed by uh, anti-museum uh, so protest, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> And uh, art and uh, the museum are also so thus challenged in this disputation because uh, because ecological activists, as you know, sprinkle tomato sauce on the flames of work of art. I think I understand like that. That is not uh, attack on work of art, but on the flame of work of art. And uh, so uh, criticizing the indifference of a museum for complicity with the Earth's greenhouse effects. They would think that the Earth has now become a kind of boiled glass bowl with suffocating bars inside. In L'Occurrence, it is it's our what the situation we are bad <laughs> trapped in the bubble of a uh, greenhouse the white uh, cube of the museum could hardly deny the resemblance to the problematic uh, neutrality of scientific laboratory the question of art is indeed questioned in the same context, uh, one could say, I think, needless to s explain the image, you know. And uh, I have no, uh, so personally, I have no particular sympathy for this type of action. But I'm intrigued to know why it angered so much the British Home Secretary who blamed the Guardian's near readers, Guardian leader and lead, leading public, it is my case also, <laughs> uh, for eating tofu, for tofu eating, it is my case, <laughs> uh, which is uh, so which is also my case, so, and contaminated by workism. I see a reflex, uh, reflexive and organicist moment of certain modernity at stake in this disputation. 
in this respect, um, oh, in this this in this respect, instead of meat uh, tofu eating, uh, Chinese people are tofu eating, uh, Japanese also. I will propose later to force the doors by talking about uh, uh, instead of tofu uh, of takuan eating. I don't know if you know you eat takuan here. Takuan is uh, fermented pickled daikon radish, uh, thus occupying the fermented rotten pole of the famous culinary triangle, according to Levi Strauss. Daikon, so radish, is thus a quasi industrial object whose paternity is legendary attributed in Japan to the Zen monk Takuan Soho, the name Takuan. This Zen master was, moreover, a demonstrator of the material evidence of the air in 17th century Japan, an experiment thus, uh, that was uh, more or less contemporary with Boyle's experiment, but in a completely different metaphysical context, since he wanted to prove the existence of ki, the air, or ki, chi here, uh, in, ki in Japan, <laughs> uh, in, in the sense of cosmic neo-Confucian dualism of li, uh, so patang, and ki, chi, in Chinese Japanese uh, metaphysics. We will raise this question of ki, so uh, meaning it's uh, vapor, air, or bless, that's also aura. In the, dis in the discussion, discussion of experience of atmospheric media and art, atmospheric media and art. So you have a daikon illustration and the Zen monk dai uh, Takuan here. You know this person, you you know very well this politician 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 <sighs> so to state this this so this problematic i will turn back in history mm. our context today is a post cybernetic society our environment is almost totally cybernetic, but why doesn't this end up suffocating us? History move, moves forward in a spiraling regression. The, so historically, the, the Delos Conference convened by Doxiadis in 1960s, who propose the acoustics, a human settlement science, that this conference was attended by Margaret Mead and McLuhan, and the human expansion, expansion theory would have been discussed in the context of cybernetics. H. Sobula, who are an uh, urban planner, whose principal uh, urban planner who designed the master plan for reconstruction of the city of Tokyo after World War II, part participated from Japan for the first conference, and followed by Kenzo Tange. He's the most important architect of the post-war Japan. Uh, at the third conference in 1965. In his uh, plan for Tokyo 1960, the network city was already being planned 
as a metaphor of the organism, the information society, Joho uh, Kashakai, that is uh, uh, the word cure, was coined by Japanese scholar, as a metaphor for the, the organism. Uh, so the, the, the information society ha, uh, was being discussed in this context, and the metabolism of the uh, metabolism of the proliferating organismic city was being discussed in this context, in this conference. In Tokyo, in the 1960s, the cybernetic city is so was already uh, in view. You have the so plan uh, plan for Tokyo, 1960 by uh, Tange, or, and the construction which exists uh, today uh, today. That is the National Gymnastics of Tokyo Olympic 1964. A very beautiful construction by Tange Kenzo, designed by Tange Kenzo. This urban conception is organicist. The city is conceived as a living organism in growth, a conception which could easily be uh, so uh, rooted in the Japanese organicist philosophical tradition and could prolong the biopolitical uh, discourse of the imperial Japan. My talk is not about uh, Tange Kenzo, but uh, for the second generation of this uh, Japanese architecture. In the wake of so, Tange's cybernetic town, Arata is, is Arata Isozaki, born, born 1931, uh, his direct disciple, and uh, then Tange's most uh, critical challenger, uh, would develop the experimentation of his uh, conception of cybernetic city. You have the Mito uh, Art Museum here, the plan for Mito Museum. In this uh, manifest like, uh, in his manifest like uh, essay, The Invisible City, published in 1967, so before the book by Italo Calvino, but because Italo Calvino, it is 1972. Uh, so Isozaki identified four stage in the transition of the urban uh, design method. The substantive phase in which architectural form was directly connected with urban planning. Secondly, the functional phase in, uh, extracted by CIAM, CIAM, and the structural phase which began so for him with Tange to be made consciousness, conscious in the 1950s uh, and was so in 1960s, now shifting to the symbolic and the semiotic phase which is only now beginning uh, thus to uh, be developed. So uh, yesterday I visited uh, your very m m so wonderful museum uh, so here, uh, M plus. So I uh, so discovered this movie exposed in the museum. So I filmed this uh, uh, so this, this image, is, that is, uh, is, he is so, Isozaki. <clears throat> this cybernetic city, in the sense of uh, Isozaki, should, on the one hand, have developed self-learning feedback in the human-machine interface with the hardware part with interchangeable and mobile devices 
on the other hand, the city should have been simulated through an abductive progression of symbol-studded schemes. The invisible city could have been established at the interface so between cybernetics and semiotics or informatics and semiotics. So semantic question is very important. The conception of the cybernetic city was so tested at the occasion of Expo uh, 70 uh, at Osaka. In this conception, uh, in his conception of festival's place, that is the plan for festival's place of Expo uh, 70 Osaka, designed by so Isozaki. Uh, you have so we have no, not time for uh, so uh, discuss about that, but there are, there are already robots etc etc to make interf interface. Uh, and Isozaki was considered as one of the representative figure of postmodernism in Japan. In the so following years, so 1980s and 90s, uh, 90s, it is fundamental to know that the issue of postmodernism modernism in Japan was played uh, played out on this interface between cybernetics and semiotics. Hence, the alignment of postmodern architects and the urban planner with uh, deconstruction and the post structuralism. In Western deconstruction, in Western, if Western deconstructionists were concerned with the Platonic Kora as Eisenman or Jacques Derrida, of course, the Japanese, uh, starting with uh, Isozaki, opposed uh, the concept of ma, uh, ma with uh, this uh, so Chinese character. I had an interview with uh, so uh, Isozaki on this question of ma, how ab how the, he conceived this uh, so neuro and uh, new concept about its uh, so invention and inspiration. You have the so Eisenman here, the, uh, the leader, and the Mars, that is the exercise, uh, cover of the uh, uh, catalog of Exposition Ma uh, in, in 1978. Uh, so I interviewed Isozaki about this uh, logic of uh, subt subtraction that I will explain uh, so in my talk. As you can read here, so I explain, uh, that is a quotation of his uh, talk. Historically, he said, Japan has had never uh, so neither this concept space time or architecture. Space, so in Japanese, modern Japanese, that is ku kan, ku, void, and kan, but with the character void and ma. Time, that in Japan, modern Japanese language, jikan, I think uh, in Chinese, that uh, modern Chinese, uh, that is the same. Mm -hmm. But the uh, invention by Japanese translation is uh, to uh, added, uh, so to add ma to void and to ma to chronos. Mm -hmm. That is a translation by Japanese of uh, modern Western concept of time and uh, space. Mm -hmm. So. She explains, they uh, were only translated, these terms were translated in 19th century 
It is almost a neologism. There are uh, co implications in this gap. When I was uh, thinking about how to communicate this to the outside world, I came up with the idea of ma. So the translating the uh, Western concept uh, made him uh, discover the uh, other paradigm of con the other conceptual paradigm that was uh, had never been existed uh, before the modernity. Mm. On their philosophical background, so they he discussed about this question about with Foucault and Derrida, who had read Kant, understood immediately stakes. So uh, this logic of discovery of the ontological difference that one suddenly discovers translating modernity, that is uh, what I call the sub subtracting, subtracting of the modern, of the modern. One supplements the modern concept to translate them into a system of another logical tradition. And this gives an opportunity to discover a new logic that has never, had never existed in any tradition. That is the logic of this uh, discovering. An analogous experience gave birth to uh, another more old, older generation, to Nishida Kitaro's famous logic of Basho, the place, uh, subtracting from the translation of the Greek philosophy of Kola, Platonic Kola, Nishida discovered the Basho, the place. Why subtraction so? The operation here is complex. In order to translate the metaphysic of the other, one creates a conceptual supplement. And once the translated proposition or translated concept is made, it reveals the uh, so un sort, l'un pensé, je dirais en français, of the metaphysics, which was underlying the translation, and one then removes the prerequisite in order to renovate the conceptual field. That is this operation of subtraction, metaphysical subtraction. So, in this, uh, it is, in my sense, in this, uh, so, uh, oh. it is in this context, oh. Oh. <laughs> it is in this context that uh, the historical work of Fujiko Nakaya, Fog Culture, and the Experiment by uh, EAT, experiments in art and technology in the Pepsi of Pavilion of the same Expo 70 are uh, inscribed. Between cybernetics and semiotics, the place for artistic experiments was to be integrated into the interface of Isozaki's Invisible City. Nakaya's Fog Sculpture is a political work in the context of the time, the Vietnam War, or industry air pollution in Japan, and the contamination of the sea environment in Minamata, etc. It is necessary to situate in this precise context the precursory 
work of the environmental art of EAT. I think that is my interpretation. Uh, now we are so uh, that is so uh, 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 half century ago. Uh, now we are in the twenty first century, and we are in the post cybernetic society. The post cybernetics in this case meaning that we are not only surrounded by cybernetics tools, industrial hybrid objects of the last appearance of the 20th century, but we live in spheres of life where cybernetics, cybernetic bubbles, as the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk reminds us. Each person now blesses air at the level of his or her skin medium. The being in the world of the first quarter of the uh, century is that of being in the bubble that self-regulate by communicating with others in network. To think this condition, the atmospheric art uh, could serve us as guide, and undoubtedly the Asian categories could be put to profit to conceptualize this problematic. Okay. This is the meaning of my subtitle in an Asian paradigm with a quotation mark, with an interrogation mark. Indeed, nothing is less predicable and calculable than air, and nothing is more local and unpredictable than fog. Fog is a micro-atmospheric phenomenon specific to the place, so Basho, perhaps in the sense of Nishida. Now, if this is so, why not uh, uh, so draw uh, knowledge from the rich reservoir, reservoir, reserve, I don't know, <laughs> rich reserve of Jap uh, Chinese thought to rethink about the air show? Mm. Why not think about the reconceptualization? So uh, it is a translation, subtraction in my sense. Uh, so, the conceptualization of the key, for example, we would then have to go back to the story of Boyle's experiment and uh, ne re negotiate the modern constitution of the division of nature and culture. As I began, I was referring to Bruno Latour. He was talking about the parliament of things, Bachelman de Schultz, concerning the hybrid object that modernity has not ceased to proliferate in order to invest modern industrial life. In order to reconsider this situation, the French philosopher said, we must convene the parliament of things, that the network be re-established and the, the actors, so agent, recalled. It is time for this, uh, to, it is time for this call to be heard. Artists have, without any doubt, their part to play. So, thank you for your attention. Right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ishida-san. So, um, now we have our second speaker, uh, Scott Lash. Uh, Scott is, um, was a professor at the uh, um, Girls in the College in London, uh, world-known sociologist and a cultural theorist. Uh, 
And I also, I, I also must mention that 12 years ago, I met uh, Ishida-san through Scott Lash and, uh, during a conference, and I ordered a taxi for Ishida-san to go to Heathrow Airport. So um, I hope Scott will resolve uh, his technical problems, since I have been helping him since 17 years. <laughs> Now someone else can help him. So uh, um, Scott is going to give us a talk with the title The Anti-Algorithm, Organic Materialism and Chinese Techniques. Right. Right, perfect. Um, uh, well, ooh, too many, too many things here. Um, well, that was a, a brilliant paper, Hiditaka. It was amazing. And it almost makes me feel like I shouldn't give a paper at all because um, it's very close in some ways to what I want to say, um, but also different. Um, and in some ways, my paper in some ways relates to... Uh, Bruno Latour's Gaia, you know, the Gaia stuff, and to, um, to um, well, the notion of Gaia, and then also to Bernard, of course, Stiegler's stuff. So Gaia, and, and for even for, uh, not just for Latour, but for, uh, for oh, why am I looking at me in, in this picture? Christ, weird. Um, for um, Lovelock and Margulis, right? Right for Lovelock and Margulis, um, Gaia is it, it's clearly negentropic, you know, and and along with uh, many others, uh, Lovelock makes the argument from all matter to organic matter, right, or all matter to Gaia type matter, okay, and I suppose I want to argue against the algorithm in a sense because well okay let me let, let, let's just go through the the paper um i think some i mean it, it's you'll you'll know anyway let's just do it okay small print um right algorithms comprised of rules inputs outputs and an a priori yeah not an a posteriori, but an a priori. I mean, the classical example they give on the Wikipedia is uh, Euclid's proofs. A priori, completely. Um, and Alan and Turing, the, the, this idea partly came th to me through, a, I mean, I was moving in this direction. But for a, con a conversation with Bernard, maybe three years ago, a bit more, uh, a year before he died, I guess, when he was so excited about um, Turing's theoretical biology. So Alan Turing's late work is the theoretical biology, right? We'll get back to that in a moment. Um, yeah. And, um, but, but the algorithm, Turing's later work, when he goes into, and, and again, I'm not an expert here, but I don't care. <laughs> um, he, what he's using is partial differential equations. Yeah? And no longer the logic and, and, and mathematics of Gödel, from which the kind of algorithm arguments, not the arguments, from which the algorithms derived, which I think is very deductive. It is very deductivist, obviously. Deductivist except applied in an engineering way, right? By Turing. I mean, actually, we've got a lot in common. That you, and, you can understand. Do you think you know me? Vous comprenez, hein? Okay, um, okay, a finite set of rigorous instructions, we all know this. A formal system coming to be through a small set of axioms and, and rules. Euclid's algorithm for the greatest common divisor of two numbers. It's, it's, it, it's the most important, the f most famous example given. Formalized, formalized by Hilbert in the Entscheidungsproblem. Also towards an effective calculability which um, Gödel breaks with, right? And showing that it's impossible. <laughs> but nonetheless, stays with 
this kind of algorithmic mentality big time, partly translating uh, axioms into theorems. Algorithm comprised of input, right? Integers of symbols, M and N, symbols plus and equals, to produce outputs of integers, Y. I want to move to a, I think that modernity should, or I want to think about, and I think it's important to think about, I guess an AI that doesn't do that. An AI that doesn't, that is not algorithmic, that's not based on inputs and outputs that's not based on inputs and outputs. What convinced me of this was a conference that we just organized in Lisbon called Terramorphosis. It's like around morphogenesis, like morphogenesis of values from, uh, from the show here. And the group, there's a morphogenesis group in Paris. Giuseppe Longo, Alessandro Sardi, and others. Stiegler used to be part of the group. Uh, Jean Petito, the topologist, might be the most interesting. And there's a lot in it. I don't want to go into detail about the group. But it's morphogenesis for me going to Terra. Gaia is Terra, right? So it's Terra morphosis. Morphogenesis, I want it to be not just biological, but geological. Not just a question of biological time, but also geological time. Negantropic, but not necessarily completely uh, organismic, because so much of, geolo of, of, of geology is comprised of what was once dead life, what is dead life, you know, from 250 million years ago, fossil fuels that come back now to haunt us, also as death and the Anthropocene. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I'm kind of, um, I, I mean, I, making a distinction between two types, the two types of media theory. One which is largely Kittler and his big center, who I'm friends with now in the past in Berlin, and Stiegler, which obviously one's more logic, one's more physical, one's more mechanistic. The other's phenomenological, organismic, strong notion of intentionality. And Stiegler's, but not in, you know, in Kittler's at all. Which is fair enough. Much more logic in people like Ernst and Kittler, and on and on. We, we, there's, I think a very important opposition. Um, and and, and the, early, the um, Kittlerian one, or Ernst, or whoever they are, it's more physical. It's to do with logic. The one I'm talking about, the organismic one, organistic or... B-O-G, biogeological, right? Juan B-O-G is a Michel Serre word, and Latour was his student, along with uh, Ben Saud Vincent from, uh, at the same time, who does these histories of carbon, did the book with Stengers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the notion of mind makes much, not the notion of mind, um, the organism is understood much more as mind than it is as as physical matter. And I think that's the case also with Longo, very much. Although Longo doesn't think that much about mind, he writes about it a little bit. You know, whereby you've got meaning, understanding, intentionality, and all that kind of stuff. So I want to talk about intentional matter, and I want a, um, and that's the kind of, I, that's the kind of AI I think we should have, somehow instead of the much more algorithmic and much more mechanistic in that sense, and much more logic-based and much more Godelian. I'm not quite sure what kind of mathematics that, that the new one should be based on. Um, for some, like Sardi, who is the Simondonian guy, it's uh, Différence de Repetition from, from, uh, from uh, Deleuze, and that even individuation is a question of difference and repetition. Um, and um, so it's a differential calculus for him, largely. Again, you have to talk to Sardi to get him to, he's a bloody mathematician, uh, not one. Um, but, but you know what I mean. Um, partial differential equations for, for Turing. Um, topology for Jean Petito, maybe the most interesting of all. Although I don't know if I agree with it. A Petito, they call him a structuralist. You know, Levi-Strauss loves topology. Levi-Strauss loved Goethe's topology. 
he loved um, topology in general and structure. Um, morphogenesis is at the heart of all of this, including the, more, the father in a, some ways of morphogenesis, which is Darcy Wentworth Thompson, Cambridge morphogenesis. Uh, he was a he, d d big influence on Levi Strauss, big influence on Turing. The trouble is Darcy Wentworth Thompson does not go, in the end, towards. An, he looks like he's going towards an organismic model, but he doesn't. They stay with a certain kind of physics, which is bloody interesting. Uh, he, didn't, he doesn't have much of a mathematics there. Anyway, on and on. Like you, I see Eastern thought connected to this. And I'm a Needham person. Joseph Needham, and I do some work in the, in the, in the um, Needham Center, Needham Institute in Cambridge. Needham was a, a, a junior colleague of Darcy Wentworth Thompson, literally, yeah? And those guys put together morphogenesis, Marxism, and cybernetics in different ways altogether. Crazy shit, but they did that. And then it stopped, but it was there. You know, those, those kinds of notions of form, he was a biochemist, a biochemist who later works uh, through um, Chinese thought for 40 years, right? Needham, all the volumes on Chinese thought, um, you know, which are, I mean, it takes a while to read them. <laughs> it takes a lifetime almost, but I've spent about a year. Okay, so I saw, I saw Jeffrey Lloyd at the center of the Dow and the Logos guy, um, but so did Needham say that, that Chinese thought does not work deductively. It doesn't work geometrically a la Plato. You know, if you're not a geometer, go away, right? Uh, it's something else. It works, I think, a posteriori and not a priori. Longo also says a posteriori, but it's not exactly a posteriori either because it's not, um, it's not a, it, it, because it's partly abductive, like you say. It's not necessarily inductive, but it's partly abductive because you never come to a conclusion, right? It's a funny kind of logic, as you know, a funny kind of, of, um, of inference, which maybe computers should do a lot more. And I think your head's there too a bit. I mean, we're actually ridiculously close, which is amazing. You wouldn't have thought. Uh, okay. So I, I think we should work towards a non-algorithmic mode about artificial intelligence. Uh, towards an organicist and ecological, ecological mode of this. And as, as it becomes ecological, it becomes less the nature-cultural dualism that you were talking about. Um, okay. Um, an ecological and organicist AI, it's a form of life, right? I think. Although I want to put the geology in with, so it's a bit of a, um, not just a biology, but a necrology, a form of death. But of course, you can't get death without life, right? And for somebody like Longo, physical time is neither death nor life. Biological time or geobiological time gives us both, right? Okay, forms of life are, even of technological life, are above all intentional. Come back to the idea of intentional. Uh, like John Searle's, everybody's read John Searle's Chinese Room, right? I taught it here. I think my student in the background learned it from me, but from everybody else too. Um, the computer there can do the syntax, even the grammar of Chinese, but it can't do the semantics, right? The computer can't do that. Can't do that in Chinese. It can't do the... It can't do the understanding, it can't do the meaning, it can't do the intentionality. Those are the four words Searle uses, but actually so does Longo. Without, I don't think having read Searle properly or, or for, having forgotten him, because I was teaching you guys at, at, at City Searle before we went on to other stuff. Um, it's meaning, but it's non-predicational meaning. Not logic, something else, okay? I mean, not who's Searle, but Searle, right? On <laughs> intentionality. Um, okay, it's an empirical intentionality, not a transcendental intentionality. For me, Stiegler goes back between the two. I think Yuck, when he wants to do it, he does too. And it's good to go back and forth between the two. Uh, 
not all in te technology. Most technologies, non-intentional. Algorithmic technology is non-intentional. Heidegger, for me, it's a bit like Heidegger's two-handen and four-handen. Uh, ready to hand, which is intentional, and forehanden, which is not. Unintentional. Okay. Since Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, you're talking about that boil. We have to go talk fast here. The ethos of Western technology and science is to break with any intentionality. Okay. Gertian science, which is beautiful. You know, Farbenlehrer, Benjamin wrote about that, is intentional. Newtonian science is not. Goethe even used the word, I think, phenomenology. If not, people used it about him. Chinese science is intentional. Chinese technology is intentional. Western art science technology is not. Intentional art, Guo Xi. Landscape, northern song, beginning of spring. The mountains, rivers, clouds, and streams, and trees, trees, trees. They, it's not just that we see them, but they see us. They all have powers of intentionality. Yeah? They're not caused, not causality, but intentionality. But Renaissance art, Renaissance landscape, like Renaissance science, is against intentionality. You know, Renaissance, Galileo, Descartes, and all those guys were not Enlightenment thinkers. They were Renaissance thinkers. Yeah, at the same time as Renaissance art. That's unintentional art. Okay. Mountain sea, intentionality, uh, is against the commodity for me. Chinese landscape, we saw this already. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The disembedded eye, the disembedded eye. You know, Descartes' eye and the, enlightened, uh, the Renaissance eye. Yeah. The cogito. Unintentional, anti-intentionality. Intentionality is an aboutness. It's an in-the-worldness. You guys all know this stuff. It's the opposite of instrumentality. The opposite. It's not instrumentality. It's the opposite of instrumentality. It's the opposite of the commodity. Uh, the objectivism, the instrumentality, and all that is the, is the father of the commodity. Use value, intentional, concrete, subjective, versus exchange value, abstract and objective, Marx says, unintentional. Right? Okay. The most important thing about intentionality is not just ab aboutness and its connection to an object or even its subjectivity as distinct from objectivity, which you've got to insist on, like Gertin phenomenology is subjective. Um, most of all, it's an ecology. It's intentional in regard to an ecology. And that's why Searle's AI could never be could never work, it could never do the semantic, because it couldn't be in an ecology. Once you go into inputs and outputs, you remove yourself from an ecology. We need an AI that's not input-output, that's maybe not straight database either. It's something else. We have to, it's gotta be invented, it's gotta work in a, through a different, in a different state. Catherine Hales came to our conference just a, few, a couple of weeks ago. She, was, she said, oh, these, neural net, these new AI neural networks are intentional. They can do the semantic. They can do the speech acts and language. But they work from inputs and outputs. They, they're not in an ecology. They're abstracted from an ecology. There can't be ecological in any sense. We need something different. It can't be, it can't be this. It can't be algorithmic. And for me, also, probably not even computable, not even computational. To be intentional is to be ecological. An ecological modernity versus really a mechanistic modernity. And algorithms are mechanistic. I think there's no way around that. The algorithm is versus, often they say the heuristic is opposed to the algorithm. The heuristic will be more, not precise, but hazy. Non-optimal results. Sounds like abduction in a lot of ways. Okay. Needham. Multi mul we're going to hit China again. Uh, Chinese thought, technology. He calls it organic materialism. Needham, biochemist and embryology, to a massive 700 page book. 700, before he wrote about China, he writes a 700 page book on morphogenesis, believe it or not, for, for, for Ben Ayum. Um, biochemist, and he was an embryologist. Alan Turing, of course, we know also an embryologist, morphogenesis, from Darcy, went with Thompson, being influenced on Levi Strauss, um, from physics or maths. To the organisms that I want to do. Well, no, no. It's some kind of, it's certain kinds of maths. It's not the new materialism at all. 
this organic materialism. For new materialism, all matter is vibrant. For this, only organic matter or geo-organic, B-O-J matter is, is, I wouldn't want to use vibrant, but is, I wouldn't say even living, but it's one to talk about. Oh, it's, it, it's Gaia. So neither Bennett nor Barrett, which is physical matter. Which, which you can run, why did, okay. For long ago, talks about his new lectures, which are online, some of them. Uh, he's got a, he, he, he disagrees with Turing on some of this stuff. He gives us an organic and biological reading on Turing, or morphogenesis, he sees it in terms of the organism, again, meaning, intentionality, and mind, against logic. Um, yeah, but Darcy doesn't do this. Darcy Thompson's morphogenesis says is a physical biology. Isn't that weird? You know, he, it looks like he's breaking, so, so that's something I've got to figure out at some point. All of us do, I guess, or most of us. Long ago, biological versus physical time, I would call geobiological time. Long ago, our mathematical relation to time and space, just as you say, from Greek geometry, space and time of the scientific revolution, co-construction of maths and physics. Kant, first critique, right? Yeah. Um, so physical time, no historicity. Biological time, geobiological time, historicity, physical time, reversible time, biogeological, irreversible time, extends to geological, and Michel Serre, geological time, path dependency, physical time, no path dependency. Chinese technology, path dependency, all the time. Chinese technology, if there's one event, it's the bloody Grand Canal. If we want to understand Chinese technology, we, I think we have to understand it also in terms of infrastructure and the great engineers from Cui and just after that, Cui and, and, and Tang, and even after, right through Song and the Grand Canal. So that's where Chinese, and in terms of infrastructure and logistics, way, way different than Western science, which starts from the stars, which starts from an astronomy that you're trying to predict. Uh, so going to the past here, to, to, to ask these kind of questions. Not the Silk Road or Great Wall, but the Grand Canal. Western technology is algorithmic, as Greco-Galilean. Chinese technology, I think, is organic and organismic. Western science technology predicts the planets of the sky. Chinese technology is on the ground and in the water. Yeah, it's a hydrology. It's earth and water. Yeah, it's earth and water. Very, very different. And, it, and, it, and it's, 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 it's Gaia. It's, it's Earth and it's, it's very, as we were, I was talking about to the, to earlier today at lunch. Okay. Western science and technology is a priori. The algorithm is a priori or a shift on the a priori. Ch we, I think we need is an a posteriori, even mathematics and abductive. Maybe we'll find it in purse. And a Persian logic was a very different kind of logic. Okay. Longo's biology is a posteriori, he says it. The algorithm is a priori. Chinese science is, a, is like. Chinese technology and techniques, problems of flooding, irrigation, shifting rice from the south to Beijing as the empirical fact, a posteriori, right? From which science and technology works a posteriori. This B.O.J., a la serre, Michel Serre, B.O.J., Bio-Geo, is, 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 bio, is a biological, geological fact in terms of a time of irreversibility of path dependency. Of course, it's geological. It's hugely path dependent. Look at the earth now. Look at, look at, look at, look at climate change. Okay, so here, this is also Elizabeth Pavanelli, the anthropologist, talks about materialism and geoontology. This is also, of course, geological time, not just organismic time. Geopolitics is less the politics of geography than of geology. This is geomorphology, Yusuf. Then so de Vincent, geological equals not physical matter. The Gaia of Anthropocene, Latour's Anthropocene, Stigler's not Neganthropocene. Geomorphology against hylomorphism, right? You know, form and, form and, and matter, all that our stuff. You know, Simon Simon don't makes that argument big time, doesn't he? Um, morphogenesis is, is a geomorphosis here. It's not Platonic, and it's not Aristotelian. It's a geomorphosis of geological time as well as we talk, I think, a technomorphosis of technological time. I think also the Grand Canal is in a technological time, and the two meet, I think, in the Grand Canal and elsewhere, of course. Bredekamp, against his fantastic 700 book, page book on Michelangelo, only in German now, against Neoplatonism, and his father is doing work in a rock, Michelangelo is cutting rock out of a rock, two minutes, I'll, I'll end, 
two minutes, I think I can end, um, of rock quarry in marble. Okay. So I want to argue against, also against Neoplatonism, against this mechanism, to a geomorphosis of matter, BOJ matter, driving form. That's where form comes from. Stiegler techniques as Epimetheus's lack or in, lack of instincts, but it's, few, it's filled by Prometheus's fire, isn't it? It's about fire. Remember an early piece by Jung on fire and revolution. Um, fire and agriculture, Han Confucian color. You fire, you fire the forest, and that's true. In, in China, and the elephants leave. There were, there were forests, there were jungles, and they set them on fire. Slash and burn rice, agriculture, and then the Grand Canal. Geomorphosis. Now I want to show a clip here from, from a, an artist very quickly who does geomorphosis art in a Morgan Chimber in a, in a quarry. In fact, the same quarry right near where, where, where Michelangelo was. Can we start it? How do I start it? Uh, it's starting. Oh, it starts too early. Oh, well, let's see some of it. Is there sound? Read it. Uh, I wanted to start about a minute or two later. But, oh, it's a pity because I, I, I can remember pretty much what they're saying. You can see they're cutting the rock, quarrying the rock in Italy. Um, but, but now it's kind of mechanical quarrying. Um, but but, but it, it, it's very much a geomor an art of geomorphosis, where the art is driven by the matter. The form is driven by the matter. Geomorphology. And there's the artist, Morgan Schimber, and th she's working with this Italian guy, and she's looking at the uh, lines. I think she's also a friend of Bernard's. And um, the lines, which he sees are cracks through which energy are coming. Energy, chi, right? Through the cracks. Of, 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 of these rocks. And, and she's looking at kind of lines that, that the artist is going to fill. That's all, also connecting to this. Again, bringing together the techniques. It looks like it stopped the video. It stopped. No, it's coming back. My, my screen's got it. But your screen stopped the video. Why did your screen stop the video? Did I stop it? Oh, fuck. Um, OK, I'm going to end. And I'm going to say, I can see it all here on mine. That um, the, and again, I think here the uh, our art as technomorphosis connects to the geomorphosis, right, of of the bi biological and the geological, and um, and that I think is the kind of art I'm in, I'm, I'm interested in. Um, it, it is a morphogenesis. It can be an individuation; doesn't have to be. It can be a speciation. Yeah, like in Darwin. Evolution. It could be the origins of life. Let's come back again. Um, but um, Barry Schwabsky, the uh, who Yuk knows too, the famous uh, the famous critic, who was going to publish the piece Jeffrey's piece, but we lost the publisher going to somebody else. Um, the um, wrote about a wonderful piece on Morgan Chimber, and he said that she does artist techniques, because if you see her shows, she leaves the techniques bare. Yeah? She doesn't paper it over with, an, with, a, with another, another, another kind of layer of, of, of art. Um, so I think art and techniques come together there. And um, we've got a technological time. We've got a technological intentionality. Yeah? That connects to a geomorphosis, a geomorphosis and a technomorphosis which is also part of a Chinese type organic materialism rather than a mechanical materialism and tries to point towards another kind of AI that I don't know how it would work. It won't be necessarily analog. It probably won't be digital, yeah? It'll be something else. Um, and it won't work through the algorithm. I don't know whether it'll work through topology, uh, perito, or, or whatever. Uh, or, and it might just work differently all the time. Um, and, and, and it's kind of a mathematics to be discovered. You know, and, and it's kind of a, an IT to be discovered, I think. IT, yeah, to be discovered. So I'm going to stop right there. And uh, I hope I've, his, I think yours is much more complicated than mine. So uh, I'll stop there. And I hope you can ask him all the questions because I probably can't answer them. Thank you very much.
Right, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have some time for, the, uh, we have a, probably half an hour for discussion. So if uh, Charlie uh, could show me the sign about the time we are going, uh, you know, five minutes before it ends, that would be great. So um, th again, thank you both for both for the uh, really rich um, conferences. Um, so I'm going to, 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 to be more provocative uh, on <laughs> this because uh, I have uh, written a book on, uh, on the question of organicism and that... Uh, Organicism, um, organicism, uh, recursivity and contingency is all about oh, organicism. Sorry, your third book. Yeah, my third book. Yeah, yeah. So I think we, we can we can we can talk about this. Um, um, now I wanted to. Um, now I want wanted to. Um, yeah, we can hear. Um, right. Right, so um, um, because it seems to me that the concept of organicism plays a very important role in both of your talks, not as evidence. But I'm also interested in the, in the relation between organicism and late modernity. And I think this is a very interesting point because in the talk of Scott, you know, in the previous work of Scott, he developed uh, a reflexive modernity. And I think it was a very long time ago, uh, very important. But what we see there is a opposition between, on the one hand, mechan uh, mechanism. We can relate with the cars, we can relate with, uh, to, some, to some extent, uh, uh, Newton. Uh, and on the other side, uh, organicism that was really a key concept in the early uh, since the, the end of the 19th century but for me it started already in the work of Immanuel Kant in the time, critique of, the, of of uh, judgment so if I understood correctly in your talk you again you play this by opposing organicism to a certain kind of Newtonian uh, um, um, uh, mechanical um, um, uh, kind of classical f uh, 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 mechanics, and so you propose through Niham and so on to propose a new form of thinking about techniques. Well, I see something quite different in the work of uh, of Ishida-san, and that is almost a critique of what you said, um, because uh, what uh, Ishida-san says is that such an organicism was kind of already realized in the cybernetic imagination or the imp implementation of cybernetics. And here I wanted to, you know, to, 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 to create a bridge between you two, because, and I wanted to refer to the 1948 book of Norbert Wiener. The first chapter of Norbert Wiener's book is called Newtonian Time and Bergsonian Time. So, uh, Vienna, by opposing uh, Newtonian time, which is a reversible, uh, re re um, mechanical, repetitive, and the Bersonian time, which is irreversible, biological, creative. And then he claimed that, look, cybernetic machines has already overcome this opposition. So, I see this is a very clear in, in Ishida-san's um, 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 it's a talk, but it seems to me that you have problematized this by showing that it's precisely the cybernetic conception that leads to the formation of the greenhouse that we are experiencing now, that's the Anthropocene. So um, that's my reading of the kind of a, a similarity, but at the same time, a, a, a kind of a, a, um, antagonism between both of your talk. So I'm curious, what would you think? Me first. Um, yeah, we've had this discussion before, you um, for about five years. Um, but I, I realized that. Uh, I guess I was mostly influenced in a lot of ways by um, Schrodinger's What is Life? Which um, starts from quantum, something like quantum mechanics. Uh, statistical mechanics and works towards um, the organic uh, through the, through the um, organization of uh, of molecules and of course it's gone a lot further now uh, in terms of of what is life you know looking at archaea and uh, the eukaryotic and all that um, but um, so and I'm really interested in the I don't know I think that. I, I don't think that the I don't I, no I think that the algorithmic is a replay. 
is a replay of the mechanistic instead of, uh, instead of a cybernetic um, overcoming of the organismic and, and, the, and the mechanistic. And of course, all these kind of morphogenics, morphogenesis people were also interested in cybernetics. Um, so um, I'm uh, agreeing with that. Um, and I think that um, what I'm sort of arguing, and, and, and again, I, I, is, is a little bit in the direction of, uh, of, uh, of, of symbiosis from, um, from uh, uh, what's her name, the uh, famous, uh, who's Lick a great Lider? symbiosis? Lick Lider? No, no. Verda? Uh, no, way back, before. Um, Luciana did her PhD, her PhD, her PhD with them. Her. Margulis. Margulis, symbiosis. So Margulis is symbiosis, and she got hammered, of course, by the neo-Darwinians for her idea of symbiosis, which is also a mode of evolution, right? Uh, but now, then she got more accepted. Um, no, but, 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 but her symbiosis is a precursor of, you know, Haraway's Chulucine, of... And 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 I held, I thought was way more cognizant of this, but she she wasn't when she was at her little meeting. Uh, her idea of second generation or third generation cybernetics, right? You know, which is which is which is structural coupling, right? You know, which is um, a much more organicist, although not necessarily organic. Um, and I want to work it into geological time, big time. And I'm, as you can see from mine, I'm more interested even in the geological, you know, which is a necropolitics more than a biopolitics, right? Because you can't be dead unless you were once alive. Yeah? So, um, so, so I, I want to do that. Um, and and it, it came back to me big time again. I, I think that the philosophy of mind is not stupid. Um, you know, and, and, and the psychology of mind is not dumb. And Nagel's stuff, his evolutionary argument, cosmology, sounds like you, cosmology and mind, um, which, go, which, which, which puts a neo-Darwinian argument. Uh, visa from consciousness, right? Bewusstsein. And, and not, not the subject, right? Bewusstsein, we both love through Hegel, um, which animals can have. And then a reason, you know, which, which, which I think has to be. Right, Ishida? It's got to be somehow deductive, inductive, abductive, something like that. It's got to be inferential, doesn't it? Reason. Yeah? And it's got to, um, mind's got to work like that. There's got to be a symbolic. I think you were saying that. Ishida was saying that, right? The importance of a symbolic. Without a symbolic, you can't do it, can you? Um, and it comes. So I think that um, th that's what I'm kind of reaching for. And I don't want... And I don't want to um, go for a simple or organismic time. And it's dead as well as alive. It's geological. Um, yeah, and it's... Um, and, and I think that... Um, I don't know, that um, somehow... I, I like it also somehow a, a posteriori, if that's the right word. You know, whereby you look at the fact, you look at the problem. And in China, the problem was flooding, right? Or getting that fucking rice from Hangzhou up to Beijing so that Beijing could fight against the Mongolians, the Manchurians coming down, yeah? And, and what it did was it cements Chinese identity of the South and the North. You know, rice culture comes in at big time, including its technology, which is so different than North Chinese technology. It's, got, it's a water thing. You know, and and um, so I guess that's what I want to do, and and that's why I see it as incredibly Chinese. Um, I think Needham gets a lot of it right. I, I, I'm not completely, in, you know, with Needham. Um, so, and and I do agree that reductive organism versus mechanism sucks. And you know, we both were saying in, in the restaurant in Berlin five years ago that um, you know that that of course the, the cybernetic. You know, well, well, you know, you know. I, I think, uh, I think somehow that this opposition has structured thought for so long, um, 
And uh, somehow Chinese thought is already in the world. I think you were saying, Ishida, being in the bubble, right? Being in the bubble, right? Uh, Hiditake. Uh, what, being in the bubble. Well, what about being in the earth? Being in the earth. Not being in the world. Being in the earth. That's where I want to move towards. And the earth is a geological as well as a biological earth. And, and it connects to geological time, geomorphology. It connects to fire as the Promethean technology, right? Which, um, which fires earth to start with even before Neo Neolithic times which fires the fucking forests. So we get the Neolithic and then the bronze. So, you know, that, that um, I, I, want, I want us to think about technology a bit like that and then take it right up to the present. Um, but your paper was amazing. In fact, scared me. Ishida's paper was so good, it frightened me. So could you please come back with some of your ideas? It was amazing, really. So, uh, that, so, is that... <laughs> yeah, uh, co classifying uh, so uh, you uh, very well uh, so clarified the situation <laughs> of our, our, our discussion. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, he's uh, uh, so uh, Chinese. <laughs> I'm Japanese, <laughs> so uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, so another so different uh, historicity of the uh, yeah yeah Western. So uh, Japanese are so uh, I'm I'm Japanese and I'm very how I say very difficult uh, position <laughs> because vis-à-vis uh, -vis the modernity. Because uh, Japanese, uh, so uh, Japanese modernity is uh, quite uh, so singular e uh, historical experience. So I invite, invited this logic of subtraction <laughs> because because uh, so uh, we uh, I don't I don't think that Japanese uh, so Asian paradigm is. Uh, uh, how I say, uh, uh, how I say, uh, naturally uh, or spontaneously uh, evi evi evident uh, uh, tradition. <laughs> no, not because we are all, all so Latour said that we never been, have never been modern. But uh, this, this statement is very, very complex uh, uh, so statement. That is because we are, so uh, all people are modern, <laughs> but we are never being modern. That is the sense of this uh, paradox by Latour. So uh, that is, uh, uh, we, uh, was, we have never been modern in the sense we uh, so we have uh, we we, ha we have been modern, not in the sense uh, that we thought we were modern. <laughs> that is uh, that yeah, this yeah, yeah. this uh, uh, very very complex uh, reflection by, <laughs> and uh, Japanese uh, and uh, also Asian or European people are also in this situation. So in. Uh, how I say, uh, in the two, uh, in the tour of, comment dire? En français, je peux, je, je peux dire mieux. <laughs> Alors, pas, Pascal, uh, so, you know, pas, Pascal. Pascal disait, nous sommes, uh, nous sommes fous uh, dans, dans le, la tour, uh, non, nous sommes, nous ne sommes pas fous, nous sommes sains. Uh, dans le tour de tour de la folie. <laughs> that, 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 is, that, is, that is this type of uh, complex uh, uh, so to uh, de, de, de logic qui est, qui qui opérate dans this uh, fonctionnement de modernity. Oh, modernity. And uh, so uh, how we can so resolve this uh, so dilemma or uh, so paradox of modernity. 
the uh, so solution proposed by Latour was the uh, so con to convene the parliament of objects, the parliament of things. But uh, his conception is the uh, uh, conception of the uh, constitution. Hmm? Constitution is a very uh, occidental paradigm <laughs> because that is a French paradigm <laughs> of constitution. Yeah, American, yeah. And uh, I provisionally I'm, I'm, I agree with this uh, convocation of uh, uh, constitution of things because we are in the uh, Anthropocene pre, uh, so crisis, and we must convene all things in the, uh, all beings uh, on the earth to so open, uh, convene this uh, con con constitution, so parliament of <laughs> things. So, if you can, so the, the most important thing is to to start uh, uh, so. Since the object, you, you, you saw, wrote uh, uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> another modernity mm -hmm. in, in this uh, and one chapter about uh, la, la Tour uh, uh, <laughs> on, the, on the things. So we must so start uh, since things. Things is uh, so objects uh, uh, and the situation of uh, the AI, etc., etc. Yeah. I think we must uh, start with uh, by by objects, hmm? not by intellect. <laughs> hmm? We must uh, start uh, so from things, yeah. situation of things, agreeing, yeah. and uh, uh, so open this. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. a parliament of uh, things with a different uh, representative of uh, well, cult culture or different, different representative of so, uh, biological being, etc., etc. And we must uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, so change this uh, configuration and uh, thus uh, we must uh, be confronted to the question of translation. Transl how we so invent another, uh, another type of uh, logic to uh, create new, new concept. Uh, so new concept is not a dialectic, I think. <laughs> that is a subtraction in my sense, in the case of Japanese translation of the modernity. The most creative is... Uh, you've, got a, you've got a notion of... <laughs> you, no, no, I, th I think you're saying something yeah. pretty amazing, and maybe you can help clarify, because what, what, what Hiritaka is saying is quite complex. Um, and um, your notion of subtraction, because there's an idea of Kong, Kong, you know, which is, which is a space, mm -hmm. but also a void, a void which, um, oh, we publish the work of, uh, of uh, Yo, Yo, Yo Ji Hui, uh, Joyce Liu, mm -hmm. who does talk about the Kyoto School, I think, and, and that notion of Kong, uh, which is almost a Taoist, Buddhist um, uh, em emptiness, that, that's, a, um, that's a subtractive idea, a bit like yours. Um, and I think that's something there that's very, very difficult to, to, to and I think th that, th it's kind of an immaterial and an ungraspable and an un uncognizable, right? That um, is a condition of the pos. I don't want to use the word condition of the possibility. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit more about that? that? That subtraction, that emptiness, that space that you're talking about? So, uh, how I say, so I'm so you, you, you mentioned the question of intentionality, hmm? uh, but intentionality is a very, how she said, very complex, it's a very complicated uh, problem, because intentionality uh, in the sense of uh, phenomenology uh, so, uh, uh, is uh, rooted in medieval occidental phil phil tra philosophical tradition and uh, intentionality is uh, so in the uh, ordinary uh, so representation of intentionality uh, 
uh, in uh, uh, Western Western uh, type of uh, so representation. Sure. So that is uh, so uh, like a f arrow to to the to the target intentionality. Mm -hmm. But in the uh, Japanese uh, uh, Oriental uh, sense of intentionality is that is uh, passive, so environment. The conception of intentionality, the local, uh, so that is a lock, uh, so the, the sense of uh, the place is. Uh, yeah. So pr that's what I want. That's what I want to do. Yes. So yes. I'm trying to understand mm. intentionality above all as related to an ecology. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Ecological. And, 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 and even sense making coming from that relation. Yes. yes. Between mm. between the system mm. or the person or mm. the Yes. Or the organism, or whatever, and 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 and, and that ecology, yes. you know, rather mm. than than the object. Yes, yes. yes. So I'm agreeing with that, mm. and and mm. I'm, and I'm and I'm trying to argue, for for for, for the way the Chinese and Eastern thought mm. can help us also think mm. ab about the sort of modernity mm. that breaks with mm. some of the problems <laughs> that um, are not totally unassociated yes. with uh, with the Anthropocene. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> And another example in your so in the so topic you evocated, uh, so the Chinese room <laughs> experiment by Sar Sar Zhang Sar, I so uh, I treated this uh, this uh, this problem uh, several times because uh, he never uh, uh, so clarified. The sense of Chinese in this uh, so title Chinese uh, experiment. Chime, chime in chi what is Chinese room? What is the Chinese in this uh, so uh, this entitlement of the experiment? That is a Chi oh, Chinese room by John Searle. You mean John Searle? Oh chi yeah, he, I don't think chi he chi Chinese thought about that. Is a, is a, uh, meaning. Of Chinese, in this case, is Chinese language, Chinese people, Chinese culture, Chinese writing system. Uh, that is not uh, clear <laughs> in this uh, so, uh, presentation by Saul, John Saul. And uh, in the experiment, no, nobody uh, uh, speak in this experiment. So that is na, not uh, uh, the question of Chinese language, but that is a question of Chinese uh, writing system. <laughs> because uh, the, this uh, experiment uh, so, uh, is uh, communication by ecriture, by writing system. So uh, I don't think like Sal, that uh, nobody can understand, but uh, uh, with the Chinese uh, writing system, uh, partly uh, at least, something com can communicate <laughs> because uh, of Chinese writing system. So the, uh, the exper thought experiment by Sara is very Occidental <laughs> conception of the writing system, so <coughs> so many many things like that. <laughs> I, I think you know, you know here here the, the 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 problem with the Chinese room experiments. And for those who don't know, it it it, it runs like this. You know, it's, if there's a black box. And then you hand into the black box uh, something written in Chinese, and then if the output is correct, you know there is someone inside the uh, black box handling the uh, these inputs by checking a dictionary or checking a, a menu, and the output always follow the menu. And you thought that this person knows Chinese, but actually 
this person inside the black box uh, doesn't know Chinese. That is the so-called Chinese room experiment. But uh, as, you know, you can replace the Chinese language with any other language. In this case, in the of John Saw. But the, the, the fundamental problem of the Chinese room experiment for me is that it is still it still understand intelligence in a mechanistic. Uh, um, model, that's to say you check uh, the menu or you check a dictionary to find what is the, it's kind of a search, a kind of linear search, but not really a learning process that we, uh, very different from what we know about uh, machine learning today. Uh, so there's a, the, also the question of intentionality that uh, that the soul uh, uh, basically discredit that uh, a machine does not have, but that's a problem. Um, I, I believe that is a problem. But if we can come back to the question of translation, because I think it is a very important question uh, in both of your arguments, uh, if I understand uh, you correctly, uh, Ishida's subtraction of modernity is a, a search for difference or the self-identity uh, in the confrontation with modernity. That's to say, by confronting the Quran, that Nishida developed the logic of Basho, and which is not completely intentionality. It's a, um, it's a different kind of logic, a logic that is, a, however, fundamentally based in a historical, so, social historical uh, ground, as he, he tried to explain uh, himself. And this also, of course, by, by confronting modernity, one develop a different logic of locality. We, if we locality. can of locality, that is, then we involve a second translation. How? What would be the implication of this difference in the uh, technological innovation development? This is exactly the question that Lo uh, Ronaldo Lemos asked today. Is it possible to develop an Amazonian AI if it is possible to subtract a difference in the Amazon? Uh, we, I don't know which 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 um, Amazonian uh, culture, but there, there, there are a lot of discussions that, for example, we can find with the anthropologists like uh, Descola of Veras de Castro and so on. So I think it is my, for you, if I understand correctly, the subtracting the modernity is also a strategy to move out of the, of the green, uh, of the greenhouse. And the greenhouse, of course, if I can refer to what you said, um, Scott, it's uh, uh, about geology. Uh, and of course, we, you, you at the, when you just came on the stage, you mentioned about uh, uh, Latour, Bruno, and uh, that you are approaching a different concept of Bruno, that is uh, Gaia, of the Gaia theory. Now, the Gaia, the Gaia was firstly def defined by James Lovelock in, in the 1970s as a cyber of the earth as a cybernetic system capable of self regulation self uh, cap behave which can behave like a homeostasis and but that is what Latou wanted to criticize as well in his uh, uh, collaboration with with Lavrov uh, as uh, uh, with Lavrov James Lavrov okay yeah to move away from this concept of of uh, the cybernetic concept of of the uh, of Gaia and that by then he incorporates the work of Lee Margulies, the micro uh, uh, my, my, micro uh, uh, biologist and Donna Haroway to think uh, uh, away um, but in your uh, but you uh, in your work in your talk I saw, I saw a, a different translation and this translation is done by by Niham who tried to translate Chinese thought into a uh, organicist mm -hmm. materialism, yeah. right? And and this is uh, something quite interesting because if you ask uh, a Chinese philosopher, uh, you know, a, a, a really old-fashioned Chinese philosopher, he will immediately refuse this. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with that. Yeah, yeah. But but uh, nevertheless, this is a very interesting translation uh, that. Um, um, uh, that has a really complicated uh, history in, in in China because if you if you remember in the first uh, um, half of the twentieth century that 
white hat was well recognized in China, and white hat's work was already, you know, immediately translated into Chinese mm -hmm. and 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 uh, Chinese philosophers like, for example, Mao Zedong. When he read white hat, he already says that well, you know, white hat was in, inspired by Orientalist thinking, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they, uh, there are two forms of translations, you know, uh, that we can see uh, the Japanese translation, but also Niham as an English man, an uh, English Catholic, uh, but also himself is a biochemist, the translation of Chinese thought into a quasi-biological language. Yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to move towards the geological for one thing, right? And not just the biological. And... Um, as I said, I'm inspired by, uh, by Longo uh, again. I, of course, I've been through this. And right from the beginning, I didn't think that organic materialism was perfect at all. You know, and that you know, somebody like Francois Julien would hate it and blah, blah, blah. I don't care. Um, but that um, Needham, for one thing, he, he, he does so much on the hydrology. He does so much on the Grand Canal. And it's fascinating, the kind of engineering stuff that he talks about on the Grand Canal. And I think we have to... Um, you know, it's pretty hard to abstract technology from from its path dependency, yeah. And 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 it's hard. To, oh, we'll talk about algorithms. Well, what about a whole history? You know, a whole history of hydrology, a whole history of a uh, a Holocene that was a thousand years ahead of the Western, yeah, six hundred uh, A.D. instead of sixteen hundred A.D., yeah. Um, a whole kind of engineering and um, a sophisticated uh, agriculture that was a thousand years ahead. Um, and even the, um, the movement of the rice and the locks and all that kind of stuff was just, just very, very different. So it's like the Anthropocene starts with the Holocene in a certain way, although it doesn't exactly. You're the Western Anthropocene at the Western. The Anthropocene is based on the... Um, very, very largely on the steam engine, yeah, and on the internal combustion engine. The steam engine starts it off in the Industrial Revolution, and it's coal, but it's oil with the internal, and gas with internal combustion, along with consumer society, the rise of the petrol firms, etc. that really kicks it, kicks it off, right? 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. In China, it was the bloody, um, it was already there in the locks and the bridges and the uh, canals and the dikes and the, uh, the sluice gates and 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 all of that. It, 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 it's not not an, not a simplistic notion of the hydrology in terms of the kind of very complex engineering that they um, de that w that's been developed, and that relates to a very different notion of Earth, 2D and 2 uh, and and uh, to you know uh, that that you get in Feshaltong, that you get in um, that you get in. Uh, you know, the, 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 the opposition between the Northwest and the Silt, Huangtu, and the Northeast and the much more alluvial plain. And then again, the Southeast and, the, um, and rice farming, which completely changes it because it's so water and hydrology oriented. So I think that um, there's, a, there's a path dependency. I don't think we can break with it. I want to move towards, I think we have to take Asian thought seriously. And, and if you're, and it's a geology and it's a technology, and it's and it's an intersection of the geology and the technology, yeah. And for me, even the geology is almost more important than the biology, but they're inseparable, because you know so much of geology is dead biology. A biome is is the rocks, and it's also the um, the, the the microorganisms, right? Um, so um, I'm not uh, trying to argue for at, at all, obviously, for simplistic or organistic organistic model. I do think that um, what, um, what I'm probably don't, what I think that you're doing with this idea of subtraction is, and I think this idea of Kong, you know, which is, uh, and, uh, which is which also a void, um, and something else too, is something that we need to be able to understand. And, and although it's not completely understandable by anybody, is it? And, and to reach for. Um, as, as, as a, um, you know, it's not the ding an sich. It's not the thing in itself. It's something fucking other than that, isn't it? Um, and it's not the, you know, I think that, um, yeah, there is an unconscious, which isn't modern, 
to, 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 to why, we've never did, why we've never been modern. And it's something that Maurice pointed, God said, let there be light. But it's a Judeo-Christian God that said that. Let there be light gave us intelligibility. But who gave Westerners intelligibility, right? Um, and not just that, but the whole kind of uh, Greco, the, the unconscious of Pythagoras and, the, um, and, and, and some of the pre-Socratics and the Parmenides and some of the thinking that underlines our uh, geometric, um, geometric uh, Newtonian kind of notion of, of the modern, I think you even pointed to, Kant, the first critique. Um, and I, I still think that there's a lot to be said for the third critique, you know, and, and which I see as intentionality. I understand Sveik Macy Kite as intentionality, although it's all, it, it, you know, we've talked about this before. It's, it, it's transcendental. It's a condition of the possibility. But I don't think we should, we, I don't think we've got to get hung up with, because if you look at, I mean, Descola says in his figuration book, the Chinese landscape's intentional. Julien says it too. Carry on. Yeah, sorry, you answer. Because you know much more about it than I do. Ishida. Ishida san. I want to give you the last word. <laughs> so I, I, maybe I, maybe we, get, we can say that, you know, um, we are talking, we, now we are stuck in the kind of second, second translation, you know, translation of difference into the concept of technology. So uh, Scott also mentioned about hydraulic, uh, 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 hydraulic engineering and so on. I know that you have done uh, quite some uh, research on the water clock. If you, if I remember correctly, three years ago we we have the talk in in Tokyo, and you talk about the water clock of Suzon. That was uh, Joseph Needham has a whole book on the water clock. Um, so I'm wondering how you you know how you think about this uh, translation and 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 its implication in 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 technology today. Uh, but because I think it is open up uh, really a really concrete question: How do we approach uh, the the, the multiple futures of arts and technology. <laughs> Sorry, because I'm uh, quite tired, so I will speak uh, in, in French. <laughs> Alors, donc, pour la reconstruction, les Japonais aussi ont reconstitué le, donc, l'horloge euh, hydraulique euh, tel qu'elle a été donc, inventée euh, en Chine au, au, au 11e siècle. Et j'ai visité ce, ce, cette reconstruction, et, mais à partir d'ailleurs c'est, c'est, dans le, c'est pour que je comprenne mieux son travail sur la euh, cosmotechnique, parce que c'est, c'est, cette horloge c'est, c'est l'incarnation même, la réalisation même de la cosmotechnique au sens, parce que le, le temps n'est jamais séparé de cette cosmologie chinoise et que jusqu'à la euh, modernité, justement, c'est jusqu'à la modernité, euh, la, la, le temps euh, fonctionnait en fonction du cosmos. C'est, c'est un peu partout, je pense que c'était comme ça. Mais euh, après, donc, le 17e, euh, donc, au moment, c'est, c'est la, le moment de, de l'expérience par Boyle de, de, sur l'air, hein. toute la rationalité donc, scientifique est née et donc, au XVIIe siècle et que le temps, euh, comme, le, l'invention de l'horloge, c'est important, <rire> bien sûr. Par que, euh, donc, euh, rien, c'est, c'est, ça, hein. c'est la, le, le temps mécanique qui commence. Hein. Et, et puis, on euh, individualise le temps en fonction de l'invasion de l'horloge individuelle, hein, chaque maison, sa maison, etc. Et puis maintenant, euh, sur la montre, euh, sur le montre, vous n'avez pas de euh, cosmos, <rire> sauf les horloges qui coûtent très cher. Vous avez 
euh, comment dire, la, 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 qui, le, le, le mouvement de désastre, mais c'est pour les, les produits de luxe. <rire> Maintenant, vous n'avez que des chiffres. Et que donc le temps, le temps, le temps commence à se sécuriser et que l'humanité commence à vivre le temps abstrait. C'est ça. Alors, j'ai remarqué, au bout de cette invention, il y a trois ans, je crois, de, de trois ans, Facebook, l'Institut de recherche de Facebook, a proposé de remplacer le temps d'unité de seconde par flic, une unité minimale qui, est donc, qui devait remplacer pour certains usages l'emploi du temps euh, de l'horloge. Pour que euh, les, les screens, enfin, les, les, les timings des screens euh, ne, euh, se règle, ne se dérèglent pas. Pour que ça, 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 ça agence complètement avec euh, le temps de médias. Donc, euh, ils, ils ont proposé, enfin, je ne sais pas si ça a été donc euh, c'est répandu oh, Ok. Maybe okay. I should... I, 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 maybe, maybe I should... Maybe <laughs> I should... Maybe <laughs> I should... <laughs> no, no, I, I'm going to translate for him uh, right now. <laughs> so, uh, so what one is that and says is that, uh, you know, uh, it was... Uh, This, uh, this water clock invented by Suzon was uh, in the 11th century, but uh, you know, to the to su supplements, this clock was destroyed during the process of moving from one city to another city because there, there was a new capital at the time. Uh, so the clock was broken and there was no possibility to reconstruct this clock for a long time. And, and now I don't think that they succeeded, even though some people claim that they succeeded. So uh, uh, Ishida-san visited this, uh, this uh, clock uh, three years ago in order to understand better my work because of, uh, uh, to understand better the concept that I developed, uh, uh, the cosmotechnics. Um, and he, um, he, 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 he points out that the time was not, uh, because the time, we are talking about the water cross, time was not separated from cosmology uh, um, until, not until modernity. Because uh, in the 17th century, that uh, the scientific rationality was developed and popularized everywhere in the world, and the time time become mechanized in the sense that it become individualized and. Um, and not only time itself, but also the clock is in every individual house. And when you look at your watch today, there's no cosmo, there's no cosmos, there's no cosmology. Maybe you can also see some mechanical watch, but this is a, a product of luck, of, of luxury. You can only see numbers or, or, or digits on your on your on your watch. Um, and from this moment on, the humanity lived in the in the abstract time. So, and he also raised the example that three years ago when he looked at, uh, he, he read the news of Facebook developing a new a unit of time in order to synchronize all the, uh, all the users, uh, but not sure if uh, Facebook has done so. Uh, um, so that's what he said. S'il vous voulez uh, continuer. Uh, uh, donc, uh, nous sommes, uh, uh, donc, uh, la modernité est, comment dire, s'est euh, développé dans le, la temporalité mécanique, mais maintenant on est passé, enfin, disons, si on suit cette, ce, cette licence par euh, l'institut de Facebook, on passe dans le temps de médias, dans, dans l'usage. On, on abandonne une seconde, <rire> et puis on, on passe dans la temporalité flic. Euh, C'est un, une autre un autre stade de cette euh, évolution. Mm. Euh, uh, yeah, I mean, oui. Well, finish. No, only that it seems to me that I, I don't know. Maybe it work, doesn't work with cosmotechnics. I'm probably I like cosmotechnics, but probably less of a fan of it than uh, than Ishida, uh, Professor I, I, Ishida. Uh, yeah, we, we we have to stop because I say no. Very quickly, I think I think right? a lot of people now we're talking and thinking about geological time. Yeah. and not human time, mm. and that are thinking about a time of speciation and extinction, mm. are thinking about extinction events and other kind of events, 
um, and, 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 and thinking about the time of, of carbon and of, uh, and, 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 of, and of dead matter, dead once living matter. So I think that that is a hugely important way that we should probably be thinking about temporality, which I don't think that Longo even gets. So I think that's all. I think we're all right in a way, but I'm fascinated by your, by your talk. Thank so you, thank, thank you, you thank you very much. Thank you for both. Thank, of, thank you both of you. Um, cool. So yeah, I will talk today about uh, protocolism, uh, which is a, a hypothetic uh, new artistic movement that uh, um, perhaps exists, perhaps doesn't exist, but uh, has not been named yet. And uh, because it has not been named, it is difficult for artists to recognize themselves whether they belong to this artistic movement or not. Um, so I will try to present this artistic movement and then perhaps hopefully try to discuss whether uh, uh, people recognize themselves into this movement or whether they do agree that this movement does exist. Um, but before I begin, um, I want to make a little introduction uh, that, that will lead to uh, the discussion on protocolism, um, questioning the, um, the issue whether does art still need the artist uh, in the 21st century, meaning like given the, the new technological developments. Um, and still uh, in the parenthesis is important because uh, it raised the question whether uh, art, did, did art, is it just new technological development that are questioning uh, the issue whether art still needs the artist or uh, is it something that goes back beyond and before uh, the new technological development such as AI, AI and, uh, and all the internet technologies. Um, so maybe just like a short presentation, I am, uh, I am an artist, but I am also a, a copyright scholar. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a legal researcher at CNRS and at Harvard. And um, basically all my uh, legal research is tackling the question of uh, what is the role of copyright, uh, especially given the development of uh, um, internet, uh, blockchain, AI, and all those uh, emerging technologies. And so uh, just as, uh, as a matter of introduction, what are the, the three pillars of copyright, those three fundamental components that are required in order for copyright to apply? Uh, the first one is obviously the notion of author and authorship. There needs to be a person, an entity that uh, holds the copyright in a work. Uh, and then there is the question of what is the creative process that has led to the original creation of an independent uh, uh, work of authorship. And then finally is the work, which generally needs to be fixated uh, into a particular medium in order to then qualify for copyright protection. And so um, I want to go through those three pillars and uh, look at the way in which uh, new technologies, but also new artistic practices, perhaps independently of technology, are uh, putting into jeopardy uh, those three different pillars and therefore raising the question about how does copyright actually apply in, in a context in which those traditional pillars are not so easy anymore to identify or perhaps have been mutating so much that they are no longer recognizable uh, under the traditional system of copyright law. Uh, so let's start with the first pillar, the author. Um, so the first pillar have, has been uh, slightly affected with the advent of uh, uh, most notably digital technology, internet technology, and so forth. Uh, as we have been shifting increasingly from this notion of one author as the genius, uh, independent creator that will produce a particular work of art towards a very collaborative, sometimes anonymous type of uh, works that are enabled through the collaboration uh, and the collective endeavors that can be done on the internet. So we, we probably all have heard of this beautiful uh, experiment on Reddit where people could uh, take one pixel and, uh, and, 
and coordinate themselves informally in order to actually create those pieces of uh, digital art. Um, this was one uh, uh, piece that I developed uh, uh, in 2007, which was similarly creating a wide canvas on the internet where anyone could come and uh, um, I have the video today. anyone could come and just with a very small pen could add or erase and then save when they liked. And this generated those type of uh, very um, ongoing cadavres key uh, where people keep adding, adding, adding. Uh, they don't know each other, but they all find ways to collaborate with one another. And again, this was all anonymous. Uh, all the works were created under CC0 uh, because that was actually the only way in which those work could be legitimately done without we were violating the copyright of the previous artists. Um, and then we have like, uh, not just the internet. Uh, so within my artistic practice, I focus a lot on trying to uh, create physical works that uh, questions or that raise the same questions as digital work when it comes to copyright. Uh, so this was an experiment. Um, this was an experiment uh, of creating a mechanical algorithm which will be generating artworks when people come and write this creature. Uh, and the question was to try and replicate into the physical world the, the, the problem of computer-assisted versus computer-generated work, uh, raising the question of who is the author of the outcome of this piece, uh, is it the person that is riding the machine even though they have no idea what they're doing? Is it me who created the machine? Uh, is it perhaps the machine itself that should be granted authorship over this creation? Or perhaps there should be no authorship because this work is automatically belonging to the public domain because it is generated by a machine as opposed to being assisted by it. Um, and then at some point, we even removed the humans from the picture uh, and we just have those machines that create works. Uh, so as uh, Tingeli has uh, uh, illustrated us with uh, the automatic artist. And again, the question is raised. Well, of course, Tingeli has the copyright into the machine that is creating the art, but who has the copyright in the art? Is it Tingeli as a transitive mechanism or who else could have it? And is there even a copyright? Because in this case, there is no artist anymore. Uh, and then we can move on and we can see where now humans also start collaborating uh, with nature, uh, whether this is like with uh, biotech and bioengineering, whether it is like Thomas Saracino, which is uh, uh, collaborating with spiders in order to create his work. And again, the question then is like, who's the author? Uh, is the author the, the architect uh, that puts spiders into an aquarium? Or is the author the, the spider itself? Uh, is it a collaboration between them? And if it is a collaboration, should those creatures that have created the art also be considered co-artists or joint authors and therefore also have some kind of copyright. But as we all know, um, art created by animals do not, uh, there can be no copyright given to an animal because an author according to copyright law uh, can only be a human being or a company. Um, and, uh, and so we had the very interesting case of the selfie taken by a monkey, which raised a lot of questions whether the monkey himself could qualify for authorship or whether the photograph that has set up the schema for the monkey to be able to take a selfie should be uh, should be holding the copyright. Uh, eventually, the decision was actually this is probably uh, a work that does not qualify for copyright protection. So this question is not raised. Um, and then we move into away from nature into computers and machines. And then we start having all those uh, works of art that are created by computers. And again, comes the question of, well, who is the artist? Is there an artist? And uh, who could be uh, or should be the copyright owner of those works? And, uh, and the interesting question is that, again, copyright has uh, as a particular policy about works that are generated by machines. They do not distinguish between whether the machine is a, a digital 
software, whether it's a physical machine, but there is this very interesting distinction between the extent to which the creative endeavor was envisioned and foreseen by the artist. Uh, so of course, if we use like Photoshop or another uh, uh, digitally mediated tool for drawing, if I know what I'm doing, if I, if, I, if I envision the outcome, then it's assisted by technology. Whereas if I don't envision the outcome, then it is generated by the technology. And in this case, there is simply no copyright on the, on the outcome. Um, and then we have the process. Uh, so the artistic process in order to qualify for copyright needs to be an original process of creation that original in the sense that it originates from the artist. Uh, it cannot be copied. It cannot be done by someone else but the artist and so forth. And so again, this, this raises a lot of interesting questions, especially when we start moving into interactive type of art where uh, uh, the process of creation becomes increasingly a collaboration between the artist and the audience of the art. Um, we have some audience generated art. So John Cage, for instance, with the 433 minutes of silence, uh, where the work is actually generated by the sounds that the audience makes during this, uh, this silence. So again, uh, who is actually creating the, the work, what, who is part of the process of generation. Uh, and then we have like even further, we can move into cases in which the artist is actually not doing anything more but being a canvas uh, and inviting the audience to actually make the art to this canvas. So we have the example, for instance, of uh, Marina Abramovich. And then we move even further into ready-made um, where the process has disappeared or the process has become just the fact of claiming an object or the fact of signing, just the signature becomes the act of creation independently of what is the work. Um, and then we also have like a new artistic practice which includes procedures and instructions where the artist is not really doing anything but dictating specific set of uh, criteria or step-by-step uh, -step procedures that need to then be followed by anyone else that will implement and instantiate those procedures into a particular work of art. Um, and again, uh, at some point, we can move away. The, who, is, who is implementing these procedures, these instructions, is no longer a person. It can also be a computer. And then we move into the field of generative art. And then more uh, recently, uh, those procedures are not, not even specified anymore in a, in a deterministic manner. It's no longer the, the artist that stipulates here are the things that needs to be done. Now it becomes more of a, of a prompt, of a suggestion. There is no precise instruction, but the machine will listen to a prompt and then will start to use their own creativity, the, 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 their own choice of how to implement that prompt into something. Um, and that's like more the latent space type of um, generative art with AI. And then finally, uh, perhaps the most fundamental question, which is then what about the work? And so we can see how uh, in all those previous examples, the final work of authorship, which should be protected by copyright, is, 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 is mutating into many new forms uh, where the artwork is no longer the, the, the final tangible outcome, but it's the idea. It's the idea of John Cage of doing uh, a, a song of silence. It's the idea of Bonarelli to actually make artwork as the performance. So even if the artist is, is not doing the performance itself, it has conceived the notion of the performance. And then again, with uh, especially with like uh, new technology and AI, we have the artwork is not the outcome. The artwork is the algorithm, is the process by which the algorithm will be instantiated into an actual piece of work. Uh, and then in the case of AI, the artwork becomes the instruction. It becomes the, the prompt. It becomes what is the idea that the artist had that then will be implemented and instantiated by a particular AI. And, and this is all this to lead us to the most fundamental question, which is 
are we are we witnessing, especially with the advent of AI, but in fact much earlier as well, even before AI existed, even before digital technology existed, is there such a thing in which we have the, the notion of the artwork that is not the ultimate instantiation of the art piece, but is actually the protocol that has led to the artwork to emerge? Um, and this leads us to the discussion around protocolism, about this potential new artistic movement that I would like to name just as a way of hearing back the feedback of whether there are some artists that do recognize themselves uh, under this protocol. I've been, I've been testing this idea for a few years now, and uh, especially uh, with AI, but even, even others, there is a lot of artists that actually, it seems that it resonates with them. And so I would like to present the various definition of protocolism, and then we can open up to the discussion. Uh, so the, the, the essential concept, one of the preliminary pillars, the, the artist, a protocolist artist is not one that really materializes and manifests the artwork, but is the catalyst for others to be able to materialize the artwork, right? And so the artist is the one that conceives of the protocol, of the instruction, of the process by which the artwork can be made. It doesn't need to create those artworks. It just needs to conceive of the protocol for them to be able to manifest. And then it's other people, uh, whether those are humans, machines, anyone, anyone that can understand the protocol and will instantiate it in order to create those work in the physical or the digital world. Um, and then the protocol then is the art piece the creative and genius, the, the, the endeavor of creativity and originality is not in the ultimate piece or not only in the ultimate piece, but it's especially into the protocol. Um, and so the set of rules and guidelines that define the way in which art can be made is the actual art piece. And in order for this to be original enough to be an actual art piece eligible for copyright, perhaps, I don't know if copyright is capable of actually dealing with protocol is, but it, this protocol needs to be strong enough and recognizable enough that it can actually impregnate the author's personality. It can be able, when I see any work that came from the same protocol, I can always recognize the artist because I recognize the protocol as belonging to that artist, independently of who are the people that have implemented the work. Um, and so yeah, so the art is actually the recipe rather than the dish, but you can I can recognize the recipe as being part of this. That's the chef, this chef recipe. And every time someone is making this recipe, I recognize the chef that has invented the recipe. Um, and then interestingly, also because there is some kind of creative endeavor also in the implementation of the protocol, uh, a protocol protocolist artist is inherently a collaborative artist because there is always a, a, a layer of co-authorship that comes into the final work. Because everyone that implements the protocol into a particular piece of art, of course, also qualify as their own copyright because there is a particular degree of arbitrary capacity of originality in the way in which the artist, the, the, the final artist, has decided to instantiate the work. And so the finite piece of work that has been created is a collaboration and impregnate both the personality of the protocolist and the personality of the instantiator of the protocol. And they are both co-author in this final piece, although, of course, the protocolist is the sole author in the protocol as an art piece. So every protocol art generates other types of art, which are not protocols, but that are actually instances. And those are always co-authorship because, because of the creativity that is inherent into creating this work as well. Um, and then very interesting, there is this question of like, so copyright usually tries to protect authors against the reproduction of their works. In the case of protocolism, it's very different because reproduction actually means production. Uh, this means that all the artworks that are created, that are stemming from a particular protocol, they are art pieces into their own right. They are actually new work of art, but every single one of those new art pieces 
which are reproducing the protocol, are actually expanding the body of work of the protocolist artist, right? And so every time someone will implement my protocol, they are actually also working for me because they're actually making my art. And so that means that all of students I can express myself much more without having to do it all by myself uh, because many other people in the world are also doing, implementing my work, just like some artists hire assistants uh, to help them create more. In the case of a protocolist, you don't need to hire any assistant because artists actually willingly and voluntarily are helping you produce more work by instantiating the protocol. Um, and then, of course, finally, the question of copyright. Um, it is very complicated because this notion of protocol as art is, is very antagonist to the traditional way in which copyright has been formulated and designed uh, because it requires usually this fixation, whereas here the protocol gets fixated, but it only gets fixated once there is a work that is a new work that is actually being created. And so it is very difficult for the protocol, or protocol artists to prevent people from using the protocol because as such, they cannot leverage copyright law to that. Uh, also, it can be argued that the final work, the work that has instantiated the protocol, is probably uh, a co-authorship. And therefore, potentially, the protocol artist could claim some kind of copyright over the work that has created by someone else because that person has, can be regarded as a derivative work to some extent of the protocol artist. And, um, and so we have examples. So, of course, AI is perhaps the most obvious example of protocol art, where uh, the, um, the artist is the one that is AI or generative art. Uh, the, the artist is the one that is coming up with the ideas that is suggesting what the computer should do. Uh, but we have, we have previous examples of artists that perhaps didn't didn't recognize themselves as protocolists because protocolism didn't exist yet. Um, and but and yet, let me know. So Sol Levit, I think, is a very interesting example of uh, of a protocolist artist. Uh, but even like without knowing it, perhaps like Jackson Pollock is is kind of a protocolist, maybe against his own will, because whenever people are actually doing things that looks like Pollock, they are actually doing Pollock, uh, and everyone recognizes them as Pollock. And uh, this is actually enabling Pollock to continue to create because people are just implementing the protocol that, uh, that, he has, that he has created. And that protocol is so recognizable that anything that looks like Pollock is Pollock. Uh, and so again, this, this creates this interesting question between like, when is it infringement? When is it someone that is unfairly reproducing an artist, then in that case, that artist is probably not a protocolist. Whereas when the reproduction actually generates such, a, such an understanding that this is, this is the protocol of this artist, then all of a sudden, it, it, it doesn't longer feel like copyright infringement. It actually feel like people are continuing to produce works on behalf of the protocolist artist. Um, and then, yeah, maybe just as a last example. So this is like, my own attempt at uh, instantiating protocolism. Uh, I, I didn't know I was a protocolist artist until I started theorizing about protocolism. And then everyone made me notice that uh, my art actually falls exactly on point within the concept of protocolism. Um, and so the plantoid, which is a project that I've been doing now for a few, a few years, is, is pretty much this whole concept of protocolism, where the idea here is that uh, I, I invented, I conceived, I, I instantiated this, the initial prototype of the plantoid, which is this kind of blockchain-based life form that uh, collect cryptocurrencies and then use those cryptocurrencies in order to uh, create like a bounty and then inviting other artists to submit proposition about how they envision to create those, uh, those new versions of the plantoid. And then the plantoid will then hire with the cryptocurrency will hire the artist to create a new copy of itself. And so this project now exists for a few years and uh, the plantoids have been reproducing themselves. So we have now uh, 13 plantoids in the world. Uh, many of them I've made, but uh, some of them I haven't made. Uh, other people that submitted a proposition I've made. And it's interesting because it is precisely the notion of copy of protocolism in the sense that regardless of who has created the plantoid, 
uh, the planted concept is sufficiently strong that people recognize every single instance of a plantoid as also being part of my body of work, even to someone else as actually instantiated into the physical world. And so the, the people that instantiated it, of course, they do have copyright in the scripture that they have made in the creation, but they also have helped me uh, create more plantoids because my goal is that there is thousands and millions of plantoids in the world. Of course, I don't have the time and the resources to do this all by myself. And so the plantoids figure out a way to reproduce themselves on their own. Uh, and yet the aura of the plantoid project follows every single one of those instances and therefore the protocol of the plantoid continues to survive even in many years from now when I will never have anything to do with the plantoid project, yet every single instance will reproduce my protocol and therefore also will be eligible, I will say, to qualify as my particular body of work of art. Uh, so I will stop here because I think otherwise there is no more time. Uh, but maybe just the last point is, yeah, it's like the concept of uh, production and reproduction is very important because as a protocolist, uh, we have an incentive for as many people as possible to copy our works because copy is the way in which work gets produced. And so we are really shifting away from this concept of reproduction as something that is bad, that is copying and that is that is unfairly taking and free riding on the effort of the artist into something that is actually helping and contributing to the artist. Because if I like the protocol of someone and I implement it into the world, I'm helping them produce the work uh, in a way, in a distributed way all, all over the world. Um, so I will stop here. Uh, I'm happy to uh, have some feedback or questions or discussions. Okay, so um, um, the talk I'm going to give today is uh, augmentation of the senses or the machine becomes an idea that makes art. Uh, the title may remind you immediately of uh, a twist of uh, Solovit, uh famous uh, par um, uh, paragraph on, on, on uh, uh, art. And um, the, the name that um, uh, Primavera has mentioned several times. So uh, this, um, I feel a bit embarrassed to give this talk because it's a very old-fashioned. But um, um, and this talk benefits uh, also from several discussions with uh, Jeffrey in the uh, past decade, firstly in the 2011 and then in 2021. Um, and it's a kind of response also to the question that Lev Manovich has asked today, the relation between uh, the, uh, from technology, which has been accelerating, and uh, art. Um, that is the following question. What is the relation between digital art and its medium? Uh, we know that art is highly dependent on its medium, as historians and artists, as we have already heard uh, this morning, have been telling us for centuries. We also know that advances in technology are changing media all the time, and that this will only accelerate in the future. The relation between digital art and its medium, however, remains unquestioned, uh, even though today we have already heard it once. Um, in the future, academicians might have conferences called uh, Digital Art in the Age of X almost every year or even every few weeks because X will change rapidly. And if this is true, how then can we adjust the relation between dig digital art and its medium? Medium specificity is self-evident, but it doesn't tell us much about digital art. It only returns us to a, no, uh, a nominalism of art. For example, the kinetic art artwork and compu computerized music created in the 1950s and 1960s has largely been lost as there are no machines left that can play it. Similarly, if you, today you are given a, 50, uh, a floppy disk containing a digital artwork or game from the 1980s, uh, you will have difficulty finding a driver or computer capable of reading it uh, because digital art is so dependent on its medium uh, it is always already dead. Medium specificity is the name of this cemetery. 
Uh, looking back, we don't see uh, many cadavers of digital arts because their deaths are silent. They disappeared into a black hole of information. The faster the media develops, the quicker it will head towards death. New mediums arise and new works appear in the same way the gadgets update every season. Is this the destiny of all digital arts? Now, in order to examine the relation between digital arts and its medium, it may help to first examine the relation between arts and its medium in general, especially arts since the 20th century. We can generalize that in modern art, we observe a phenomenon. Thus to say, art resists against its medium and the limits imposed on the medium. In this process, art augments our senses so that a new reality can be revealed to us. This reality, in so far as it is beyond the limit of the conventional understanding of art, is always spiritual and mystic in nature. A common feature we find in modern painters from Malevich to Kandinsky. Um, if we follow Clement Greenback, that modern art starts with Edouard Manet, it was because Manet resisted against academic realism and painted a flatness which started what is now known as Impressionism, as Foucault told us in La Peinture de Manet. If Paul Cézanne is considered another pioneer of modern art, it is also because Cézanne always searched for a depth of being, a depth of being, a being through his canvas, as Merleau-Ponty told us in, uh, in his essay, I and Spirit. The gesture of resistance culminates in Marcel Duchamp's ready-made. We also saw the, the image in the previous talk. His phantom, which acts both as a scandal and a new possibility for art. Duchamp's work resists the limits of medium and negates the concepts of art. Art doesn't disappear. In this negation, instead, art is enlarged through Duchamp's work. That's to say, it is augmented. Therefore, one can understand that Duchamp remains one of the pioneers of modern arts and conceptual arts, as Joseph Kossuth suggests. In Duchamp, one sees art and I as idea and no longer art as art, as, for example, in Ed Reinhold. And I think this reminds us of what uh, Maurice has said this morning. Kossuth stated in his famous Arts after philosophy and after, we read here, all art after Duchamp is conceptual in nature because art only exists conceptually. Artist questions the nature of art by presenting new propositions as to art's nature. End of quote. Modern art paved the way for conceptual art or post 1963 art. As you know, in 1964, Andy Warhol exhibited his brewer boxes in the stable gallery on East 74th Street in New York City, indicating the end of modern art, according to the art critic and philosopher Arthur Danto. Conceptual art is uh, probably uh, the most in intimate friend to philosophy since Plato, who, as we know, opposes philosophy to art. In conceptual art, we see another form of resistance originates from philosophy, but also attempts to go beyond it and be its successor, to be the successor of philosophy. Art aligns itself with idea, for idea is that which develops. Idea is not limited to the canvas, and the idea moves in time and space. Idea is always an ecstasis in the sense of uh, uh, of this Greek word uh, used by Heidegger, always moving outside. An idea becomes a machine that makes the art, like what Saul Levitt wrote in his famous essay, Paragraphs on Conceptual Art. In the sense that the idea constructs and continues constructing the reality of the observer, the artwork no longer represents an object or an idea but rather the machine is identified with an idea that constantly actualizes itself. 
So what is an idea for the conceptual artist? It is not the platonic idea, meaning that which is in the other world, not in our world. Even though the conceptual artists were largely inspired by the analytic philosophy of language, especially that of Alfred Ayer, they are probably closer to the idealist, especially Hegel, though perhaps unconsciously. This is because they are all concerned with idea, and the idea is not a representation, but rather a movement. A movement is necessarily recursive, be that a koan, a let's say a paradoxical an uh, anecdote like one finds in Frank Stella, a tautology as in Crusoe, with the sword, or dialectics. For Hegel, the concept unfolds itself dialectically in time towards its universality and concreteness. And the life of the concept is called idea. Hegel becomes furious when his contemporary, Wilhelm Talgott Cook, provoked him by asking if the idealist could deduce a pen from thinking, from the mind. And Cook sees an opposition between idea and matter, where Hegel insists that the concept, the belief, is concrete and real. Conceptual art could have been material proof of Hegel's defense. Now, one may compare the abstract painting by Malevich, The Black Square, 1915, uh, that. Um, um, uh, oh, you kicked for me already. Um, uh, that uh, jo uh, um, um, Jeffrey mentioned uh, um, today that what really uh, left it, uh, impressed him. Uh, with the black, uh, black paintings of Frank Ste uh, Stella. The black square of Malevich resists the medium as a representation of an objective reality. On this, Malevich once said, I quote, I hope I have quote, yeah. Uh, up until now, up until now, there were no attempts at painting as such without any attributes of real life. Painting was the aesthetic side of a thing but never was original an end in itself." End of quote. By resisting the canvas as a medium which depicts a thing, Malevich makes the painting itself a thing. That's what, again, what uh, um, uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, was, was saying about today. He reinvented a new language of form, one that is more intimate to poetry and feeling than to rational thinking and objective reality. In the non-objective world, he stated, and we quote here, suprematism has opened up new possibilities to creative art, since by virtue of the abandonment of so-called practical considerations, a plastic feeling rendered on canvas can be carried over into space. The artist, the painter, is no longer bound to the canvas, the picture plan, and transform his compositions from canvas to space. In Stella's painting, we see the reminiscence of Malevich's black square, but Stella sets the image into movement. The idea becomes a machine that constantly produces a reality through the intuition of the spectators. The black square is set into movement recursively, and it is in this sense that we can associate with a machine or an algorithm today. This is significant for our standing of digital art, and I think, uh, it, and I think it's somewhat underestimated because the statement that idea becomes a machine that makes the art means precisely a repetitive process of production. Otherwise. Why is it necessary to compare the idea with a machine? In 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 the in the in the essay of uh, of Solovit, in the uh, suprematism of Malevich, we see the striving of feeling against the objective reality assigned to the canvas and the limits of time and space by the canvas as a medium. In Stella. We see the, this priority of feeling replaced by the idea which, like a machine, constantly produces a reality which is beyond the canvas. Retrospectively, we know that Stella has been regarded as a precursor to systems art, an art form inspired by cybernetics and coined by the art critic Lawrence Alloway in 1966. 
it is also via Stella's work that we can now move on to the question of digital art. The difference between digital art and painting or other kinds of analog art is that the medium of digital art is digital in nature, a tautology. It varies according to different protocols and levels of abstraction, but the fundament, the, fundament, the fundament of the medium is digital. But what do we mean by digital? We often think of it as what, zero and one. However, this binary representation is only one level of abstraction, or what I prefer to call one order of magnitude, an order of magnitude. For example, a cup of water consists of billions of particles. But when we drink water, we are not feeling the bouncing around of these particles in our mouth. Instead, we are sensing a cool and tasteless liquid running into our throat. The microphysical and the phenomenological situate in different orders of magnitude. Therefore, if we simply say that digital means zero and one, then we committed a theoretical mistake. Looking from two different orders of magnitude, one can claim that we live in a digital universe. Since everything is digital, we can find examples of these in theories such as Edward uh, Frecken and Friedrich Kittler, uh, Scott also mentioned about Kittler earlier. Or one can claim that the digital does not exist. Instead, what we experience are things, like some post-Heideggerians, uh, such as Graham Harmon, might claim. However, one commits an ontological mistake if one dimension is taken as an ent entirety. As we have established, the medium of digital art has changed dramatically since the first appearance of computer, gave rise to computerized music and then the emergence of computer network, which gave net, net art in the 1990s. But what lies in the genetic process of digital technologies? Maybe we can claim that in this process, there is a general tendency towards materialization, meaning that which was considered to be immaterial can now be captured, materialized and manu manipulated by computational devices, as we have seen also in Maurice's work. This general process of materialization creates new temporal and spatial dimensions for the creation of art. In terms of temporal dimension, we know that the, pho the, that the phonograph and the cin uh, cinematograph at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century introduced time-based media that stood in great contrast to painting and photography. These media allowed a exact repetition, which also produces an experience that is no longer conditioned by a unique time and space. This repetition of time is still in itself linear. That's to say, as a recording device, both phonograph and cinematograph introduce a repeat, re repeatable linear time. Digital technology fragments this linear temporality by turning every sound and image into grants, like sound grants. For example, we know that I with digital technology, it is possible to divide a second of sound into microsound, each of one million media second. Like what musicians Curtis Rose and Yanis Sanakis have demonstrated it in the granular synthesis, which opens up a new relation to the, indiv to the indivisible human experience. For example, I will not be able to perceive the millisecond as an individual sound, but only as a whole uh, that is already synthesized. Or as Leibniz says, when we hear the roar of the ocean, we don't really perceive the petit perception of the wave, but only a synthesis. But now we are able to manipulate these uh, petite perceptions. In and between these two orders of magnitude, that's to say, in and between the micro and the phenomenological, some inter-objective relations can be established through digital technologies which could be visually displayed. And I call inter-objective relations those which are independent of the association of human mind, but rather it is a constant materialization of relations thus discovered according to new epistemologies and technologies. 
An algorithm is not a recipe, because a recipe is a linear instruction. Cut the carrot, season them, and then put them in the oven. An algorithm can be linear, but what makes it powerful is its non-linearity, or more precisely, recursivity. This recursivity can be identified in the Turing machine and in Gödel's general recursive function. Um, and Scott has mentioned about Turing and Gödel in his first slides, which are the theoretical foundation of computation today. The algorithm takes over from the idea in conceptual art, and this is precisely what makes it necessary to reflect on the relation between digital art and conceptual art, between digital art and its own medium. Digital art no longer takes up the task of Malevich or Stella. Rather, it is capable of producing a reality materially constructed by data and which can, ev which can even be transformed into a physical existence through 3D painting. Today, maybe Hegel could proudly respond to, uh, to, to Herr Kuhl's criticism that you know, idealists cannot generate a pen with their might. Maybe Hegel could proudly respond by 3D printing him a pen. Um, we know that Marshall McLuhan once said that medium is the message, and it is. We have always ignored the medium and focus on the message without realizing that the medium is probably more significant than the message. This focus on the medium opens a new discipline in the 20th century, namely media studies as well as philosophy of media. The conceptualization of media as the extension of the central nervous system or technology in general as the extension of the body was a task of the 20th century and unfortunately is not our task in the 21st century because it does not take us far enough in this century and it does not yet touch the question of art. So let's ask more questions. How could digital art resist its medium? What do we mean? by resistance. Jean-François Lyotard, after his legacy, uh, after his legendary exhibition, Les Immatières, 1985, I showed the, the poster here, which we can call the postmodern exhibition. And I remind that postmodernism, as uh, Ishida-san said, is a manifestation of cybernetics and semiotics. Suggests to the artist Philip Pareno that he was thinking of organizing a sequel to Les Immatériaux titled Les Résistances, Resistances. It was not realized due to Lyotard's death in 1980, 1998. However, I believe that the resistance Lyotard was calling for is against what he saw as the limits of digital media. Lyotard sees the hegemony of digital technology as turning the individuals into database entries and governments into technocracy, a technocracy which for Lyotard is best demonstrated by Nicolas Luhmann's systems theory. So therefore he called uh, uh, Nicolas Luhmann a hypocrite. Today the medium is becoming even more hegemonic. And that is something we don't find with the canvas, because the canvas has never become hegemonic beyond painting, beyond the academy. Today, the medium on which digital arts find its existence does not belong to the arts academy alone, or to museums, or even to galleries, but rather to the industry. The digital information channel is where different domains that were unrelated before now converge because of this, today, we cannot easily distinguish artistic activities from financial speculations and entertainment, especially those embodied immersion experiences that create spectacular spots for tourism. If digital arts deserve the name art and not simply craftsmanship, it is because in comparison with a craft, the work of art is always at work, which Aristotle calls energia. But what is at work in a work of art? What is at work in a work of art? It is that which opens up what is closed, 
what is closed is always closed by its medium, because the medium itself and the conventional use of the medium impose limits to the art, to the work itself. A work of art does not exist without a medium. However, to resist the medium is not to abolish it. Malevich didn't destroy the canvas, and the surrealists didn't destroy cinema. Instead, they opened up new approaches to painting and to cinema. To resist means, first of all, to enlarge the medium of art, and with this enlargement, open us to a new reality. We might recall what Paul Klee says in his notebook, I quote, Art is what makes the invisible visible. Art is what makes the invisible visible. Visual arts indeed make what is invisible visible, since the invisible does not belong to the realm of vision. The invisible is not represented, uh, sorry, uh, the, since the invisible does not belong to the realm of vision, but the task of art for Claire, for Paul Claire, resides precisely on the resisting of, uh, sorry, pre, uh, resides precisely on the resting of the invisible. The invisible is not represented as such because the invisible is brought about by the visible that the painter is able to paint on the canvas. I rephrased Paul Claire's statement on the task of art as art is what makes the, in, in, makes the invisible visible. I, I talk about that in this book. Because sensible is not limited to vision, so I rephrase as art is what makes the visible sensible. The sensible is also pre present in other realms such as hearing, touch, smell, and taste. The five senses that Aristotle has already laid down for us in the anima, on the soul. One may argue that there are more sense organs than Aristotle, than Aristotle knew, but that is not the point because the augmentation of senses that we find in a work of art is not the extension of our sense organs that we can see one kilometer further or hear sound two kilometers away from us, for example. On the contrary, the augmentation of senses is an augmentation that opens us to a higher level of reality towards the open, uh, in the words of Paul Claire. Now, we moderns are no longer used to see the open, to the open as animals do. The Austrian poet Rainer Maria Rika says at the beginning of the eighth, of the eighth elegy of the Duenal Elegies, I, I cite here, all other creatures look into the open with their whole eyes, but our eyes turned inward, or set all around it like snails, <coughs> chopping its way out to freedom. The attempt to open is precisely a form of resistance, a resistance against its medium and the limits imposed on it. Such resistance is not a negation, but an opening of new paths towards truth, if we can use this word here. Today, through the use of augmented reality and virtual reality in art, can our senses be augmented? Nietzsche finds this possibility in Greek tragedy, where intoxication, uh, harsh, for him is such a means. Augmentation of the senses allow us to return scientific rationality to higher realm. Here, we may want to recall Nietzsche's remark in the 1972 edition of his Birth of Tragedy, that 16 years after the publication of the Birth of Tragedy, uh, Nietzsche wrote a new preface. We we'll read here. Nevertheless, I do not, I do not wish to suppress entirely how unpleasant it now seems to me, how alien it stands before me now after 16 years before an eye which has grown older a hundred times more fastidi fastidious, but by no means old, colder, an eye which could not be any the less prepared to undertake the very task that Odysseus' book ventured for the first time, to see signs under the optics of the artist, but us under the optics of life. 
this was written 16 years after the first appearance of the birth of tragedy. Nietzsche returns science to a broader reality called art or artistic re re creation and furthermore returns us to another broader reality called life. Life here does not mean biology, but rather the vitality that allows art to overcome its medium, namely creativity. To resist scientific rationality means transforming it instead of merely serving it. It means making science become a stranger to itself in such a way that it will have to return to itself in order to acquire a new, reality, a new finality. We can conclude now the art in relation to its medium consists in resistance against the limits imposed on the medium and the instrumentality of the medium itself. However, this resistance can only take place through its instrumentality. What is in question is not medium specificity, but rather its opposite. In other words, the materialization of spirit that we, are that we try to understand above is not contingent. On the contrary, it is necessary. Art makes such nece necessity contingent before turning it into, necess into necessity again. This negation of negation does not produce the same materialization of spirit, but rather a spiritualization of matter, in the, in the words of Bergson. Uh, I end here. Thank you very much for your attention. So I think now we have uh, time for a discussion before we move to a general discussion. Uh, so uh, it's a bit embarrassing that I'm the uh, moderator myself, but uh, I think we should actually open the, the, uh, the, open the, the question to the floor uh, for this session. So maybe first of all, I can, you know, as a, I have to function as a moderator as well. So maybe I can raise a question to you, uh, Um I'm wondering what you called a prot protocolism. Um, uh, I mean, for example, uh, if we use Mid Journey to create uh, image to art, create artwork, we uh, is it also for you a kind of protocolism, or do you have a, a, a more uh, precise definition of uh, protocolism? Um. I do not have a precise definition of protocolism. I'm, I'm still trying to elaborate it. Um, I think yeah, Mijan is, is an interesting question because so the, the, I think the distinction of when something qualifies as protocolism or not is that the instantiator of the protocol, in this case, that will be Mijarni, has enough um, creative space to to generate the, the, the artwork according to the protocol. Midjourney is a complex one because I think the question is really like, is prompting enough of a protocol that you will be able to recognize the artist into the outcome, the, the protocolist artist, right? So I think there can be some Midjourney protocolists, but that means that they have innovated into the prompting of mid journey, so that every time somehow someone is reinstantiating this protocol, in this case it's mid journey, but like anytime someone will be prompting mid journey in the same way as this original protocolist artist, you will recognize the outcome of mid journey as also belonging or instantiating that protocol, right? So I think today, because there is not like today we just have like prompt engineers. Um, I, I don't know of any protocolist artist that has really been so creative into the prompting of mid journey or any other type of AI as to really qualify as the protocolist in the, in the sense that the protocol is, is the art piece as opposed to just mid journey creating some kind of Latin space type of art. Uh, but I don't think it's impossible, especially probably more like with stable diffusion in which you, you actually have much more uh, freedom into like, how do you, how can you navigate and prompt and, uh, and trigger the, the, the latent space? I think I wouldn't be surprised if at some point you do recognize that. And I will, I will go further where maybe like when it's just prompting an image, it might be harder, but now, you know, you have like all those, uh, those protocols actually about like, you know, creating those uh, 
uh, creating those protocols that you can give an image and somehow it animates the image or it, 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 it contextualizes the image into a particular thing. And in this case, those protocols, they can be regarded as protocolists. If I create a script that uh, is allowing a particular function within the navigation of the latent space, and everyone that used that same protocol is therefore instantiating my art piece, then I think you can. Um, but I think in, in just like a textual prompt, it might be a little bit difficult. I don't know, maybe it's possible, but it might be a bit difficult to really create something so original and distinctive as to actually qualify for protocolist art. Uh, but when it comes to like creating videos or, uh, you know, like using the Latin space, like the navigation, I think the paths of navigation into the Latin space could clearly be a protocolist artwork. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, uh, your distinction when you say that uh, we can uh, we can imagine that somebody being uh, doing an artistic work if it's distinctive enough. Uh, actually, there are many artists on uh, on uh, Mid Journey, like in Stable Diffusion, uh, that are very recognizable. Oh, I see. You see. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. I didn't see the picture. <laughs> what the video you see. Uh, yeah, th there are many artists. Uh, thinking of uh, Matthias de Campo, Cesare Bastelli, uh, Batelli, uh, and uh, and um, yeah. This this morning we had uh, Lev Manovich who presented uh, different works that are very specific with specific topics and uh, and the result is uh, what you can recognize as his work. So um, I think it goes totally in your direction. And, uh, so there is. Uh, I just wanted to to point that. Uh, Professor Richard Allen online have a question, so I'll direct him in. Hi, I have a I have a comment on um, Primavera and then a, a, a broader uh, a reflection on on Yuk's presentation. Uh, on Primavera's presentation, I wondered whether the type token distinction might help you here. Um, I, and you know, I was thinking of the analogy with uh, with with works of performance. Uh, you know, say in a theatre where you have a you have a script and and then you have different performances of it, and of course the different performances of it or instantiations of it they they might not just be performances they could be films um th those different instantiations type uh, token instantiations of the type the the script are themselves individual artworks as uh, but the script is also or the the it can be the, the the drama is itself an individual artwork and and so it seemed to me that that your a protocol art uh, characterization um, seem quite close to the kind of uh, type token distinctions that we make when we're thinking about um, uh, performance-based art, and um, that you can have uh, an artist who creates the the what I'm calling the type, which is your protocol, um, and then also artists creating tokens of the type. Uh, which are partly their works, but also partly drawing on what you call the protocol, which in this case would be the 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 drama or the template. So it seems to me that we might have models in the field of art for the kind of uh, uh, process that you're describing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in fact, there is like this uh, this interesting question around like music. I think music is perhaps the the most obvious yeah. one where yeah. you have a musical score and then you have performers, interpreters that are playing that score. And of course, there is always like every performer is choosing how to, to perform the score. So in some way, like the question then is really like, is music like the, the archetypical type of uh, um, protocol art? And I think the, the possibly, yes. Uh, I think the, 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 the distinction is where, uh, to which extent is there an, an amount of freedom that is left to the interpreter. Uh, and I think whenever the interpreter is uh, is adding its own uh, its own arbitrary, discretionary, uh, original capacity in the way in which it is instantiating the protocol, 
then I think we are into a situation where we are in, in a protocolist uh, uh, situation uh, where the performer is more of like a technical engineer that is just like step by step following very strict and deterministic rule. Then we are actually just in the sense of someone is instantiating a work, but the, the protocolist situation is where you're providing a recipe and then you're leaving enough space of adding the creativity of whoever is going to instantiate. And again, music and uh, dancing and performance are all those things that are like, it's this very weird area in which, of course, there is always some degree of creativity that comes from the, from the performer. Uh, to which extent is this degree of creativity sufficiently large that it's not just a reproduction, but that it is actually a production. It's, it's producing a new work that is expanding the body of work of the protocolist artist, as opposed to just being a manifestation of it. Right. I would like to, to add something, because just in the same direction. Um, yeah, I think the music score is a very good example of uh, a set of constraints and rules that determine a different kind of execution, but still playing the same thing. But now, what happens if we make the difference between the instrument and the score, between the piano and the piano score, uh, music score? Because the piano has constraints the notes are divided according to their frequencies. Uh, and you can put the finger in a certain way on them. And the process of creating a sound is the same. But you can have a wide diversity of production out of that. When the score, uh, you have to follow the linearity. And you, you make the difference. I think it's important. You, you have to follow a linear process which is very, uh, a very strong, uh, stringent constraint. And so maybe the difference is there. And we are embarrassed with AIs because uh, when they propose such a rich material in terms of, uh, in terms of medium, uh, that it goes beyond the instruments, but it's not, it's not yet a score. Yeah, I think that uh, yes, it's very really interesting because I feel like the AI is a very specific thing, right? Because the AI, as opposed to uh, as opposed to generative art, when when you're doing generative art, uh, the computer, the software, has no discretion, has no possibility to. It has like maybe it can create random numbers, but uh, it doesn't have what we define as like creative discretion or creative endeavor. Uh, it's just implementing the, the, the artists say create a random number, it's creating a random number, right? When, when we move into this more AI machine learning type of AI generated work, you're actually, it becomes closer to protocol is because you're actually asking the, the computer, the, the AI software, please, this is what I would like you to do. This is my instructions. This is my prompts. And please do something about it. And different, different latent space will generate something different. Different AI algorithm will generate something different. This is not deterministic in the same way as generative art is deterministic. So generative art is, is, is an instantiation of something. It's like technical. It's an, the, the AI software is a technical engineer that is following rules. Whereas the AI latent space type of uh, software is not just a technical engineer. It uses its own neural network and whatnot in order to generate a, a particular thing according to its own. It's a collaboration between the prompter, which provides the protocol, and the AI. And, and oftentimes, the, the person that is prompting doesn't really know, is oftentimes surprised right, by the result because there is this discretion that comes also from the other side. And it happens that the other side is a machine as opposed to a human, but in the, in the end, it's the same. 
Thank you very much uh, for the, the very uh, impressive presentation. And uh, I have a question about the protocol because um, uh, this is a very interesting concept. But uh, what jumped to my mind, that is, before AI, the art practice uh, before, always, um, this kind of uh, phenomenon we encountered a lot already. So maybe you can help me to, to, to figure out what is the right direction, like the painting you mentioned. But uh, on painting, we know that uh, paintings nowadays, uh, maybe in, uh, for some artists, when he or she produced the painting, actually it's not produced by herself or himself. In fact, it's a group of people that work be, uh, behind him. Let's say uh, the Chinese painter that we know very well, uh, Yue Minjun, the big laughing face. Actually, the mass, yeah, obviously, is a mass, mass production by a factory. <laughs> so, um, th 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 definitely a group of people working be for him. In this case, and this concept can, can, can it be applied on this kind of art practice? Um, another thing uh, that, that jumped to my mind is the architecture, architect. So he, uh, let's say, um, once he have the concept of, uh, of, the, of the whole architecture, but it's a group of pe it's people behind him to, to, to build the, the, the building. It's not just one person. And also one thing that I um I can figure out is the uh the instruction instructional art in the sixties um by uh the Francis artist, uh, one of them that everyone know is Yoko Ano, that is just give a statement and let people to interpret. And for a period of time it's a kind of uh trendy things and the art, uh, art, uh, art scenery. So the artists only give a, a, a word or, or, or a sentence. So the outcome is not interpreted by him or her, it's by the participants. Let's say uh, Maurice uh, Brain Factory uh, is the same concept. That is, uh, the, the system is there but uh, the outcome is produced by the participant. So maybe you can help me to figure out uh, uh, how to make your, 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 your concept more concrete. Yeah, thank you. I think those are good examples to try to discern what is protocolism and what is not. Um, so I would say, first of all, when you have like, and we have a lot of uh, artist studios, uh, or like assistance or like when you when you have an artist that is hiring people to help in the production um again we're talking about production as opposed to creation right so if i have the whole vision of what i want to make and uh but i don't have enough hands and time then i can hire people and i can create like a mass production of like all my works those people are technicians those people i do not invite them to co-create with me or to fill up the gaps that i'm like giving them i'm not it's not intended to be a co-creation it's intended to be my creation that i hire people they could be machines right that are just implementing step-by-step -step rules so in this case this is not protocolist this is just like mass production of art by delegating tasks to assistants, right? Uh, and I would say a lot of the artist studios is this type. Those are, it's not because a protocolist doesn't mean that the artist, it's not an, any situation in which the artist is not doing everything, doesn't make it protocolism. The protocol is really specific when there is an intention from the side of the artist to create a protocol as opposed to creating a finite piece and to let the rest of the world, humans and machine and whatnot, to fill up this gap according to their own artistic creativity and endeavor. So 
the example that you give about uh, hiring people to help on the production of a work, I would I'd say it's not protocolism. In the case of architecture, similarly, the architect is actually envisioning the project. Of course, the architect cannot do anything. Uh, the architect is like is the is the is the artist conceptualizer, and then have to hire people like building stuff and etc. But they are they are working for the artist as opposed to working with the artist. Um, and in this case, again, this is not protocolism. That doesn't mean that you cannot have protocolism in architecture. You could have a protocolist architect that is creating a protocol. This is how other architect builds buildings or design buildings, right? And every architect now that will follow that protocol will be a protocolist, well, will be instantiating, manifesting the general protocol vision of the original architect. In that case, so when you are a protocolist, you are on an equal standing fit. It's just that the protocolist is on at the meta level of creating the artist piece is the protocol. So you could have someone that is not an architect that is creating a procedure and a protocol for architect to then implement into their own artistic endeavor. And then every architect that is implementing that protocol is instantiating the work of the protocolist artist. Uh, the last example, the process art is actually, I would say, a very good example of protocolism, right? Which is where the artist in this case is throwing the protocol to the world and inviting people to adopt this protocol and to instantiate it. And the instantiation is not just follow my rules, it's implement and instantiate those rules into your own creative endeavor. And so you become a co-author of the ultimate piece, as opposed to just being a technician, as in the previous example. Does, does that help the, the, the defining the distinction? Yeah, I have, uh, <clears throat> I have a very precise question. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, can we say that uh, God is the first protocolist artist? I'm thinking about the prompt, uh, let there be light. We talked about that this morning. And uh, is it uh, one of the original prompts? And uh, should this be a model for the humankind? And I'm sure in all religions, we could find some equivalent of uh, uh, protocolism applied to the world. Um, I've never thought about this question, so I, I'm just going to improvise. Um, I will say that I will say not um, because because it's not perceived as a protocol, right? It's not something that um, I think there is something different in creating things. So if we if like God has created like nature, humans, animals, whatnot, um, but it's not an invitation for the for those creatures, for those beings to somehow, uh, it's both for, it's for an invitation for those, for those creatures to make their own performance, but it's not about instantiating a particular protocol. And uh, there, there is no co-creation in that sense as to like, um, it's like if we, we play God now because now we're creating our little robot and we're creating our AI, but it is not, it is not inviting those creatures to instantiate the protocol. They are instantiated already. And then they just leave off that instantiation as opposed to, uh, I would say if God was a protocolist, there would need to be other gods that are following the God protocol. <laughs> You know what I mean? So again, it, it has to be on the same layer. Um, what, is the like what is a set of rules uh, would be the genesis? You take the genesis and you say, this is a set of rules and now you can go spread uh, over the planet and decide of your life. And this is very participative and, uh, with uh, the engagement of people that make uh, create cities and uh, kill each other and uh, improve these narratives uh, that destroy the planet and all these things. So <laughs> I mean, take, take the Ten Commandments, right? So the Ten Commandments, I don't think are 
qualifying as a protocol real it's, set. I, I didn't go that far, you know. No, I, no, I know, I know. I, but... was just, uh, I was just stopping after the genesis, the seventh day. <laughs> Uh, and, and yeah, they, I mean, I, I don't know. This is, a, this is an interesting question. I have not thought about it enough to provide a proper answer. But yes, my intuition is that it requires more, um, more of a, an invitation to play with me, uh, as opposed yeah. to that, um, to just like Maurice live your a life. Show called uh, Morphogenesis, and I'm wondering, would there be Morphogenesis without Genesis? Are you are you in, are you instantiating God's protocol? Sorry. No, I, I don't mean that. Yeah. You don't have to answer. Don't have. There's no answer to that. No, no. Yeah. No, no answer. Sorry. Just a comment. Right, you okay. were saying. Yeah. Didn't didn't. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I was wondering. You know, Yuk's augmentation of the idea. Should we go back to Yuk's paper? Or, or is sorry. I mean, that's it's, it's like I think we are uh, still in the uh, discussion. Okay, good. More, more on protocol before before that. Somebody else should come in on protocol before uh, we go to Yorks. Right. So, um, any anyone would like to come in on protocol? To... Yeah, please. Hello. Um. So I pretty much would like to give my response to the interesting discussion about whether now AI can take the position of the co-authorships as compared to piano, which is like an instrument in the artwork production process. <coughs> so I would uh, add some information. So um, actually, I'm, uh, I'm a student in AI from Belgium. So this is something I'm really interested in. So when we talk about um, creativity or creative models such as stable diffusions, we are talking about a class of um, AI, which is known as generative adversary legworks. So this kind of legworks um, is actually basically we, how we call it is a data-driven probability machines. So it is driven by three factors for its success. So one is the amount of data you can provide for the training of these uh, machines, such as the image and the text you provide to it. So this is data. And the second is the complexity of architecture of these machines. And the third one is the kind of noise or chaotic factor you put to these uh, probability machines that will give you different uh, response each time um, to the same prompt. So for instance, you prompt it, give me a cat, it will give you something different each time because there is something under the hook generating a noise or a chaotic factor to it. But in fact, these systems, as for my understanding, is basically still deterministic because it is constrained by uh, the type of data you put in, the architecture, which is deterministic. And the last thing is there's, there's no pure random uh, algorithm to generate a chaotic factor to this model. So in fact, the latent space, however um, flexible it is, it still acts like a piano, but it's much more flexible piano. So for, for me, an AI is still like a, um, like a piano, it's like an instrument. But the maker of it, the AI is like the manufacturer of yeah, the instruments. Uh, yeah. So I would like to see what would be uh, your uh, response or opinions on this. Yeah, I think that um, it's more of a matter of uh, degrees, right? Uh, I mean, we could also go further if you like and question like whether, uh, you know, are humans deterministic? What's the extent of free will and things like this? Um, but from all practical matters, 
It's about how do you use the tool, right? Uh, when I use a piano, I know exactly what I'm going to get. Not exactly, but after I, I play with the piano for a while, like, I have a very good confidence of uh, what will come out when I click which button. And uh, I have... I have, I have the capacity, therefore, of predicting and foreseeing and envisioning how to play the piano in order to obtain exactly what I want to obtain, right? So regardless of whether the, the, piano, um, the piano maker uh, intended it, I have, I have a tool which now has a, a high degree of predictability on its outcomes. When you look at an AI, independently of whether the AI is deterministic or not, the question is, to which extent me, when I'm interacting with this tool, I have the capacity to predict, to foresee, and therefore, to which extent can I use it as a tool, as opposed to using it as a, as a co-creator, right? Um, and, and you could say the same with like, people, right? If I give very strict instruction to people, I can have confidence that my assistant will actually do exactly what I ask to do. And in that case, that's not protocolism. If I ask a person that is not my assistant, uh, I cannot predict, and I say, here is my instruction, but I cannot predict. And the, the, the instruction are broad enough that I cannot have a very uh, foreseeable outcome then in that case, it's a very different way in which I'm using that tool. And so I think to me, what we need to look at is not the deterministicness of the tool, is the scope at which the person using the tool has the capacity to envision and to foresee the outcome of its interaction with the tool, as opposed to providing an initial set of instruction and then letting the tool process that and generate something that could not be foreseen by the original creator. You might you might be able to to foresee the the scope you you are because the instruction is of of course scoping the outcome, but you have no idea what will this machine or what will this person actually produce, right? And so it's again like yes, you can you can if if you go into the technical details, we can argue for uh, hours. Uh, whether or not there is some determinist into machine AI and people. Uh, but I think it's much easier and, and more practical to look at it from the perspective of the user of the tool and the extent to which the user know, foresee, and can predict the outcome versus, versus just be able to limit the scope in which the outcome can exist. Well, if I can say something, I think that you know most of the creation that we made, um, uh, whatever fabricates object is always already a co-creation with a tool, with something, with a technical, with, with technical means. But we humans, we always give the of the the the, uh, the authorship to the human, so we don't recognize the agency of things, and therefore you have a Bruno Latour's discussion proposal of the parliament of things, but giving agency to things, and so it, you know if we can talk, if we take, we, we go in this direction, we see that you know every creation is always or already a, a co-creation, but we didn't we refuse to recognize the agency of things. But I think the difference is um, that the, the question that uh, the, 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 key po the key answer to your question is the difference between a tool and an instrument. A tool is not an instrument in the sense that a tool is always the means to an end. So, for example, I use, I use a hammer to, to hit a, a, a nail, for example, that's a means to an end. But it, it, it's, a it's a piano, a tool. Uh, I'm not sure if a, a piano is a tool because the instrument is also something that instructs me, um, um, and and it is a, a, a process of if we create a work is also not the um, not strictly speaking um, uh, the means to the end, but rather there is a, a particularity in the in the in in um, that we can find in the in the instruments that cannot be reduced to a tool. Uh, so if you so to, there are many ways to I think there are many ways to to address your question, um, and um, 
there are of course also about uh, these are also ways to you know how we understand our relation to AIs. You know what kind of uh, agency do you want to give to AI? Do you want it to be a tool? Do you want it to be an instrument? Uh, uh, how much we can recognize it? Uh, that would be my response. Other questions? Yes, Ron. Uh, I'd like to expand your duality of uh, instrument and tool to instrument, tool, and machine for this discussion. And, but also, I'd like to go back to the issue of uh, random numbers and predictability. Because as far as I know, uh, there are no practical implementations of true random number generators. Right? Everything is an approximation. Depending on our own skill, experience, and abilities, our, our own ability to distinguish the output as being truly random or a pseudo-random number, it, it, that's dependent on our skill. Our skill in an understanding of an AI machine is also determining whether or not we can predict the output. Our skill and experience as a chess player, a grandmaster after three moves in a, on the chessboard is able to predict the outcome of that game. Myself, being far from it, after 17 moves, I still don't know who's going to win. So there needs to be some standard or criteria of what manifests understanding. And I think this is something that's very difficult to achieve. Yeah, um, if I can answer to that, like again, I think that um I think like there, there is there is the, the objective question and then there is the subjective question, and uh, I think the objective question probably the answer is that with enough understanding and knowledge of the world, potentially we can always predict everything. Uh, but the subjective question I think is the most interesting one, which is the artist that is making use of these external thing. Uh, thing or person, right? So you're externalizing to a third party the possibility of instantiating a protocol which is not fully, which is not designed and intended to be fully deterministic, right? Uh, so again, it, it's a matter of like to which extent my my stipulation of the protocol has been crafted in such a way as to leave space or not leave space for discretion, right? And secondly, is to which extent is my understanding of how other actors, humans or machine, that instantiate the protocol, to which extent do I have enough understanding of how they operate in order that I can guide them into getting exactly where I want to go, as opposed to invite them to have their own little journey, uh, as long as this journey fit within the constraints of the protocol that I have set up. And so again, I think when we take a subjective approach, it becomes much easier to discern between what is obviously a protocolist artwork, what is obviously not. And then of course there is always the gray area, right? Like there is there are places in which we're not sure. And in fact, sometimes, it, it depends, right? It depends on what is the party on the other side, uh, to which extent the party on the other side is also exploiting that space that has been left to them in order to use their own discretionary creativity or whether they are not exploiting it at all and they're just going to do the most obvious implementation. So I think we cannot really have a very precise definition when we're talking in like pure theoretical absolutes, but whenever it comes to subjective uh, instantiation, but from the side of the protocolist of like, to which extent the intention is to leave space for unexpected and from the part of the instantiator that has or doesn't have that space of freedom to, to instantiate by adding their own their own contribution, uh, creative contribution, then it becomes quite more easy at least. And, and granted, there is always this place in which we are unsure and 
to me, that's the, actually the most interesting spaces. So this is this gray area in which it could be a protocol, it could not be a protocol. Um, it could be it could be just too much of a protocol as to uh, be too deterministic, and in this case, that might no longer be protocolist. Uh, but this is something that needs to be assessed uh, on a case by case basis by by understanding the subjectivities of the people that are partaking to that. It sounds to me then that your idea of a protocol is more similar to Yuk's idea of an instrument than it is to the idea of a tool. Where uh, I think I think again the, if the tool is just something that is intended to implement something that I have a very precise vision for, whereas the instrument is more like something that helped me into this endeavor, but the instrument is itself participating to the to the instantiation, then yes, I would say that uh, uh, you instrumentalize people and machine to implement your protocol, but you don't you don't use them as tools. Because if you use them as tools, you go back to the artist studio, which has a lot of tools, whether those are people or machines, uh, which are which are fulfilling very precise instruction. Uh, and in that case, we're way far away from the protocolist approach. But instrumentalization, while leaving space of discretion, then we are in a protocolist uh, situation. In, in this context, when we get to the general discussion, I'd very much like to hear from Scott more about the idea of non-algorithmic AI and the implication in this context. Could I ask you, you, is it okay to move on, ask you a question? No, it's, that's, that's a very vague one. Uh, and I, I'm fascinated, I wondered if you could elaborate. I, I'm quite fascinated on your notion of conceptual art um, or, or, the, or what conceptual art is um, and, 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 and how you relate it to, um, well, especially how you relate it to Hegel's idea, because um, it's obviously not just important to you, but it's important. And um, so how you can, not, not exactly, but a vague line from Hegel through Kosuth and Lewitt, not necessarily them, you know, and the whole uh, kind of pretty fascinating discourse and debate around conceptualism it was the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, wasn't it? There was that show. Um, because I think that it says something um, and that, um, you know, a lot of what we see as media art is also very much conceptual art. Um, so just, I'm wondering if you could uh, just elaborate on that a bit because it's bloody well complex and I got a few hints from where you're going from your paper, but I want a few more. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Scott, for this question. It's a rather complicated question because this is a more a question of history of thought. You know? So, you know, you, I think, you know, because when I talk about the idea of Hegel, and we know that, uh, you know, for, for, for Hegel, the uh, development is, uh, or, um, well, the development of the world, or even the development of the history, is always the the, the kind of a, um, um, uh, the, the kind of self-actualization of the idea. You know, the idea or the the idea. What he called it, the idea is the co the life of the concept. So the concept always actualizes itself in movements towards a uh, concreteness, towards universal and the concrete. So anyway, so we can see in that way that uh, the whole world could be, um, or history in general could be understood as different concepts in movements, and these are we call ideas, not the idea, um, that the, uh, for, for example. Uh, but these idea, or what are the, or this, the movement of this concept are always in a recursive form. That means the concept returns to itself in order to know itself. Now this may sound really weird for many people who didn't study Hegel. How could the concept return itself in order to know itself? But this is precisely what makes what gives the concept life. 
the, when the concept possess life, then it is an idea, an idea in perpetual movement towards universality and concreteness. Now, I, I, for myself, I think it is, is the greatest invention of Hegel, uh, and you know, beyond Fichte and beyond Schelling, uh, uh, that make make uh, really Hegel a true, uh, uh, um, uh, abs absolute um, um, idealist. Now, what is interesting, what I found in conceptual in in conceptual art, uh, in the work of uh, Cousart or of uh, um, Saul Levitt and others, many artists, uh, as we know, the post uh, the so-called post uh, 63 uh, art, is that there is a strong concept or this strong concept of the idea in movement. Yeah. Um, so suddenly we we see we see like for example uh, the idea become a machine that makes art you know there was a kind of the idea become something that has a life and it constantly produce and reproduce itself and the con that that is the, the that's the conceptual art we find it in Solovit we find it in, in Crusoe and and many others. Um, so far, it is this. Uh, f uh, that's why I said that the the conceptual artists are quite close to to uh, to Hegel's idea. I mean, of course, when we even think of uh, Andy Warhol, when in the in the nineteen sixty four uh, interview, Warhol says that all I want to do is to become a machine. Uh, all I want to do is become a machine. How idea become a machine? Um, so this I will see as one of the realization or the kind of incarnation of the Hegelian idea. Uh, idea. Uh, but I think that we are no longer in the in the epoch of the of the conceptualist uh, conceptual artist. We are in the third uh, uh, stage where we can understand where we can really understand the, uh, or how to see how this conceptualize or Hegel's understanding of idea could be actually implemented in a recursive algorithm. Uh, and um, I think it is the most important this is the most most important thing uh, that actually many people still didn't recognize. One of the person who recognized this is a, a German cybernetician called Gotthard Günther. Uh, Gohaf Günther has written a thesis on Hegel's logic in in in, in Berlin uh, before he escaped to to the uh, USA where he uh, encountered cybernetics and later he became a cybernetician himself. And according to um, Go uh, Gohaf Günther has a very interesting book uh, called um, 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 what is it called? Das das Bewusstsein der Maschinen, uh, uh, die Metaphysik der Kybernetik, uh, the uh, consciousness of machine, the metaphysics yeah, of cybernetics, crazy. and where he makes the claim that cybernetics, uh, uh, cybernetic machines are that which realize Hegel, Hegel's logic. Uh. Mm. So in in the way we can see that today, what we are seeing with uh, alg with algorithms, especially machine learning and a certain kind of uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithm that use in artificial intelligence, well, of course, these are all really recursive uh, uh, algorithms, and that uh, is a second stage, you know, after the conceptual artists that realize really the Hegelian. Uh, or is idea. it a second stage after generative? Art and uh, digital generative art. Right, exactly. So, yeah. So, in the way that I think that if, you know, if I didn't say anything about protocolism, but for me, I think protocolism is uh, uh, protocolism is certain is also an idea, an idea that is in movement. But I would think that it is still <laughs> belong to conceptual. Uh, if I I would classify as and that belong to this to the to the to the uh, what I call the first stage. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's still, I mean, I suppose the question is what, not not so much what exactly was going on with Kosuth and Lewitt then, but what can it tell us now, which I think which are, is what you're trying to do through Hegel. Um, yeah, and recursivity. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still getting my head around it. So you, in some ways you understand Selbstbewusstsein in Hegel in terms of... We'll have another discussion about that later. Right, but, the, last, yeah, yeah. the last but, paragraph of the phenomenology of spirit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, ma amazing. Um, but but I, I wonder, uh, the, the question is, that made me, Philippa, Philippa, right? Philippa, Philippa, right. Um, you, you talk like a lawyer. 
<laughs> Sorry, is that rude? Because uh, you are a lawyer, right? But she's a legal scholar. You're a legal scholar, but you do talk like a lawyer. You use the language of case all the time, you know? And I'm thinking of lawsuits. <laughs> I'm not being r rude. Um, and I'm thinking of, uh, I suppose, a dinner when, when Rem Kulas built the, uh, the Berlin, uh, the, the Dutch embassy in Berlin. And the guy who, uh, the architectural theorist, you will remember his name, French, you know, really famous French architectural architecture theorist. They're having a discussion on lawsuits. <laughs> lawsuits in architecture, yeah. You know, you know what, at what point can, can, you, can you pursue it? You know, at, at what point is it, a, is, it, is it the realization or the implementation or working in the context of a protocol? You know, if you go out to, um, we've got a few Australians here, right? Oh, ever, so many. You know, you, you go to the Museum of the, uh, the, Museum of the Moving Image in, in Melbourne. It, it is a Liebeskindian, but it's not Liebeskind. And I guess Liebeskind never thought it was a copy, you know, in order to sue. Um, I'm just wondering how that works. <clears throat> and I suppose the last, you know, and how that might relate, and coming back to Yuk again and to Asia. Um, okay, so there's that lawsuit question. Um, but but I, I was just thinking about the notion of the copy. <laughs> and... Um, you know, and, and, and creativity, because the, you know, the let there be light. No, no, there's no let there be light without creation. Yeah, yeah, it, well, there isn't. And, 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 and there's no, um, and there's no um, Eastern, Eastern thought, you know, there's no creation, there's no revelation, and there's no redemption, you know, and you, you're going from a different space. And the copy, the translation of Walter Benjamin, you know, the, the bits where he's breaking with creation. Um, I think, so, so I, I just wondered, you know, if, if we, I suppose I'm breaking this out into a very general discussion. Um, maybe first about the, uh, you know, which is the copy and which isn't, you know, in protocol um, for these architects. And the other is, um, why, why can't wonderful art be... Uh, be, 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 be a copy, or be the copy, or be a translation, you know, rather than a creation. Okay, I'll shut up. Yeah. So I, mean, I, I think because I think we have uh, only 15 minutes before oh, before seven. I think we can already uh, you know make it a general yeah. discussion. Okay. So. Uh, About about the fact that uh, Primavera uh, speaks like uh, a lawyer, and I think <laughs> I think I think it's uh, important because she uh, she is qualified. Uh, but uh, I just would like to remind something briefly: is that the law define what is art, and the example of Brancusi uh, in uh, in the thirties. Uh, when he uh, he wanted to import to to take uh, uh, bird in space to New York uh, with uh, for the exhibition curated by Marcel Duchamp, uh, this changed the definition of art by saying that art doesn't necessarily resemble to the subject. Yeah, if I, if I can if I can add and and respond to the. Uh to the previous question. Um, yeah, first of all, apologies if I speak like a lawyer. So I guess that's a, <laughs> a collateral effect of hanging out with too many lawyers. Um, but I think it like my, my I'm a copyright lawyer and uh, pretty much all my career I'm trying to uh, argue that copyright while uh, might perhaps have been useful uh, in the early days, uh, is actually either ineffective today in the sense that it doesn't uh, it doesn't understand the new artistic practices, and it's either ineffective because it just doesn't protect some of the art that is being created nowadays, 
And it's also constraining in the sense that there is a lot of art that cannot exist because copyright is too protective on one on one side and not enough protective on the other side. Um, but to answer your question about like the copy and this whole thing, so copyright. Sorry, I'm going to speak. I'm going to answer like a lawyer. Um, copyright law is very specific in what can be protected and what aspect of that protected thing. Uh, is protected, and uh, and it's 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 about substantial similarity. It's it's really about it's about the expression, right? It's about how things have been expressed into a particular medium of expression, and and this is, I think, why I really like uh, protocolism as such because it kind of like escape completely uh, from from this type of copyright. Uh, protection and restrictions, because when it, and and I think that's why it's important that the outcome of a protocol in the protocolist movement uh, cannot be foreseen, because that means that different people instantiating the same protocol will come out with very different things. That while they are driven, they are they are flavored with the same protocol they are not substantially similar to each other. So they are not vo violating the copyright of each other. Uh, whereas if you have something that is too deterministic, then anyone that is doing, so I'm playing a score and then you play the same score. This is a lot of substantial similarity because the way in which we play the score is substantially similar. Um, if the protocol is not about play those notes, but is about create a melody that incorporate this type of rules and constraints, then I will create a melody and you will create a melody which are very different, even though they are recognizable as stemming from the same protocol. And this is where copyright all of a sudden fails to protect, but also fails to constrain uh, creativity in that particular type of endeavor. So the, the substantial similarity uh, paradigm of copyright law requires that the expression when put one next to the other, they look su substantially similar so that anyone will say, well, one is a copy of the other, even though they are not a copy of each other because they are just two different instances of a higher meta level work. Um, and so when, when we enter into the field of protocolism, I will say that copyright has a hard time tackling with that uh, because copyright doesn't protect ideas. And uh, pro a protocol is closer to an idea than to an actual expression or manifestation of the idea. And then the manifestation of the idea will be eligible for copyright, but that copyright will be the copyright of the specific instantiator. But that particular instance of the protocol cannot prevent anyone else from creating their own instance of the work, right? And this all goes to the concept of like style, right? And copyright does not protect style. I can do something in the style of, that's perfectly okay, but I cannot copy someone that has, like I, I can copy the style, I cannot copy the expression, right? Because the style stays at a higher level of uh, abstraction, which doesn't necessarily, I can do something which has the same style, but doesn't have substantial similarity at the expressive level la la layer. And so the protocol is, is kind of a style in some way, right? If I if I have like a like Jackson Pollock, this is a style. This is a protocol. It's 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 uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's it depends, um, and uh, to which extent. Therefore, if I create a new work that is in the style of Pollock but doesn't look like any of the previous work of Pollock, uh, am I infringing on the copyright of Pollock? But which copyright? Because you cannot look at any of those art pieces and claim that I have copied it because it's not substantially similar. But the style is so representative that there is a point in which the style is actually impermeating every single instantiation so strongly that everything is recognizable as coming from the same protocol or source. Right. And again, this is, this is always a matter of degree to which extent someone that is doing Pollock is actually violating the copyright of Pollock. Is, is the manifestation so similar to the previous manifestation that we can claim that there is indeed copying? Or is the each instantiation sufficiently different that even though the style is recognizable, we cannot we cannot claim that there is substantial similarity.
No, it's not on the same topic. I wonder if we could possibly finish with, and, and I shouldn't be me to say this, last word to uh, Hiditaka and to Yuk a little bit on, um, on, 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 on bringing back the, the, the Chinese and East Asian-ness uh, to art and technology that we've started to discuss um, in, in the context of this. Um, would that be right? Would that be okay? You know, you, ideas that you guys have brought up, like uh, translation, like uh, subtraction. Uh, no, no, as an East Asian-ness, which is quite amazing. And uh, I, I know I'm putting poor Hiditaka on the spot, uh, but if you, if you say it first, then he's got to finish. Oh, unless, unless it's, sorry, I think that's probably a good, good ending, isn't it? If we can get it. Je, donc est, on, a, on est entré dans la discussion générale déjà, mm -hmm. n'est-ce pas euh, Oui, il y a ça. Je vais parler en français. <rire> euh, ce qui m'a retenu dans cette discussion passionnante sur, la, sur le protocole, euh, c'est plutôt la question de l'instanciation. L'instanciation, c'est, comment dire, c'est, euh, je pense, c'est peut-être mon, mon, mon point de vue personnel, euh, mais c'est la question des événements, n'est-ce pas Événement. Événements. Euh, enfin, du moins, du moins philosophiquement, n'est-ce pas Alors, euh, qu'est-ce qui serait le contraire, hein, l'envers de, du protocole. <rire> je, je, je vais, là, si si, si j'étais un, un Zen monk, je me demanderais ainsi. <rire> Quelle serait l'inverse, logique inverse du protocole euh, Et quel est le rapport avec les événements C'est-à-dire que, que euh, comment faire advenir un événement qui, donc, euh, qui est comment dire, qui n'obéit qui pas au, au protocole. <rire> c'est comme ça que je, je pense. D'ailleurs, je ne, je, ne, je ne dirais pas cela, je ne l'appellerai pas que cela protocole, mais ça serait un procédé propre aux au Zen. <rire> c'est ça. C'est ça. Oui, c'est ce que j'ai essayé de formuler comme logique de sub, subtraction. Voilà. Subtraction de problème. Vous voulez le translate pour lui Oh, just, uh, of course, I think that you speak French already, clearly, from your accent. Uh, oh, that, um, yeah, the way it would interest Hiditaka, which surprised me, your answer. Because I thought you would be asking her another question. Uh, Philippe, Philippe, right? Another question. Oh, fuck. Primavera, another question. Um, but you didn't. You kind of turned it upside down and said that um, what interests you is sort of the subtraction from protocol. You know, what protocol isn't. And uh, found a certain space of Zen. And maybe what we were looking at in terms of Kong or void you know, which is way different to the kind of Western notion of lack, um, or, or even, 30 seconds, uh, or, even, or, or even condition of possibility, nothing like that, um, um, of, of, of protocol. Yeah, subtraction, which is your subtraction, subtractive modernity. Uh, so, you have, well, you you have know, last words, sir. Because I think we should, if we want to talk about protocol, we have to understand, um, we have to go back to to the origin of this word, uh, protocol. Uh, you know, what does it mean by protocol? And the protocol, the term protocol in the European history was used uh, firstly in di a diplomatic. Uh, uh, it, uh, it was a, a word. It was a word that belonged to 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 to, to, diplom to diplomacy. Uh, that there is certain protocols that uh, different. Uh, the different cultures and different um, 
or dif 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 different different uh, can well there was a country was there was no such a word uh, different uh, um, uh, small states they they uh, uh, perform uh, diplomacy uh, there is always a protocol and um, but um, so if we can if I can extend what. Uh, uh, Ishida san said about uh, something that escape or some the the the, in, the inverse. Uh, what what he what uh, Ishida san was saying is that well, I, I do a little bit of translation for 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 him because I counted on Scott but he didn't. That protocol was the uh, inst uh, is uh, what is important in the question of protocol is the question of instantiation because instantiation, uh, which would, uh, is a, is kind of, is an event is a is an event philosophical speaking, and he was ans asking what is the uh, logical inverse of protocol uh, and uh, that's to say a becoming that doesn't obey. Uh, protocols, and that's what he called uh, 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 a subtraction. If I if I uh, translate uh, correctly, that what he what he called uh, by um, uh, subtraction. Uh, but if I uh, if we come back to the question of protocol and its original the, and and its use, its original use, for example, in the European uh, history, then. Uh, maybe we should also think of the question of diplomacy today in a different way. A diplomacy also uh, in terms of uh, uh, knowledge, a diplomacy of which I call epistemological diplomacy or diplomacy of epistemologies. And I think that's what Scott was hinting at when he was saying that what would be the importance of uh, uh, Asian thought today. Um, and. Um, well, that's a fundamentally a geopolitical question for me. Uh, that I think our diplomacy today fails us completely. You know, the the diplomacy that we read from newspaper fails us completely, and we need a new kind of diplomacy. And I call it a diplomacy of epistemologies. Let's that's to say, look, uh, how could other forms of how could other knowledge?s uh, well, which I which we can uh, call. Because this morning, well, as I just want to say the last word, uh, because this morning when Lev and um, and Ronaldo has been a debate on the on the possibility of developing um, Amazonian AI, and Lev's answer is that well, you know, if you look at Instagram, you know, everyone is using Instagram, and you can only observe, you know, the kind of as. Uh, um, the difference of social phenomenon, you know, how people in Brazil use Instagram in comparison, how people in in Russia use Instagram. But I think this is a, 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 a problematic understanding of technology because it reduces technology to to, um, to a social political understanding, without understanding what underlies or without addressing what really underlies in technology. A technology has many suppos presuppositions. Ontological presuppositions, epistemolo I will finish in f uh, 30 seconds. Uh, epistemological uh, presuppositions, ontological presupp presuppositions, cosmolog cosmological presuppositions, and so on and so forth. And these are the questions that we don't really address when we use a tool. And I think this is the question that we have to address. And I think uh, Ishida san, what he says about. Um, uh, the the logic of subtraction, the I the the attempts to to identify the difference in order to carry out the second what I call the second translation, is a form of uh, 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 epistemological diplomacy. So I I'm informed that we have to close right now. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have further time for discussion. Well, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank again Agnes and uh, her team. Um, uh, and Bell and uh, Charlie and others, um, and also, uh, you know, of course, Os Osas Foundation and uh, Asia Society for making all this possible. But I will maybe give the microphone to Ernest to say, a to give us a concluding Sorry remark. Right. Okay. So we, we, why don't we let uh, Ernest say the last yeah. word? Why do you have to be so hard to, to, to be so pressing?
as Charles, um, you know, helping me along and um, advising me. And um, I think um, I could never do this on my own. Um, and I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the speakers. Um, okay. I wasn't loud enough. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Hidetaka-san, Scott, Yoke, and Charles for flying over, even though there are some restrictions and some inconvenience during COVID. They're still under the zero plus three, and they had some inconveniences. And I really sincerely appreciate all of you for coming to the symposium and for the many who joined us online. So I wish to thank, I uh, hope, uh, and, and of course the speakers, Primavera, Lev, Ronaldo, um, you know, for being with us um, today. And we hope there are other opportunities where we can host this again. Thank you very much for coming.